This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Water Sleeps, written by Glenn Cook and narrated by McLeod Andrews. Chapter 1 In those days, the Black Company did not exist. This I know because there were laws and decrees that told me so. But I did not feel entirely insubstantial. The company's standard, its captain and lieutenant, its standard bearer, and all the men who had made the company so terrible had passed on, having been buried alive at the heart of a vast desert of stone, glittering stone. They whispered in the streets and alleys of Taglios, and gone to Kadovar, they proclaimed from on high. The mighty making what they had been so determined to prevent for so long over into a great triumph, once the Radisha or protector or somebody decided that people ought to believe that the company had fulfilled its destiny. Anyone old enough to remember the company knew better. Only fifty people had ventured out onto that plain of glittering stone. Half of those people had not been company. Only two of those fifty had returned to lie about what had happened. And a third who had come back to retail the truth had been killed in the Kialune Wars, far away from the capital. But the deceits of Soulcatcher and Willow Swan fooled no one, then or now. People simply pretended to believe them because that was safer. They might have asked why Mogaba needed five years to conquer a company that had passed on, squandering thousands of young lives to bring the Kialune domains under the Radisha's rule and into the realm of the protector's twisted truths. They might have mentioned that people claiming to be black company had held out in the fortress Overlook for years after that, until the protector, Soulcatcher, finally became so impatient with their intransigence that she invested her own best sorceries in a two-year project that reduced that huge fortress to white powder, white rubble, and white bones. They might have raised these points, but they remained silent instead. They were afraid. With cause, they were afraid. The Taglian Empire under the Protectorate is an empire of fear. During the years of defiance, one unknown hero won Soulcatcher's eternal hatred by sabotaging the Shadow Gate, the sole gateway to the glittering plain. Soulcatcher was the most powerful sorcerer alive. She might have become a Shadow Master to eclipse those monsters the company had pulled down during its earlier wars on Taglios's behalf. But with the shadow gate sealed, she could not conjure killer shadows more powerful than the few score she had controlled when she worked her treachery on the company. Oh, she could open the shadow gate. One time. She did not know how to close it again, though, meaning everything inside would be free to wriggle out and begin tormenting the world, meaning that for Soulcatcher, party to so few of the secrets... The choice must be all or very little. The end of the world or making do? For the moment, she is making do and pursuing continuous researches. She is the protector. Fear of her steeps the empire. There are no challenges to her terror. But even she knows this age of dark concord cannot endure. Water sleeps. In their homes, in the shadowed alleyways, in the city's ten thousand temples, nervous whispers never cease. The year of the skulls. The year of the skulls. It is an age when no gods die and those that sleep keep stirring restlessly. In their homes, in the shadowed alleyways or fields of grain, or in the sodden paddies, in the pastures and forests and tributary cities. Should a comet be seen in the sky, or should an unseasonable storm strew devastation, or, particularly, if the earth should shake, they murmur, Water sleeps. 
and they are afraid. Chapter 2 They call me Sleepy. I was withdrawn as a child, hiding from the horrors of my childhood, inside the comfort and emotional safety of daydreams and nightmares. Any time I did not have to work, I went away in there to hide. The evil could not touch me there. I knew no safer place till the black company came to Jaikur. My brothers accused me of sleeping all the time. They resented my ability to get away. They did not understand. They died without ever understanding. I slept on. I did not waken fully till I had been with the company for several years. I keep these annals today. Somebody must, and no one else can. Though the analyst title never devolved upon me formally. There is precedent. The books must be written. The truth must be recorded, even if fate decrees that no man ever reads a word I write. The annals are the soul of the black company. They recall that this is who we are. That this is who we were. That we persevere. And that treachery as it ever has, failed to suck the last drop of our blood. We no longer exist. The protector tells us so. The Radisha swears it. Mogaba, that mighty general with his thousand dark honors, sneers at our memory and spits on our name. People in the streets declare us no more than an evil, haunting memory. But only Soul Catcher does not watch over both shoulders to see what might be gaining ground. We are stubborn ghosts. We will not lie down. We will not cease to haunt them. We have done nothing for a long time, but they remain afraid. Their guilt cannot stop whispering our name. They should be afraid. Somewhere in Taglios, every day a message appears upon a wall, written in chalk or paint or even animal blood. Just a gentle reminder. Water sleeps. Everyone knows what that means, they whisper it, aware that there is an enemy out there more restless than running water, an enemy who will somehow, someday, lurch forth from the mouth of his grave and come for those who played at betrayal. They know no power that can prevent it. They were warned 10,000 times before they gave in to temptation. No evil can preserve them. Mogaba is afraid. Radisha is afraid. Willow Swan is so afraid he barely functions, like the wizard Smoke before him, who he indicted and tormented for his cowardice. Swan knew the company of old in the north, before anyone here recognized it as more than a dark memory of ancient terror. The years have seen no calluses form on Swan's fear. Purohita Drupada is afraid. Inspector General Gokhal is afraid. Only the protector is not afraid. Soul Catcher fears nothing. Soul Catcher does not care. She mocks and defies the demon. She is mad. She will laugh and be entertained while being consumed by fire. Her lack of fear leaves her henchmen that much more troubled. They know she will drive them before her into the grinding jaws of destiny. Occasionally, a wall will carry another message, a more personal note. All their days are numbered. I am in the streets every day, either going to work, going to spy, listening, capturing rumors, or launching new ones within the anonymity of Chorbagan. The thieves' garden, even the greys have not yet been able to extirpate. I used to disguise myself as a prostitute, but that proved to be too dangerous. There are people out there who make the protectors seem a paragon of sanity. It is the world's great good fortune that fate denies them the power to exercise the fullest depth and sweep of their psychoses. Mostly I go around as a young man, the way I always did. Rootless young men are everywhere since the end of the wars. 
The more bizarre the new rumor, the faster it explodes out of Chorbagan, and the more strongly it gnaws the nerves of our enemies. Always, always, Taglios must enjoy a sense of grim premonition. We must provide them their ration of omens, signs, and portents. The protector hunts us in her more lucid moments, but she never remains interested long. She cannot keep her attention fixed on anything. And why should she be concerned? We are dead. We no longer exist. She herself has declared that to be the reality. As protector, she is the great arbiter of reality for the entire Taglian Empire. But water sleeps. Chapter 3 in those days the spine of the company was a woman who never formally joined, the witch Kai Sarah, wife of my predecessor as analyst, Morgan, the standard-bearer. Kai Sarah was a clever woman with a will like sharp steel. Even Goblin and One-Eye deferred to her. She would not be intimidated, not even by her wicked old Uncle Doge. She feared the protector, the Radisha, and the greys no more than she feared a cabbage. The malice of evils as great as the deadly cult of deceivers, their messiah, the daughter of night, and their goddess Kina, intimidated Sarah not at all. She had looked into the heart of darkness. Its secrets inspired in her no dread. Only one thing made Sarah tremble. Her mother, Kai Gota, was the incarnation of dissatisfaction and complaint. Her lamentations and reproaches were of such amazing potency that it seemed she must be an avatar of some cranky old deity as yet undiscovered by man. Nobody loves Kai Gota except one eye, and even he calls her the troll behind her back. Sarah shuddered as her mother limped slowly through a room gone suddenly silent. We were not in power now. We had to use the same few rooms for everything. Only a short while ago, this one had been filled with loafers. Some company. Most of them employees of Bondo Trang. We all stared at the old woman, willing her to hurry, willing her to overlook this opportunity to socialize. Old Do Trang, who was so feeble he was confined to a wheelchair, rolled over to Kai Gota evidently hoping a show of concern would keep her moving. Everyone always wanted Gota to go somewhere else. This time his sacrifice worked. She had to be in a lot of discomfort, though not to take time to harangue all who were younger than she. Silence persisted till the old merchant returned. He owned the place and let us use it as our operational headquarters. He owed us nothing, but nevertheless shared our danger out of love for Sarah. In all matters, his thoughts had to be heard and his wishes had to be honored. Do Trang was not gone long. He came back rolling wearily. The man behind the liver spots seemed so fragile. It had to be a miracle that he could move his chair himself. Ancient he was but there was an irrepressible twinkle in his eyes. He nodded. He seldom had anything to say unless someone else said something incredibly stupid. He was a good man. Sara told us, Everything is in place. Every phase and facet has been double-checked. Goblin and one eye are sober. It's time the company speaks up. She glanced around, inviting comments. I did not think it was time. But I had said my piece when I was planning this, and had been outvoted. I treated myself to a shrug of despair. There being no new objections, Sarah said, Start the first phase. She waved at her son. Tobo nodded and slipped out. He was a skinny, scruffy, furtive youngster, he was Nguyen Bao, which meant he had to be a sneak and a thief. His every move had to be watched, 
In consequence, he was so generally observed that no individual examined in detail what he actually did, so long as his hands did not stray toward a dangling purse or some treasure in a vendor's stall. People did not look for what they did not expect to see. The boy's hands stayed behind his back. While they were there, he was not considered a threat. He could not steal. No one noticed the small, discolored blobs he left on any wall he leaned against. Goony children stared. The boy looked so strange in his black pajama clothing. Goony raised their children polite. Goony are peaceable folk in the main. Shadar children, though, are wrought of sterner stuff. They are more bold. Their religion has a warrior philosophy at its root. Some Shadar youths set out to harass the thief. Of course he was a thief. He was Nguyen Bo. Everyone knew all Nguyen Bo were thieves. Older Shadar called the youngsters off. The thief would be dealt with by those whose responsibility that was. The Shadar religion has its streak of bureaucratic rectitude, too. Even such a small commotion attracted official attention. Three tall, gray-clad, bearded Shadar peacekeepers wearing white turbans advanced through the press. They looked around constantly, intently oblivious to the fact that they traveled in an island of open space. The streets of Taglios are packed day and night, yet the masses always find room to shrink away from the greys. The greys are all men with hard eyes, seemingly chosen for their lack of patience and compassion. Tobo drifted away, sliding through the mob like a black snake through swamp reeds. When the greys inquired about the commotion, no one could describe him as anything but what prejudice led them to presume. A Nguyenbao thief. And there was a plague of those in Taglios. These days, the capital city boasted plenty of every kind of outlander imaginable. Every layabout and lackwit and sharpster from the length and breadth of the empire was migrating to the city. The population had tripled in a generation. But for the cruel efficiencies of the greys, Taglios would have become a chaotic, murderous sink, a hellfire fueled by poverty and despair. Poverty and despair existed in plentitude, but the palace did not let any disorder take root. The palace was good at ferreting out secrets. Criminal careers tended to be short, as did the lives of most who sought to conspire against the Radisha or the Protector, particularly against the Protector, who did not concern herself deeply with the sanctity of anyone else's skin. In times past, intrigue and conspiracy had been a miasmatic plague afflicting every life in Taglios, there was little of that anymore. The protector did not approve. Most Taglians were eager to win the protector's approval. Even the priesthoods avoided attracting Soulcatcher's evil eye. At some point, the boy's black clothing came off, leaving him in the goonie style loincloth he had worn underneath. Now he looked like any other youngster, though with a slightly jaundiced cast of skin. He was safe. He had grown up in Taglios. He had no accent to give him away. Chapter 4 It was the waiting time, the stillness, the doing nothing that there is so much of before any serious action. I was out of practice. I could not lean back and play tonk or just watch while one-eyed goblin tried to cheat each other. And I had writer's cramp so could not work on my annals. Tobo, I called. You want to go see it happen? Tobo was 14. He was the youngest of us. He grew up in the black company. He had a full measure of youth's exuberance and impatience and overconfidence in his own immortality and divine exemption from retribution. He enjoyed his assignments on behalf of the company. He was not quite sure he believed in his father, he never knew the man. We tried hard to keep him from becoming anyone's spoiled baby, but Goblin insisted on treating him like a favorite son. He was trying to tutor the boy. Goblin's command of written Taglian was more limited than he would admit. 
There are a hundred characters in the everyday Vulgate, and forty more reserved to the priests, who write in the high mode, which is almost a second unspoken formal language. I use a mixture recording these annals. Once Tobo could read, Uncle Goblin made him do all his reading for him aloud. Could I do some more buttons, Sleepy? Mom thinks more would get more attention in the palace. I was surprised he talked to her that long. Boys his age are surly at best. He was rude to his mother all the time. He would have been ruder and more defiant still if he had not been blessed with so many uncles who would not tolerate that stuff. Naturally, Tobo saw all that as a grand conspiracy of adults. Publicly. In private, he was amenable to reason. Occasionally. When approached delicately by someone who was not his mother. Maybe a few. But it's going to get dark soon. And then the show will start. What'll we go as? I don't like it when you're a whore. We'll be street orphans. Though that had its risks, too. We could get caught by a press gang and forced into Mogaba's army. His soldiers these days are little better than slaves, subject to a savage discipline. Many are petty criminals given an option of rough justice or enlistment. The rest are children of poverty with nowhere else to go. Which was the standard of professional armies, men like Mergen saw in the far north long before my time. Why do you worry so much about disguises? If we never show the same face twice, our enemies can't possibly know who they're looking for. Don't ever underestimate them. Especially not the protector. She's outwitted death itself more than once. Tubbo was not prepared to believe that or much else of our exotic history. Though not as bad as most, he was going through that stage where he knew everything worth knowing and nothing his elders said, particularly if it bore any vaguely educational hue, was worth hearing. He could not help that. It went with the age. And I was my age, and could not help saying things I knew would do no good. It's in the annals. Your father and the captain didn't make up stories. He did not want to believe that either. I did not pursue it. Each of us must learn to respect the annals in our own way, in our own time. The company's diminished circumstance makes it difficult for anyone to grasp tradition. Only two old crew brothers both survived Soulcatcher's trap on the stone plain and the Kialune wars afterward. Goblin and One-Eye are haplessly inept at transmitting the company mystique. One-Eye is too lazy and Goblin too inarticulate. And I was still practically an apprentice when the old crew ventured onto the plane in the captain's quest for Katavar. Which he did not find. Not the Katavar he was looking for, anyway. I am amazed. Before long, I will be a twenty-year veteran. I was barely fourteen when Bucket took me under his wing. But I was never like Tobo. At fourteen, I was already ancient in pain. For years after Bucket rescued me, I grew younger. What? I asked why you looked so angry all of a sudden. I was remembering when I was fourteen. Girls have it so easy. He shut up. His face drained. His northern ancestry became apparent. He was an arrogant and spoiled little puke. But he did have brains enough to recognize it when he stepped into a nest of poisonous snakes. I told him what he knew, not what he did not. When I was fourteen, the company and Yuang Bo were trapped in Jekur. Dejagore, they call it here. The rest does not matter anymore. The rest is safely in the past. I almost never have nightmares now. Tobo had heard more than he ever wanted to about Jekur already. His mother and grandmother and Uncle Doge had been there, too. Goblin says we'll be impressed by these buttons, Tobo whispered. They won't just make spooky lights. They'll prick somebody's conscience. That'll be unusual. Conscience was a rare commodity on either side of our dispute. 
you really knew my dad? Tobo had heard stories all his life, but lately wanted to know more. Morgan had begun to matter in a more than lip service fashion. I told him what I had told him before. He was my boss. He taught me to read and write. He was a good man. I laughed weakly. As good a man as belonging to the Black Company let him be. Tobo stopped. He took a deep breath. He stared at a point in the dusk somewhere above my left shoulder. Were you lovers? No, Tobo. No, friends. Almost. But definitely not that. He didn't know I was a woman till just before he left for the glittering plain. And I didn't know he knew till I read his annals. Nobody knew. They thought I was a cute runt who just never got any bigger. I let them think that. It felt safer as one of the guys. Oh. His tone was so neutral I had to wonder. Why did you even ask? Surely he had no reason to believe I had behaved differently before he knew me. He shrugged. I just wondered. Something must have set him off. Possibly an I wonder if from Goblin or One Eye, say, while they were sampling some of their homemade elephant poison. I didn't ask. Did you put the buttons behind the shadow show? That's what I was told to do. A shadow show uses cutout puppets mounted on sticks. Some of their limbs are manipulated mechanically. A candle behind the puppets casts their shadows on a screen of white cloth. The puppeteer uses a variety of voices to tell his story as he maneuvers his puppets. If he is sufficiently entertaining, his audience will toss him a few coins. This particular puppeteer had performed in the same place for more than a generation. He slept inside his stage setup. In so doing, he lived better than most of Taglios's floating population. He was an informer. He was not beloved of the Black Company. The story he told, as most were, was drawn from the myths. It sprang from the Kadi cycle. It involves a goddess with too many arms who kept devouring demons. Of course it was the same demon puppet over and over. Kind of like real life, where the same demon comes back again and again. Just a hint of color hung above the western rooftops. There was an ear-splitting squeal. People stopped to stare at a bright orange light. Glowing orange smoke wobbled up from behind the puppeteer's stand. Its strands wove the well-known emblem of the Black Company, a fanged skull with no lower jaw, exhaling flames. The scarlet fire in its left eye socket seemed to be a pupil that stared right down inside you, searching for the thing that you feared the most. The smoke thing persisted only a few seconds. It rose about ten feet before it dispersed. It left a frightened silence. The air itself seemed to whisper. Water sleeps. Wine and flash. A second skull arose. This one was silver with a slightly bluish tint. It lasted longer and rose a dozen feet higher before it perished. It whispered, My brother unforgiven. Here come the greys, exclaimed someone tall enough to see over the crowd. Being short makes it easy for me to disappear in groups, but also makes it tough for me to see what is happening outside them. The greys are never far away, but they are helpless against this sort of thing. It can happen anywhere, anytime, and has to happen before they can react. Our supposed ironclad rule is that perpetrators should never be nearby when the buttons speak. The greys understand that. They just go through the motions. The protector must be appeased. The little Shadar have to be fed. Now, Tobo murmured as four greys arrived. A shriek erupted from behind the puppeteer's stage. The puppeteer himself ran out, spun and leaned toward his stage, mouth wide open. There was a flash, less bright but more persistent than its predecessors. 
the subsequent smoke image was more complex and lasted longer. It appeared to be a monster. The monster focused on the Shadar. One of the greys mouthed the name, Nyasi. Nyasi would be a major demon from Shadar mythology. A similar demon under another form of the name exists in Guni belief. Nyasi was a chieftain of the inner circle of the most powerful demons. Shadar beliefs being heretical, Vedna include a posthumous, punitive hell, but also definitely include the possibility of a Guni-like hell on earth, in life, managed by demons in Nyasi's employ, laid on for the particularly wicked. Despite understanding that they were being taunted, the greys were rocked. This was something new. This was an attack from an unanticipated and sensitive direction. And it came on top of ever more potent rumors associating the greys with vile rites supposedly practiced by the protector. Children disappear. Reason suggests this is inevitable and unavoidable in a city so vast and overcrowded, even if there is not one evil man out there. Babies vanish by wandering off and getting lost, and horrible things do happen to good people. A clever, sick rumor can reassign the numb evil of chance to the premeditated malice of people no one ever trusted anyway. Memory becomes selective. We do not mind a bit lying about our enemies. Tobo yelled something insulting. I started to pull him away, dragging him toward our den. Others began to curse and mock the greys. Tobo threw a stone that hit a grey's turban. It was too dark for them to make out faces. They began to unlimber bamboo wands. The mood of the crowd turned ugly. I could not help but suspect that there was more to the devil display than had met the eye. I knew our tame wizards, and I knew that Taglians do not lose control easily. It takes a great deal of patience and self-control for so many people to live in such unnaturally tight proximity. I looked around for crows, fluttering bats, or anything else that might be spies for their protector. After nightfall, all our risks soar. We cannot see what might be watching. I held on to Tobo's arm. You shouldn't have done that. It's dark enough for shadows to be out. He was not impressed. Goblin will be happy. He spent a long time on that, and it worked perfectly. The greys blew whistles, summoning reinforcements. A fourth button released its smoke ghost. We missed the show. I dragged Tobo through all the shadow traps between the excitement and our headquarters. He would be explaining to some uncles soon. Those for whom paranoia remains a way of life will be those who will be around to savor the company's many revenges. Tobo needed more instruction. His behavior could have been exploited by a clever adversary. Chapter 5 Sara summoned me as soon as we arrived, not to chastise me for letting Tobo take stupid risks, but to observe as she launched her next move. It might be time Tobo walked into something that would scare some sense into him. Life underground is unforgiving. It seldom gives you more than one chance. Tobo had to understand that in his heart. After Sara grilled me about events outside, she made sure Goblin and One-Eye were acquainted with her displeasure, too. Tobo was not there to defend himself. Goblin and One-Eye were not cowed. No forty-something slip of a lass could overawe those two antiques. Besides, they put Tobo up to half his mischief. Sara said, I'll raise Morgan now. She seemed unsure about that. She had not consulted Morgan much recently. We all wondered why. She and Morgan were a genuine romantic love match straight out of legend, with all the appurtenances seen in the timeless stories, including gods defied, parents disappointed, desperate separations and reunions, intrigues by enemies, and so forth. It remained only for one of them to go down into the realm of the dead to rescue the other. 
and Morgan was tucked away in a nice cold underground hell right now, courtesy of the mad sorceress Soul Catcher. He and all the captured lived on, in stasis, beneath the plain of glittering stone, in a place and situation known to us only because Sarah could conjure Morgan's spirit. Could the problem be the stasis? Sarah got a day older every day. Morgan did not. Had she begun to fear she would be older than his mother before we freed the captured? Sadly, after years of study, I realized that most history may really pivot on personal considerations like that, not on the pursuit of ideals dark or shining. Long ago, Mergen learned to leave his flesh while he slept. He retained some of that ability, but sadly, it was diminished by the supernatural constraints of his captivity. He could do nothing outside the cavern of the ancients without being summoned forth by Sara, or, conceivably, chillingly, by any other necromancer who knew how to reach him. Morgan's ghost was the ultimate spy. Outside our circle, none but Soul Catcher could detect his presence. Morgan informed us of our enemy's every plot, those that we suspected strongly enough to ask Sara to investigate. The process was cumbersome and limited, but still, Morgan constituted our most potent weapon. We could not survive without him. And Sara was ever more reluctant to call him up. God knows it is hard to keep believing. Many of our brothers have lost their faith and have drifted away, vanishing into the chaos of the Empire. Some may be rejuvenated once we have had a flashy success or two. The years have been painful for Sara. They cost her three children, an agony no loving parent should have to bear. She lost their father as well, but suffered little by that deprivation. No one who remembered the man spoke well of him. She suffered with the rest of us during the siege of Jaikur. Maybe Sara and the entire Nguyenbo people had angered Gangesha. Or maybe the god with the several elephant heads just enjoyed a cruel prank at the expense of her worshippers. Certainly, Kina got a chuckle out of pulling lethal practical jokes on her devotees. Goblin and One-Eye were not usually present when Sara raised Morgan. She did not need their help. Her powers were narrow but strong, and those two could be a distraction even when they tried to behave. Those antiques being there told me something unusual was afoot. And old they are, almost beyond reckoning, their skills sustain them. One eye, if the annals do not lie, is on the downhill side of two hundred. His youthful sidekick lags less than a century behind. Neither is a big man, which is being generous. Both are shorter than me, and never were taller, even long before they became dried-up old relics, which was probably when they were about fifteen. I cannot imagine one eye ever having been anything but old. He must have been born old, and wearing the ugliest, filthiest black hat that ever existed. Maybe one eye goes on forever because of the curse of that hat. Maybe the hat uses him as its steed and depends on him for its survival. That crusty, stinking glob of felt rag will hit the nearest fire before one eye's corpse finishes bouncing. Everyone hates it. Goblin, in particular, loathes that hat. He mentions it whenever he and One Eye get into a squabble, which is about as often as they see one another. One Eye is small and black and wrinkled. Goblin is small and white and wrinkled. He has a face like a dried toad's. One Eye mentions that whenever they get into a squabble, which is about as often as there is an audience, but nobody to get between them. They strain to be on their best behavior around Sara, though. The woman has a gift. She brings out the best in people. Except her mother. Though the troll is much worse away from her daughter. Lucky us, we do not see Kai Goda much. Her joints hurt her too bad. Tobo helps care for her. Our cynical exploitation of his special immunity from her vitriol. She dotes on the boy even if his father was foreign slime. Sara told me, 
These two claim they've found a more effective way to materialize Morgan. So you can communicate directly. Usually Sara had to talk for Morgan after she raised him up. I do not have a psychic ear. I said, If you bring him across strong enough so the rest of us can see and hear him, then Tobo ought to be here too. He suddenly got a lot of questions about his father. Sarah peered at me oddly. I was saying something, but she did not get what I meant. Boy ought to know his old man, when I rasped. He stared at Goblin, waiting to be contradicted by a man who did not know his. That was their custom. Pick a fight, and never mind trivia like facts or common sense. The debate about whether or not they were worth the trouble they caused went back for generations. This time Goblin abstained. He would make his rebuttal when Sara was not around to embarrass him with an appeal to reason. Sara nodded to one eye. But first, we have to see if your scheme really works. One eye began to puff up. Somebody dared suggest that his sorcery needed field testing? Come on, forget the record. This time, I told him, don't start. Time had caught up with one eye. His memory was no longer reliable, and lately he tended to nod off in the middle of things, or to forget what had gotten him exercised when he roared off on a rant. Sometimes he ended up contradicting himself. He was a shadow of the dried-up old relic he was when first I met him, though he got around under his own power still. But halfway through any journey, he was likely to forget where he was bound. Occasionally, that was good, him being one eye, but mostly it was a pain. Tobo usually got the job of keeping him headed in the right direction when it mattered. One eye doted on the kid, too. The little wizard's increasing fragility did make it easier to keep him inside, away from the temptations of the city. One moment of indiscretion could kill us all. And one eye never quite caught on to what it meant to be discreet. Goblin chuckled as one eye subsided. I suggested, Could you two concentrate on what you're supposed to be doing? I was haunted by the dread that one day one eye would doze off in the midst of a deadly spell and leave us all up to our ears in demons or blood-sucking insects, distraught about having been plucked from some swamp a thousand miles away. This is important. It's always important, Goblin grumbled. Even when it's just Goblin, give me a hand here. I'm too lazy to polish the silver myself. They make it sound like the world's about to end. Always important? <laughs> I see you're in a good mood tonight. Grouk. One eye heaved himself out of his chair, leaning on his cane, muttering unflattering remarks about me. He shuffled over to Sarah. He had forgotten I was female. He was less unpleasant when he remembered, though I expect no special treatment because of the unhappy chance of birth. One eye became dangerous in a whole new way the day he adopted that cane. He used it to swat people, or to trip them. He was always falling asleep between here and there, but you never knew for sure if his nap was the real thing. That cane might dart out to tangle your legs if he was pretending. The dread we all shared was that one eye would not last much longer. Without him, our chances to continue avoiding detection would plummet. Goblin would try hard, but he was just one small-time wizard. Our situation offered work for more than two in their prime. Start, woman, one eye rasped. Goblin, you worthless sock of beetle snot. Would you get that stuff over here? I don't want to hang around here all night. Sarah had had a table set up for them. She used no props herself. At a fixed time, she would concentrate on Morgan. She usually made contact quickly. At her time of the month, when her sensitivity went down, she would sing in Yuengbo. Unlike some of my company brothers, I have a poor ear for languages. Yuengbo mostly eludes me. Her songs seem to be lullabies, unless the words have double meanings, which is entirely possible. 
Uncle Doge talks in riddles all the time, but insists he makes perfect sense if we would just listen. Uncle Doge is not around much, thank God. He has his own agenda. Though even he does not seem clear on what that is anymore. The world keeps changing on him, not in ways he likes. Goblin brought a sack of objects without challenging One-Eye's foul manners. He deferred to One-Eye more lately, if only for efficiency's sake. He wasted no time making his opinions known if work was not involved, though. Even though they were cooperating, laying out their tools, they began bickering about the placement of every instrument. I wanted to paddle them like they were four-year-olds. Sarah began singing. She had a beautiful voice. It should not have been buried this way. Strictly speaking, she was not employing necromancy. She was not laying an absolute compulsion on Mergen, nor was she conjuring his shade. Morgan was still alive out there, but his spirit could escape his tomb when summoned. I wished the other captured could be called up too, especially the captain. We needed inspiration. A cloud of dust formed slowly between Goblin and One Eye, who stood on opposite sides of the table. No, it was not dust, nor was it smoke. I stuck a finger in, tasted. That was a fine, cool water mist. Goblin told Sara, We're ready. She changed tone. She began to sound almost wheedling. I could pick out even fewer words. Mergen's head materialized between the wizards, wavering like a reflection on a rippling pond. I was startled, not by the sorcery, but by Mergen's appearance. He looked just like I remembered him without one new line in his face. None of the rest of us looked the same. Sarah had begun to look something like her mother had back in Jaikur. Not as heavy, not with the strange rolling waddle caused by problems of the joints. But her beauty was going fast. In her, that had been a wonder, stretching on way past the usual early, swift-fading characteristic of Nguangbo women. She did not talk about it, but it preyed upon her. She had her vanity, and she deserved it. Time is the most wicked of all villains. Mergen was not happy about being called up. I feared he suffered the malaise afflicting Sarah. He spoke, and I had no trouble hearing him, though his words were an ethereal whisper. I was dreaming. There is a place. His irritation faded. Pale horror replaced it. And I knew he had been dreaming in the place of bones he described in his own annals. A white crow. We had a problem indeed if he preferred a drift through Kina's dreamscapes to a glimpse of life. Sara told him, We're ready to strike. The Radisha ordered the Privy Council convened just a little while ago. See what they're doing? Make sure Swan is there. Murgan faded from the mist. Sara looked sad. Goblin and One-Eye began excoriating the standard bearer for running away. I saw him, I told them. Perfectly. I heard him, too. Exactly like I always imagined a ghost would talk. Grinning, Goblin told me, That's because you hear what you expect to hear. You aren't really listening with your ears, you know. One eye sneered. He never explained anything to anybody, unless maybe to Gota, if she caught him sneaking back in in the middle of the night. Then he would have a story as convoluted as the history of the company itself. Sounding like a woman pretending not to be bitter, Sarah said, you can bring Tobo in. We know there won't be any explosions or fires. And you melted only two holes through the tabletop. A base canard, one eye proclaimed. That happened only because Frogface here. Sarah ignored him. 
Tobo can record what Mergen has to say, so Sleepy can use it later. It's time for us to turn into other people. Send a messenger if Mergen finds out anything dangerous. That was the plan. I was even less enthusiastic about it now. I wanted to stay and talk to my old friend. But this thing was bigger than a bull session, bigger than finding out if Bucket was keeping well. Chapter 6 Morgan drifted through the palace like a ghost. He found that thought vaguely amusing, though nothing made him laugh anymore. A decade and a half in the grave destroyed a man's sense of humor. The rambling stone pile of the palace never changed. Well, it got dustier, and it needed repairs ever more desperately. Credit that to Soulcatcher, who did not like having hordes of people underfoot. Most of the original vast professional staff had been diminished and replaced by occasional casual labor. The palace crowned a sizable hill. Each ruler of Taglios, generation after generation, tagged on an addition. Not because the room was needed, but because that was a memorial tradition. Taglians joked that in another thousand years there would be no city, just endless square miles of palace, mostly in ruin. The Radishadra, having accepted that her brother the Prabhendradra had been lost during the Shadow Master Wars, and galvanized by the threat of the protector's displeasure, had proclaimed herself head of state. Traditionalists in the ecclesiastical community did not want a woman in the role, but the world knew this particular woman had been doing the job practically forever anyway. Her weaknesses existed mainly in the ambitions of her critics. Depending who did the pontificating, she had made one of two great mistakes, or possibly both. One would be betraying the Black Company when it was a well-known fact that nobody ever profited from such treachery. And the other error of particular popularity with the senior priests would be that she had erred in employing the Black Company in the first place, the terror of the Shadow Masters being expunged in the interim by agency of the Company did not present a counter-argument of any current merit. Unhappy people shared the meeting chamber with the Radisha. The eye automatically went to the protector first. Soulcatcher looked exactly as she always had. Slimly androgynous, yet sensual, in black leather, a black mask, a black helmet, and black leather gloves. She occupied a seat slightly to the left of and behind the Radisha, within a curtain of shadow. She did not put herself forward, but there was no doubt who made the ultimate decisions. Every hour of every day the Radisha found another reason to regret having let this particular camel shove her nose into the tent. The cost of having tried to get around fulfilling an unhappy promise to the Black Company was unsupportable already. Surely keeping her promises could not have been so painful. What possibly could have happened that would be worse than what she suffered now, had she and her brother helped the captain find the way to Katavar. At desks to either hand, facing one another from fifteen feet, stood scribes who struggled valiantly to record anything said. One group served the Radisha. The other was in Soulcatcher's employ. Once upon a time there had been disagreements after the fact about decisions made during a privy council meeting. A table twelve feet long and four wide faced the two women. Four men sat behind its inadequate bulwark. Willow Swan was situated at the left end. His once marvelous golden hair had gone gray and stringy. At higher elevations, it had grown extremely sparse. Swan was a foreigner. Swan was a bundle of nerves. Swan had a job he did not want but could not give up. Swan was riding the tiger. Willow Swan headed up the greys in the public eye. In reality, he was barely a figurehead. If his mouth opened, the words that came out were pure soul catcher. 
popular hatred deservedly belonging to the protector settled upon Willow Swan instead. Seated with Swan were three running dog senior priests who owed their standing to the protector's favor. They were small men in large jobs. Their presence at council meetings was a matter of form. They would not take part in any actual debate, though they might receive instructions. Their function was to agree with and support Soul Catcher, if she happened to speak. Significantly, all three represented Guni cults. Though the protector used the greys to enforce her will, the Shadar had no voice in the council. Neither did the Vedna. That minority simmered continuously because Soul Catcher arrogated to herself much that properly applied only to God, the Vedna being hopelessly monotheistic and stubborn about keeping it that way. Swan was a good man inside his fear. He spoke for the Shadar when he could. There were two other men, of more significance, present. They were positioned behind tall desks located back of the table. They perched atop tall stools and peered down at everyone like a pair of lean old vultures. Both antedated the coming of the protector, who had not yet found a suitable excuse for getting rid of either, though they irritated her frequently. The right-hand desk belonged to the Inspector General of the Records, Chandra Gokhale. His was a deceptive title. He was no glorified clerk. He controlled finances and most public works. He was ancient, hairless, lean as a snake and twice as mean. He owned his appointment to the Radish's father. Until the latter days of the Shadow Master Wars, his office had been a minor one. The wars caused that office's influence and power to expand and Chandra Gokhale was never shy about snatching at any strand of bureaucratic power that came within reach. He was a staunch supporter of the Radisha and a steadfast enemy of the Black Company. He was also the sort of weasel who would change all that in an instant if he saw sufficient advantage in so doing. The man behind the desk on the left was more sinister. Arjana Drupada was a priest of Ravi Lemna's cult, but there was not one ounce of brotherly love in the man. His official title was Purohita, which meant more or less that he was the royal chaplain. In actuality, he was the true voice of the priesthoods at court. They had forced him upon the Radisha at a time she was making desperate concessions in order to gain support. Like Gokhale, Drupada was more interested in control than he was in doing what was best for Taglios. But he was not an entirely cynical manipulator. His frequent moral bulls got up the protector's nose more often even than the constant quibbling financial caveats of the inspector general. Physically, Drupada was known for his shock of wild white hair. That clung to his head like a mad haystack, the good offices of a comb being completely unfamiliar. Only Gokhale and Drupada seemed unaware that their days had to be numbered. The protector of all the Taglias was not enamored of them at all. The final member of the council was absent, which was not unusual. The great General Mogaba preferred to be in the field, harrying those designated as his enemies. He viewed the infighting in the palace with revulsion. None of which mattered at the moment. There had been incidents. There were witnesses to be brought forward. The protector was not pleased. Willow Swan rose. He beckoned a gray sergeant out of the gloom behind the two old men. Gobble Singh! Nobody remarked on the unusual name. Possibly he was a convert. Stranger things were happening. The Singh's patrol watches an area immediately outside the palace on the north side. This afternoon, one of his patrolmen discovered a prayer wheel mounted on one of the memorial posts in front of the north entrance. Twelve copies of this sutra were attached to the arms of the wheel. 
Swan made a show of turning a small paper card so the light would fall upon the writing there. The lettering appeared to be in the ecclesiastical style. Swan failed to appreciate his own ignorance of Taglian letters, though. He was holding the card inverted. He did not, however, make any mistakes when he reported what the prayer card had to say. Raja Dharma, the duty of kings. Know you. Kingship is a trust. The king is the most exalted and conscientious servant of the people. Swan did not recognize the verse. It was so ancient that some scholars attributed it to one or another of the lords of light in the time when the gods still handed down laws to the fathers of men. But the Radisha Dra knew it. The Pirohita knew it. Someone outside the palace had leveled a chiding finger. Soulcatcher understood it, too. Its object, she said, Only a Bodhi monk would presume to chastise this house, and they are very few. That pacifistic, moralistic cult was young and still very small, and it had suffered during the war years almost as terribly as had the followers of Kina. The Bodhi refused to defend themselves. I want the man who did this. The voice she used was that of a quarrelsome old man. Ah, Swan said. It was not wise to argue with the protector, but that was an assignment beyond the capacities of the greys. Among Soulcatcher's more frightening characteristics was her seeming ability to read minds. She could not, really, but never insisted that she could not. In this instance, she found it convenient to let people believe what they wanted. She told Swan, Being Bodhi, he will surrender himself. No search will be necessary. Huh? There is a tree, sometimes called the Bodhi tree in the village of Semki. It is a very old and highly honored tree. The Bodhi Enlightened One made his reputation loafing in the shade of this tree. The Bodhi consider it their most holy shrine. Tell them I will make kindling wood out of the Bodhi tree unless the man who rigged that prayer wheel reports to me. Soon. Soulcatcher employed the voice of a petty, vindictive old woman. Mergen made a mental note to send Sarah a suggestion that the guilty man be prevented from reaching the protector. Destruction of a major holy place would create thousands of new enemies for Soulcatcher. Willow Swan started to speak, but Soulcatcher interrupted. I do not care if they hate me, Swan. I care that they do what I tell them to do when I tell them to do it the Bodhi will not raise a fist against me anyway. That would put a stain on their karma. A cynical woman, the protector. Get on with it, Swan. Swan sighed. Several more of those smoke shows appeared tonight. One was much bigger than any seen before. Once again, the Black Company's sigil was part of all of them. He brought forward another Shadar witness who told of being stoned by the mob, but did not mention the demon Nyasi. The news was no surprise. It was one of the reasons the council had been convened. With no real passion, the Radisha demanded, How could that happen? Why can't you stop it? You have men on every street corner. Chandra! She appealed to the man who knew just how much it would cost to put all those greys out there. Gokhale inclined his head imperially. As long as the Radisha did the questioning, Swan's nerve stood up. She could not hurt him in ways he had not been hurt before. Not the way the protector could. He asked, Have you been out there? You should disguise yourself and go. Like Sarah goes in the fairy tale. Every street is clogged with people. Thousands sleep where others have to walk over them. Breezeways and alleyways are choked with human waste. 
Sometimes the press is so thick you could murder somebody ten feet from one of my men and never be noticed. The people playing these games aren't stupid. If they're really company survivors, they're especially not stupid. They've already survived everything ever thrown at them. They're using the crowds for cover exactly the way they'd use the rocks and trees and bushes out in the countryside. They don't wear uniforms. They don't stand out. They're not outlanders anymore. If you really want to nail them, put out a proclamation saying they all have to wear funny red hats. Swan's nerve had peaked high. That was not directed at the Radisha. Soul Catcher, speaking through her, had issued several proclamations memorable for their absurdity. Being steeped in company doctrine, they wouldn't be anywhere around when the smoke emblems actually formed. So far, we haven't even figured out where they come from. Soul Catcher unleashed a deep-throated grunt. It said she doubted that Swan could figure out much of anything. His nerve guttered like a dying lamp. He began to sweat. He knew he walked a tightrope with the mad woman. He was tolerated like a naughty pet for reasons clear only to the sorceress, who sometimes did things for no better reason than a momentary whim, which could reverse itself an instant later. He could be replaced. Others had been. Soul Catcher did not care about facts, insurmountable obstacles, or mere difficulties. She cared about results. Swan offered. On the plus side, there's no evidence, even from our most eager informants, that suggests this activity is anything but a low-grade nuisance, even if black company survivors are behind it, and even with tonight's escalation. Soul Catcher said, They'll never be anything but a nuisance. Her voice was that of a plucky teenage girl. They're going through the motions. They lost heart when I buried all their leaders. That was all spoken in a powerful male voice by someone accustomed to unquestioning obedience. But those words amounted to an oblique admission that company members might, after all, still be alive. And the final few words included in a rising inflection betraying potential uncertainty. There were questions about what had happened on the plain of glittering stone that Soulcatcher herself could not answer. I'll worry when they call them back from the dead. She did not know. In truth, little had gone according to anyone's plan out there. Her escape with Swan had been pure luck. But Soulcatcher was the sort who believed Fortune's bright countenance was her born due. Probably true, and only marginally significant if I understand your summons. There are other forces afoot, Soulcatcher said. This voice was a sibyl's, rife with portent. The deceivers have been heard from, the Radisha announced causing a general startled reaction that included the disembodied spy. Lately, we've had reports from Dejagor, Meldermai, Gorja, and Danjil about men having been slain in classic strangler fashion. Swan had recovered. In classic strangler work, only the killers know that it happened. They aren't assassins. The bodies would go through their religious rites and be buried in some holy place. The Radisha ignored his remarks. Today there was a strangling here, in Taglios. Perhul Koji was the victim. He died in a joy house, an institution specializing in young girls. Such places aren't supposed to exist anymore. Yet they persist. That was an accusation. The Greys were charged with crushing that sort of exploitation. But the Greys worked for the Protector, and the Protector did not care. I gather that anything you can imagine can still be found for sale. Some people blamed a national moral collapse on the Black Company. Others blamed the ruling family. A few even blamed the Protector. Fault did not matter. 
nor did the fact that most of the nastier evils had existed almost since the first mud hut went up alongside the river. Taglios had changed, and desperate people will do what they must to survive. Only a fool would expect the results to be pretty. Swan asked, Who is this Perhul Koji? He glared over his shoulder. He had a scribe of his own recording the meeting back there in the darkness. Plainly, he wondered why the Radisha was familiar with this particular murder when he was not. Sounds like the guy got something he had coming. You sure it wasn't just his adventure with the little girls gone bad? Quite possibly Koji did deserve what happened, the Radisha said with bitter sarcasm. He was Vedna, so he'll be talking it over with his god about now. I would imagine. His morals don't interest us, Swan. His position does. He was one of the Inspector General's leading assistants. He collected taxes in the Cheka and East Waterfront areas. His death will cause problems for months. His areas were some of our best revenue producers. Maybe somebody who owed his child companion survived, and he did call for help. The sort of men who handled troublemakers in those places arrived while it was happening. Stranglers did it. It was an initiation killing. The strangler candidate was inept. Nevertheless, with the help of his arm holders, he managed to break Koji's neck. So they were captured? No. The one they called Daughter of Night was there, overseeing the initiation. So the strong-armed guys would have been scared witless once they recognized her. No Guni or Shadar wanted to believe the Daughter of Night was just a nasty young woman, not a mythic figure. Few Taglians of those religions would find the courage to interfere with her. All right, Swan conceded. That would mean real stranglers. But how did they recognize the Daughter of Night? Exasperated. Soul Catcher snapped. She told them who she was, you ninny. I am the daughter of night. I am the child of darkness forthcoming. Come to my mother or become prey for the beasts of devastation in the year of the skulls. Typically portentous stuff. Soul Catcher's voice had become the mid-range monotone of an educated skeptic. Not to mention that she was vampire white and a prettier duplicate of my sister as a child. The Daughter of Night feared no one and nothing. She knew that her spiritual parent, Kina the Destroyer, the Dark Mother, would shelter her, even though that goddess had stirred not at all for more than a decade. Rumors about the Daughter of Night had run through the underside of society for years. A lot of people believed she was what she claimed, which only added to her power over the popular imagination. Another rumor, losing currency with time, credited the Black Company with having forestalled Kina's Year of the Skulls, back about the time the Taglian state chose to betray its hired protectors. The deceivers and company alike had a psychological strength vastly exceeding their numbers, being social ghosts made both groups more frightening. What signified most was that the Daughter of Night had come to Taglios itself and that she had shown herself publicly. And where the Daughter of Night went, the chieftain of all deceivers, the living legend, the living saint of the stranglers, Narayan Singh, surely followed like a faithful jackal and worked his evils too. Mergen considered aborting his mission to warn Sara to call everything off till this news could be assessed. But it would be too late to stop everything now whatever else was happening. Narayan Singh was the most hated enemy of the Black Company, still standing upright. Not Mogaba, nor even Soul Catcher, who was an old, old adversary, were as eagerly hunted as was Narayan Singh. Nor did Singh harbor any love for the company. He had gotten himself caught once, and had spent a long time being made uncomfortable by people overburdened with malice. He had debts he would love to collect, 
should it please his goddess to permit that. The Privy Council, as was customary, degenerated into nagging and finger-pointing soon afterward, with the Purohita and Inspector General both maneuvering to get a rung up on one another, and maybe on Swan. The Purohita could count on the backing of the three tame priests, unless Soulcatcher had other ideas. The Inspector General usually enjoyed the support of the Radisha. These squabbles were generally prolonged but trivial, more symbol than substance. The protector would let nothing she disapproved of come out of them. As Mergen started to leave, his presence never having been detected, two royal guards rushed into the chamber. They headed for Willow Swan, though he was not their captain. Perhaps their news was something they did not care to share with the unpredictable protector, their official commander. Swan listened for a moment, then slammed a fist onto the tabletop. Damn it! I knew it had to be more than a nuisance! He bowled past the Purahita, giving the man a look of contempt. There was no love lost there. It has started already, Mergen thought. Back to Do Trang's warehouse, then. He could prevent nothing already in motion. But he could get word to those still at headquarters so they could get after Narion and the Daughter of Night as soon as possible. Chapter 7 Sara changed faces as easily as an actor swaps masks. Sometimes she was the cruel, cunning, coldly calculating necromancer who conspired with the captured. Sometimes she was just the near widow of the standard bearer and official analyst of the company. Sometimes she was just Tobo's doting mother. And whenever she went out into the city, she was Min Subradil, another being entirely. Min Subradil was an outcast, the half-breed by-blow of a priest of Kusa and a Nguengbo whore. Min Subradil knew more about her antecedents than did half the people on the streets of Taglios. She talked to herself about them all the time. She would tell anyone she could trap into listening. Min Subradil was a woman so pathetic, so shunned by fortune, that she was an old, bent thing decades before her time. Her signature, which made her recognizable to people who never had encountered her, was the small statue of Gangisha she carried everywhere. Gangisha who was the god in charge of good luck in Guni and some Nguengbo belief. Min Subradil talked to Gangisha when there was nobody else who would listen. Widowed, Min Subradil supported her one child by doing scut work, day labor at the palace. Each morning, well before dawn, she joined the assembly of unfortunates who gathered at the northern servants' postern in hopes of gaining work. Sometimes she was joined by her dead husband's retarded sister, Sawa. Sometimes she brought her daughter, though seldom anymore. The girl was getting old enough to be noticed. Subassistant housekeeper Jal Barundandi would come out and announce the number of positions available for the day, then would select the people to fill them. Barundandi always chose Min Subradil because, though she was too ugly to demand sexual favors of, she could be counted upon to kick back a generous percentage of her salary. Min Subradil was a desperate creature. Barundandi was amused by Subradil's omnipresent statue, a devout guni of the cult of Kusa. He often included in his prayers a petition that he be spared Subradil's sort of luck. He would never admit it to his henchmen, but he did favor Subradil, some because of her poor choice of a father. Like most villains, he was wicked only most of the time, and mainly in small-minded ways. Subradil, as Kaisara, never prayed. Kaisara had no use for gods. Unaware of his tiny soft spot, she did have in mind a destiny for Jal Barundandi. When the time came, the subassistant would have ample opportunity to regret his predations. There would be many, many regrets, spanning the length and breadth of the Taglian Empire, when the time came. 
We went out through the maze of confusion and distraction spells Goblin and One-Eye have spent so many years weaving throughout the neighborhood, a thousand layers of gossamer deception so subtle only the protector herself might notice them. If she was looking. But Soul Catcher does not roam the streets looking for enemy hideouts. She has the greys and her shadows and bats and crows to do that work. And those are too dim to notice that they are being guided away from or subtly ushered through the area in a manner that left it seeming no more remarkable than any other. The two little wizards spent most of their time maintaining and expanding their maze of confusion. People not trusted no longer got within 200 yards of our headquarters. Not without being led. We had no trouble. We wore strands of yarn tied around our left wrists. These enchanted loops softened the confusion spells. They let us see the truth. Thus we often knew what the palace intended before plans went into motion. Minsu Bradil, or sometimes Sawa, listened in while the plans were being made. I muttered, Isn't it awfully early for us to be out? Yes, but there will be others already there when we take our place. There are a lot of desperate people in Taglios. Some will camp as near the palace as the greys will allow. We did reach the palace area hours earlier than ever before. But there were rounds of the darkness to make, brothers of the company to visit in their hiding places. In each instance, the voice of the witch came out of the wreckage that was Min Subredil. Sawa tagged along behind and drooled out of the corner of her twisted mouth. Most of the men did not recognize us. They did not expect to do so. They expected to receive a code word from those in charge that would expose us as messengers. They got that word. Chances were good they were in some disguise themselves. Every company brother was supposed to create several characters he could assume in public. Some did better than others. The worst were called upon to risk the least. Subradil glanced at the fragment of moon sneaking a peek through a crack in the clouds. Minutes to go. I grunted, nervous. It had been a while since I had been involved in anything directly dangerous. Other than wandering around the palace or going to the library, of course. But nobody was likely to stick me with sharp objects there. Those clouds look like the kind that come right before the rainy season. If they were, that season would be early, which was not a pleasant thought. During the rainy season, that is what it does, in torrents, every day. The weather can be truly ferocious, with dramatic temperature shifts and hailstorms, and thunder like all the gods of the Goonie Pantheon are drunk and brawling. But mainly, I do not like the heat. Taglians divide their year into six seasons, only during the one they call winter is there any sustained relief from the heat. Subradil asked, Would Sawa even notice the clouds? She was a stickler for staying in character. In a city ruled by darkness, you never knew what eyes watched from the shadows, what unseen ears were pricked to overhear. Ah. Uh... That was about as intelligent a thing as Sawa ever said. Come. Subradil took my arm, guiding me. Which was what she always did when we went to work at the palace. We approached the main north entrance, which was only two score yards from the service postern. A single torch burned there. It was supposed to show the guards who might be outside. But it was situated so poorly, it only helped them see the honest people. As we drew closer, someone who had sneaked in along the foot of the wall, jumped up and enveloped the torch in a sack of wet rawhide. The crude, startled remark of one of the guards carried clearly. Now, would he be incautious enough to come see what had happened? There was no reason to believe he would not. The royal guards had had no trouble for almost a generation. The sliver of moon vanished behind a cloud. As it went, Something moved at the palace entrance. Now came the tricky part, making it look like we screwed up a sure thing by going in right at a shift change. A sound of scuffling, a 
a startled cry. Somebody else demanding what was going on. A rattle and clatter as people rushed the gate. Clang of metal. A scream or two. Whistles. Then, within fifteen seconds, answering whistles from several directions. Exactly according to plan. In moments, the whistles from the palace entrance became shrilly desperate. When first the idea was broached, there had been serious debate about whether or not the attack should be the real thing. It seemed likely taking the entrance would be easy. A strong faction, made up of men tired of waiting, just wanted to bust in and kill everybody. While that might have offered a certain amount of satisfaction, there was little chance Soul Catcher could be destroyed. And such wholesale murder would do nothing to liberate the captured, which was supposed to be our primary mission. I had convinced everyone that we needed to launch an old-fashioned, annals-based game of misdirection. Make the enemy think we were up to one thing, when actually we wanted to accomplish something else entirely. Get them running hard to head us off in one direction, when we were following a completely different course. With Goblin and One-Eye now so old, our deceits have to be increasingly intellectual. Those two do not have the strength or stamina to create and maintain massive battlefield illusions. And, though willing to share their secrets, they had not been able to arm Sarah for the struggle. Her talent did not extend in that direction. The first greys charged out of the darkness, into the ambushes, waiting to receive them. For a while it was a vicious slaughter. But somehow... A few managed to get through to support the guards barely hanging on at the palace entrance. Subradil and I moved into position against the foot of the wall, between the big entrance and the servants' postern. Subradil hugged her gangisha and whimpered. Sawa clung to Subradil and drooled and made strange little frightened noises. Though the attackers piled up heaps of greys, they never quite managed to break through the defense of the entryway. Then help arrived from inside. Willow Swan and a platoon of royal guards burst through the gateway. The attackers scattered instantly. So fast, in fact, that Swan screeched, Hold up! There's something wrong! The night lit up. The air filled with hurtling fireballs. Their like had not been seen since the heavy fighting at the end of the Shadow Master Wars. Lady had created those weapons in vast numbers and a few had been husbanded carefully since then. The men employing them had not been involved in the attack on the entrance. They clung to the fire plan, which counted on everyone being able to pick Swan out from amongst the guards and greys. His life depended on it. Fire fell to the side of the group away from Subradil and me. Willow was afraid. When fire swiftly shifted to fall on the entry and cut him off, he was supposed to retreat toward the service entrance, past us. Good old Swan. He must have read my script. As his men were being torn apart by fireballs just yards away, he skittered along, hand against the wall, staying just steps ahead of destruction. Molten stone and chunks of burning flesh flew over his head and ours, and I realized that I had underestimated the fury of my weapons. Perhaps fatally. It was definitely a mistake to have committed so many. Swan stumbled over Mean Subradil's ankle. Somehow, when he hit the cobblestones, he found himself face to face with a drooling idiot, who had a dagger's point neatly positioned under his chin. Don't even breathe, she whispered. Fireballs hitting the palace wall melted their way right in. The wooden gateway was on fire. There was plenty of light by which our brothers could see us signal that we had gotten our man. Fire became more accurate. The resistance to the greys coming to help became less porous. A second apparent attack came forward. A couple of those brothers collected swan. They kicked and cursed us, and took our weapons with them when they went away part of a general retreat as the attack wave fled from no evident resistance. As they disappeared into the darkness, the thing that we had feared most occurred. Soul Catcher came out on the battlements above to see what was happening. Subradil and I knew because all fighting ceased within seconds once somebody spotted her, 
Then a storm of fireballs flashed her way. We were lucky. She was sufficiently unprepared that she could do nothing but duck. Our brothers then did what they were supposed to do. They got the heck out of there. They got downhill and lost amongst the population before the protector could release her bats and crows. It was my belief that the activity would have all the nearby parts of the city in an uproar within minutes. The men were supposed to help that along by launching absurd rumors if they remained calm enough. Subradil and Sawa moved two dozen yards closer to the servant's postern. We had just settled down to drool and be held and whimper while we watched the corpses burn when a frightened voice demanded, Min Subradil, what are you doing here? Jal Barundandi, our boss. I did not look up, and Subradil did not respond until Barundandi stirred her with a toe and asked again, not unkindly. She told him, We were going to be here early. Sawa needs to work bad. She looked around. Where are the others? There had been others, four or five even more eager to be first in line. They had fled. That might mean trouble. No telling what they might have seen before they ran. An early stray fireball was supposed to have panicked and scattered them before Swan got to us, but I could not recall that having happened. Subradil turned more toward Barundandi. I held on to her tighter and whimpered. She patted my shoulder and murmured, something indistinct. Barundandi seemed to buy it, particularly when Subradil discovered that one of her Gangesha's trunks had broken off, and she began to cry and search our surroundings. Several of Baron Dandy's associates were out as well, looking around, asking one another what happened. The same thing was going on at the main entrance, where stunned guards and sleep-fuddled functionaries asked one another what had happened, and what they should do, and, holy shit! Some of those fires burned all the way through the wall, and it was six or eight feet thick! Shadar, from as far as a mile away, were arriving, gathering dead and wounded greys, and also trying to figure out what had happened. Jal Barandandi's voice gentled further. He beckoned his assistants. Help these two inside. Be gentle. The high and the mighty may want to talk to them. I hoped my start did not give us away. I had counted on getting inside early, but it had not occurred to me that anyone might be interested in what two near-untouchables might have seen. Chapter 8 I need not have worried. We were interviewed by a seriously distracted guard sergeant, who seemed to be going through the motions mainly as a sop to Joel Barundandi. The sub-assistant had evidently suffered an over-inspiration of ambition in thinking he could win favor by providing eyewitnesses to the tragedy. His solicitude began to fade once he had little to gain. A few hours after we were taken inside, while excitement still gripped the palace and a thousand outrageous rumors circulated, while leading guardsmen and greys kept bringing in more and more trusted armed men and sending out more and more spies to watch the regular soldiers in their barracks, just in case they were in on the attack somehow, Mean Subradil and her idiot sister-in-law were already hard at work. Barundandi had them cleaning the chamber where the Privy Council met. A huge mess had been left there. Somebody had lost her temper and had worked out her anger by tearing the place up. Barundandi told us, Expect to work very hard today, Min Subredil. Few workers showed up this morning. He sounded bitter. He would not garner much kickback because of the raid. It did not occur to him to be thankful he was still alive. Is she all right? He meant me. Sawa. I was still doing a credible job of shaking. She will manage as long as I stay close. It would not be good to put her any place where she cannot see me today. Barundandi grunted. So be it. There's work enough here. Just don't get in anybody's way. 
Min Subradil bowed slightly. She was good at being unobtrusive. She seated me at a wide table about a dozen feet long, piled up lamps and candlesticks and whatnot that had gotten thrown around. I invoked Sawa's narrow focus and went to work cleaning them. Subradil began cleaning floors and furniture. People came and went, many of them important. None of them noticed us, except the Inspector General of the Records, Chandra Gokhale, who kicked Subradil irritably because she was scrubbing the floor where he wanted to walk. Subradil got back onto her knees, bowing and begging pardon. Gokhale ignored her. She began cleaning up spilled water, showing no emotion whatsoever. Mean Subradil took that sort of thing. But I suspect Kaisara had just formed a definite opinion about which of our enemies would follow Willow Swan into captivity. The Radisha appeared. The protector was with her. They settled into their places. Jal Barundandi appeared soon afterward, meaning to get us out of there. Sawa seemed to notice nothing. Her focus on a candlestick was too narrow. A taller Shadar captain bustled in. He announced, Your Highness, the preliminary tally shows 98 dead and 126 injured. Uh, some of those will die from their wounds. Minister Swan hasn't been found, but many of the bodies are burned too badly to identify. Many that were hit by fireballs caught fire and burned like greasy torches. The captain had trouble remaining calm. He was young. Chances were good he had not seen the consequences of battle before. I kept working hard to shove myself way down deep into character. I had not been this close to Soul Catcher since she had me prisoner outside Kia Lune fifteen years ago. Those were not happy memories. I prayed she did not remember me. I went all the way down into my safe place. I had not been there since my captivity. The hinges on the door were rusty but I got inside and got comfortable while remaining Sawa. I had just enough attention left to catch most of what was happening around me. The protector suddenly asked, Who are these women? Barundandi frowned. Pardon, great ones. Pardon. My fault. I did not know the chamber was to be used. Answer the question, housekeeper, the Radisha ordered. Certainly, great one. Barundandi kowtowed halfway to the floor. The woman scrubbing is Min Subredil, a widow. The other is her idiot sister-in-law, Sawa. They're outside stuff, employed as part of the protector's charity program. Soulcatcher said, I feel I have seen one or both of them before. Barundandi bowed deeply again. The attention frightened him. Uh, Min Subradil has worked here for many years, Protector. Sawa accompanies her when her mind is clear enough for her to accomplish repetitive tasks. I felt him trying to decide whether or not to volunteer the news that we had witnessed the morning's attack from up close. I clung to my safe place so hard that I did not catch what happened during the next few minutes. Barundandi chose not to volunteer us for questioning. Perhaps he reasoned that too intensive an attention paid to us might expose the fact that he was charging us half our feeble salaries for the right to work our hands into raw, aching crabs. The Radisha finally told him, Go away, housekeeper. Let them work. The fate of the Empire will not be decided here today. And Soulcatcher waved a gloved hand, shooing Barundandi out, but then halted him to demand, what is that the woman has on the floor beside her? Meaning Subradil, of course, since I was seated at the table. Uh, oh, a Gangisha, great one. The woman never goes anywhere without it. It's an obsession with her, it... Go away now! So it was that Sara, at least, sat in on almost two hours of the innermost power's responses to our assault. After a while, I came forward again, enough to follow most of it. Couriers came and went. 
a picture of generally upright behavior by the army and people took shape, which was to be expected. Neither had any real reason to rise up right now, which was nothing but good news to the Radisha. Positive intelligence just made the protector more suspicious, though. The old cynic. No prisoners taken, she said. No corpses left behind. Quite possibly no serious casualties suffered nor any great risks endured. If you examine it closely, they fled as soon as there was a chance someone would hit back. What were they up to? What was their real purpose? Reasonably, Chandra Gokhale pointed out, The attack appears to have been sustained by exceptional ferocity till you yourself appeared on the battlements. Only then did they run. The Shadar captain volunteered. Several survivors and witnesses report that the bandits argued amongst themselves about your presence, protector. It seems they expected you to be away from the palace. Evidently, the attack would not have been undertaken had they known you were here. One of my touches of misdirection. I hoped it did some good. That makes no sense. Where would they get that idea? She did not expect an answer and did not wait for one. Have you identified any of the burned bodies? Only three, Protector. Most are barely recognizable as human. The Radisha asked, Chandra, how bad was the physical damage? Do you have an assessment yet? Yes, Radisha. It was bad. Extremely bad. The wall appears to have suffered some structural damage. The full extent is being determined right now. It's certain to be a weak point for a while. You might consider putting up a wooden curtain wall in front of what is going to become a construction area and think hard about bringing in troops. Troops? The protector demanded. Why troops? Her voice, long neutral, became suspicious. When you have no friends at all, paranoia is an even more natural outlook than it is for brothers of the Black Company. Because the palace is too big to defend with the people you have here now. Even if you arm the household staff, an enemy doesn't need to use any of the regular entrances. He could climb the outside wall, where no one is watching an attack from inside. The Radisha said, If he tried that, he'd need maps to get around. I've never seen anyone but Smoke, who was our court wizard a long time ago, who could get around this place without one. You have to have an instinct. The inspector general observed, If the attack was undertaken by elements descended from the Black Company, and the employment of fireball weapons would suggest some connection, even though we know that the company was exterminated by the protector, then they may have access to hallway maps created when the Liberator and his staff were quartered here. The Radisha insisted, You can't chart this place. I know I've tried. Thank Goblin and One-Eye for that, Princess. Long, long ago, the Captain had those two old men scatter confusion spells liberally everywhere. There were things he had not wanted the Radisha to find. Things that remained hidden still. Among them, those ancient volumes of the annals that supposedly explain the company's secret beginnings, but which have been a complete disappointment so far. Mean Subradil knows how to get to them. Whenever she gets the chance, Mean Subradil tears out a few pages and smuggles them out to me. Then I sneak them into the library, and when no one is watching, I translate them a few words at a time, looking for that one phrase that will show us how to open the way for the captured. Sawa cleaned brass and silver. Mean Subradil cleaned floor and furniture. The Privy Council and their associates came and went. The level of panic declined as no new attacks developed. Too bad we did not have the numbers to stir them up again every few hours. Soul Catcher remained uncharacteristically quiet. She had known the company longer than anyone but the captain, Goblin and One-Eye, though from the outside. She would accept nothing at face value, not yet. I hoped she broke a mental sprocket trying to figure it out, though I feared she had already done so, 
because she kept wondering about the burned bodies and Willow Swan. Could I have planned so obviously that she was confused only because she kept looking for something beyond the kidnapping? I finished the last candlestick. I did not look around, did not say anything, just sat there. It was difficult to focus my thinking away from the danger seated across the room when my fingers were not busy. I gave praise to God silently, as I had learned was proper for a woman when I was little. Equal praise was due Sarah's insistence on staying in character. Both served me well. At some point, Jal Barundandi came back. Under the eyes of the Great Ones, he was not an unkind boss. He told Subradil it was time to leave. Subradil bestirred Sawa. As I got to my feet, I made some sounds of distress. What is that? Barundandi asked. She is hungry. We haven't eaten all day. Usually the management did provide a few scraps. That was one of the perks. Subradil and Sawa sometimes husbanded some of their share and took it home. That established and sustained the women's habit of carrying things out of the palace. The protector leaned forward. She stared intently. What had we done to tickle her suspicion? Was she just so ancient in her paranoia that she needed no clue stronger than intuition? Or was it possible that she really could read minds? Just a touch. Barundandi said, We'll go to the kitchen then. The cook's over-prepared badly today. We shuffled out behind him, each step like leaping another league out of winter toward spring, out of darkness into light. Four or five paces outside the meeting chamber, Barundandi startled us by running a hand through his hair and gasping. He told Subradil, Oh, it feels good to get out of there. That woman gives me the green willies. She gave me the green willies, too. And only the fact that I had gone deep into character to deal with them saved me giving myself away. Who would suspect that much humanity in Jal Barundandi? I got a grip on Subradil's arm and shook. Subradil responded to Barundandi softly, submissively agreeing that the protector might be a great horror. The kitchen's normally off-limits to casual labor was a dragon's hoard of edible treasures, with the dragon evicted. Subradil and Sawa ate till they could barely waddle. They loaded themselves with all the plunder they thought they would be allowed to carry off. They collected their few coppers and headed for the servant's postern before anyone could think of something else for them to do before any of Barundani's cronies realized that the customary kickbacks had been overlooked. There were armed guards outside the postern. That was new. They were greys rather than soldiers. They did not seem particularly interested in people going out. They did not bother with the usual cursory search casuals had to endure, so nobody carried off the royal cutlery. I wish our characters had more curiosity in them. I could have used a closer look at the damage we had done. They were putting up scaffolding and erecting a wooden curtain wall already. The glimpses I did catch awed me. I had only read about what the later versions of those fireball throwers could do. The face of the palace looked like a model of dark wax that someone had stuck repeatedly with a white-hot iron rod. Not only had stone melted and run, some had been vaporized. We had been released much earlier than usual. It was only mid-afternoon. I tried to walk too fast, eager to get away. Subradil refused to be rushed. Ahead of us stood quiet crowds who had come to stare at the palace. Subradil murmured something about ten thousand eyes. Chapter 9 I erred. That mass of people had not come just to examine our night's work and marvel that the protector's dead men could be so frisky. They were interested in four Bodhi disciples at the memorial posts that stood a dozen yards in front of the battered entrance, outside the growing curtain wall. 
one disciple was mounting a prayer wheel onto one of the posts. Another two were spreading an elaborately embroidered dark red-orange cloth on the cobblestones. The fourth, shaved balder and shinier than a polished apple, stood before a gray, who was sixteen at the oldest. The Bodhi disciple had his arms folded. He looked through the youngster, who seemed to be having trouble getting across the message that these men had to stop doing what they were doing. The protector forbade it. This was something that would interest even me and Subradil. She stopped walking. Sawa clung to her arm with one hand and cocked her head so she could watch, too. I felt terribly exposed standing out there, a dozen yards from the silent gawkers. Reinforcements for the young Gray arrived in the person of a grizzled Shadar sergeant who seemed to think the Bodhi's problem was deafness. Clear off, he shouted, or you'll be cleared. The Bodhi with folded arms said, The protector sent for me. Not having gotten Mergen's report yet, Sara and I had no idea what this was about. Huh? The disciple preparing the prayer wheel announced its readiness. The sergeant growled, swatted it off the post with the back of his hand. The responsible disciple bent, picked it up, began remounting it. They were not violent people, the Bodhi disciples. Nor did they resist anything, but they were stubborn. The two spreading the prayer rug were satisfied with their work. They spoke to the man with folded arms. He bowed his head slightly, then raised his eyes to meet those of the elder Shadar. In a voice loud but so calm it was disturbing, he proclaimed, Raja Dharma, the duty of kings. Know you, kingship is a trust. The king is the most exalted and conscientious servant of the people. Not one witness had any trouble hearing and understanding those words. The speaker settled himself on the prayer rug. His robes were an almost identical shade. He seemed to fade into a greater whole. One of the secondary disciples passed him a large jar. He raised that as though an offering to the sky, then dumped its contents over himself. The Shadar sergeant looked as rattled as the youngster. He peered around for help. The prayer wheel was back in place. The disciple responsible set it spinning, then backed off with the two who had spread the prayer rug. The disciple on the rug struck flint to steel and vanished in a blast of flame just as I recognized the odor of naphtha. Heat hit me like a blow. I was in character strongly enough to whimper and grab Subradil with both hands. She resumed moving, eyes wide, stunned. The man inside the flames never cried out, never moved till all life was gone and the charred husk left behind toppled over. Crows circled above, cursing in their own tongue. So Soulcatcher knew, or soon would. We continued moving into the now animated crowd and through, heading home. The Bodhi disciples who had helped prepare the ritual suicide had disappeared already while all eyes were fixed on the burning man. Chapter 10 I can't believe he did that, I said, still climbing out of Sawa's smelly rags and crippled personality. Word had beaten us home. The suicide was all anyone wanted to discuss. Our own nighttime effort had become secondary. That was over, and they had survived. Tobo definitely did not believe it. He mentioned that in passing and insisted on telling us everything his father had seen inside the palace last night. He referred to notes he had made with Goblin's help. He was thoroughly proud of the job he had done and wanted to rub our noses in it. But I couldn't really get him to talk to me, Mom. Anything I asked seemed to be just an irritation. It was like he just wanted to get it over with so he could go away. I know, dear. Sara said, I know. He's that way with me, too. Here's some nice bread they let us bring home. Eat something. Goblin. What did they do with Swan? Is he healthy? One eye cackled. 
he said. Healthy as a man with cracked ribs can be. Scarred shitless, though. He cackled again. Cracked ribs. Explain. Goblin told her. Somebody with a grudge against the greys got overexcited. But don't worry about it. The guy is going to have plenty of opportunity to be sorry he let his feelings get the best of him. I'm exhausted, Sarah said. We spent the whole day in the same room as Soul Catcher. I thought I would burst. You did? It was all I could do not to run out of there screaming. I concentrated so hard on being sour that I missed half of what they said. What didn't get said might be more important. Soul Catcher was really suspicious about the attack. I told you, go for the throat, one eye barked. Well, they still didn't believe in us. Kill them all and you wouldn't have to sneak around trying to figure out how to get the old man out. You could make those guys at the library do your research for you. We'd have just gotten killed, Sara said. Soul Catcher was already looking for trouble. The news about the Daughter of Night did that. Speaking of whom, I want you two looking for her. And Narion too. Two? Goblin asked. Soul Catcher will hunt them with a great deal of enthusiasm, I expect. I observed. Kina must be stirring again. Narion and the girl wouldn't come to Taglios unless they were confident of her protection which means the girl will start copying the books of the dead again, too. Sara, tell Mergen to keep an eye on them. Those terrible ancient volumes were buried in the same cavern as the captured. I had a thought while we were up there, after I ran out of candlesticks and didn't have anything else to do. It had been a long time since I read Mergen's annals. It didn't seem like they had much bearing on what we're trying to do, being so modern. But when I was sitting there, just a few feet from Soul Catcher, I got a really creepy feeling that I had missed something. And it's been so long since I studied those things. I can't guess what. You should have time. We'll need to lie pretty low for a few days. You'll be going to work, won't you? It would be suspicious if I didn't. I'm going to the library. I located some histories that go back to the earliest days of Taglios. Yeah? One eye croaked, jerked himself out of a half-sleep. Then find out for me why the hell the ruling gang are only princes. The territories they rule are bigger than most kingdoms around here. A question that never would have occurred to me, I said politely. Or to any native of this end of the world, probably. I'll ask, if I remembered. Nervous laughter came from the shadows in the back of the warehouse. Willow Swan. Goblin said, He's playing tonk with some guys he do in the old days. Sara said, We should get him out of the city. Where can we keep him? I need him here, I said. I need to ask him about the plane. That's why we grabbed him first and I'm not going off to some place in the country when I finally started getting somewhere at the library. Soul Catcher might have him marked somehow. We've got two half-ass wizards of our own. Have them check him over. They add up to one competent. You watch your mouth, little girl. I forget myself, one eye. You two together add up to half as much as either one alone. Sleepy has a point. If Soulcatcher marked him, you two ought to be able to find out. One eye snapped. Use your head. If she'd marked him, she'd already be here. She wouldn't be up there asking her lackeys if they'd found his bones yet. The little man climbed out of his chair, creaking and groaning. He headed for the shadows at the rear of the warehouse, but not toward Swan's voice. I said, He's right. I headed to the back myself. I had not seen Swan up close for fifteen years. 
Behind me, Tobo started grilling his mother about Morgan. He was upset because his father had been indifferent. Seemed to me there was a good chance Mergen did not understand who Tobo was. He had trouble with time. He had had that problem since the siege of Jekur. He might think it was still fifteen years ago, and he was stumbling away into a possible future. Swan stared at me for a few seconds after I stepped into the light of the lamp illuminating the table where he was playing cards with the Gupta brothers and a corporal we called Slink. Sleepy, right? You haven't changed. Goblin or one eye put some kind of hex on you? God is good to the pure of heart. How are your ribs? Swan ran fingers through the remnants of his hair. So that's the story. He touched his side. I live. You're taking it well. I needed a vacation. Nothing in my hands now. I can relax until she finds me again. Can she do that? You the captain now? The captain is the captain. I design ambushes. Can she find you? Well, son, this looks like the fabled collision between the unstoppable Whatsis and the immovable Thingy. I don't know where to lay my bets. Over here, we got the Black Company with 400 years of bad and tricky. Over there, you got Soulcatcher with four centuries of mean and crazy. It's a toss-up, I guess. She doesn't have you marked somehow? Only with scars. The way he said that made me feel I knew exactly what he meant. You want to come over to our side? You're kidding. You pulled out that stuff this morning just to ask me to join the Black Company? We pulled all that stuff this morning to show the world that we're still here and that we could do what we want, whenever we want, protector or no protector, and to take you so I can question you about the plane of glittering stone. He looked at me for several seconds, then checked his cards. There's a subject that hasn't come up in a while. You going to be stubborn about it? You kidding? I'll talk your ear off but I'll bet you don't learn a damn thing you didn't already know. He discarded a black knave. Slink jumped on the card, laid down a nine-queen spread, discarded a red queen, and grinned. He needed to see one eye about those teeth. Shit. Swan grumbled. I missed this game. How did you people learn? It's the simplest damn game in the world, but I never met a Taglian who could figure it out. I observed. You learn fast when you play with one eye. Scoot over, Sin. Let me play while I pick this guy's brain. I pulled up a stool, studying Swan every second. The man knew how to get into a character. This was not the Willow Swan that Mergen wrote about, or the Swan that Sarah saw when she visited the palace. I picked up my five cards from the next deal. This ain't a hand, it's a foot. How come you're so relaxed, Swan? No stress. You can't have a worse hand than mine. I don't got no two cards of the same suit. No stress? As of today, I got nothing to do but lean back and take it easy. Just play talk till my honey comes and takes me home. You're not afraid? Reports I've had said you're shakier than smoke used to be. His features hardened. That was not a comparison he liked. The worst has happened, hasn't it? I'm in the hands of my enemies. But I'm still healthy. There's no guarantee you'll stay that way, unless you cooperate. Darn! I'm going to have to rob a poor box if this keeps on. Play had not gotten all the way back to me before the hand ended. I did not win. I'll sing like a trained crow, Swan said, like a chorus. But I can't do you much good. I was never as close to the center as you may think. Possibly. I watched his hands closely as he dealt. 
It seemed like a moment when a skilled manipulator's ego might compel him to show himself how good he was at pulling fast moves. If he had any moves, he would not get them by me. I learned the game from one eye, too. Prove it. Tell me how Soulcatcher kept you two alive long enough to get off the plane. That's an easy one, he completed a straight deal. We ran away faster than the ghost chasing us could run. We were riding those black horses the company brought down from the north. I had ridden those enchanted beasts a few times myself. That could be the answer. They could outdistance any normal horse and could run almost forever without tiring. Maybe, maybe. She didn't have any special talisman? Not that she mentioned to me. I looked down at another terrible hand. Grilling Swan could get expensive. I am not one of the better tonk players in the gang. What happened to the horses? Far as I know, they're all dead. Time or magic or wounds got them. And the queen bitch wasn't happy about that either. She don't like walking, and she ain't fond of flying. Flying? Startled, I discarded a card I should have kept. That allowed one of the Guptas to go down and take me for another couple of coppers. Swan said, I think I'm going to like playing with you. Yeah, flying. She's got a couple of them carpets that was made by the Howler, and she just ain't real good with them. I can tell you that from personal experience. Your deal. Ain't nothing like falling off one of them suckers while it's hauling ass, even if you're only five feet high. One eye materialized. He looked about as bright and alert as he ever did these days. Room for one more. His breath smelled of alcohol. Swan grumbled. I know that voice. No. I figured you out 25 years ago. I thought we got your ass at Kadigat. Or maybe it was Baroda or Nalanda. I'm quick on my feet. Slink said, You're in. Only if you show some money up front and you agree not to deal. And you keep your hands on top of the table all the time, I added. You smite me to the heart, little girl. People might get the idea you don't trust me not to cheat. Good. That'll save them a lot of time and pain. Little girl, Swan asked. There was a whole different look in his eyes suddenly. One eye's got diarrhea of the mouth. Sit down, old man. Swan was just telling us about Soulcatcher's magic carpets and how she doesn't like flying. And I'm wondering if we couldn't find some way to take advantage of that. Swan looked from one of us to the other. I watched One Eye's hands as he picked up his first bunch of cards, just in case he might have done something to this deck sometime in the past. Little girl? Is there an echo in here? Slink asked. Is that suddenly a problem? I asked. No, no. Swan showed me the palm of his free hand. I'm just getting a lot of surprises here. Soulcatcher thought she was pretty solid on the company survivors. But I have already run into four people who are known to be dead, including the world's ugliest wizard and that Nguyen Bo woman who acts like she's in charge. One eye growled. Don't you go talking about Goblin that way. He's my pal. I'll have to stand up for him someday. <laughs> he snickered. Swan ignored him. And you? That we had down as a man. I shrugged. Not many knew, and it's not important. The dope with the eye patch and the smelly hat should have had sense enough not to mention it in front of an outsider. I glared. One eye grinned, drew a card from the pile, discarded. She is feisty, Swan. Smart, too. Design the plan that pulled you in. You started on another one, little girl. Several. I think Sarah will want the Inspector General next, though. Gokale? He can't tell us anything. 
Say it's personal. Swan. You know anything about Gokale? He dabble in little girls like Perul Koji used to? One eye gave me an evil look. Swan stared. My mess up this time. I had given something away. Too late to fuss about it. Well? Actually, yes. Swan was pale. He focused on his cards, having trouble keeping his hand steady. Those two and several others in that office. Common interests brought them together. The Radisha doesn't know. She doesn't want to know. He discarded out of turn. He had lost his zest for the game. I realized what the problem was. He thought my speaking freely meant I expected to elevate him to a higher plane before long. You're all right, Swan. Long as you behave. Long as you answer questions when you're asked. Hell, I got to save you. There's a bunch of guys buried under the glittering plane that want to talk to you about that when they get back. Might be interesting to watch him talk it over with Mergen. They're still alive? The idea seemed to stun him. Very alive, just frozen in time, and getting angrier by the minute. I thought... Great God! Shit! Do not speak so in the name of God, Slink growled. Slink was Jekuri Vedna too, and much less lapsed than I. He managed prayers at least once a day and temple several times a month. The local Vedna thought he was a Dejagoran refugee employed by Bondo Trang because he had done the Nguang Bo favors during the siege there. Most of our brothers endured genuine employment and worked hard to resemble pillars of the local community. Swan swallowed, said, You people ever eat? I ain't had nothing since yesterday. We eat, I said, but not like you're used to. It's true what they say about Nguyen Bo. They don't eat anything but fish heads and rice, eight days a week. Fish will do right now. I'll save the bitching till my belly's full. Slank, I said. We need to send a kill team down to Semki to watch the Bodhi tree. The protector's probably going to try to smash it. We could make some friends if we save it. I explained about the Bodhi disciple who burned himself and Soul Catcher's threat to turn the Bodhi tree into kindling. I'd like to go myself just to see if the Bodhi nonviolent ethic is strong enough to make them stand around while somebody destroys their most holy shrine. But I have too much work to do here. I tossed my cards in. In fact, I have work to do now. I was tired, but figured I could study Mergen's annals for a few hours before I passed out. As I walked away, Swan whispered, how the hell does she know all that? And is she really a she? Never checked personally, Slank said. I have a wife, but she's definitely got some female habits on her. What the devil did that mean? I'm just one of the guys. Chapter 11 These were exciting times. I found myself eager to be up and outside where things were happening. The impact of our boldness would have reached every cranny of the city by now. I gobbled cold rice and listened to Tobo complain again that his father had paid him no attention. Is there something I can do about that, Tobo? Huh? Unless you think I can go back there and tell him to shape up and talk to his kid... You're wasting your time and mine bitching about it. Where's your mother? She left for work. A long time ago. She said they'd be suspicious if she didn't show up today. Probably would be. They'll be real edgy about everything for a while. How about instead of fussing about what's happened already, you spend some time thinking about what you'll do next time you see your father? And in the meantime... You can stay out of trouble by keeping notes for me whenever anybody questions the prisoner. 
His glower told me he was no more excited about being offered work than any boy his age would be. You going out too? I have to go to work. It would be a good day to get to the library early. The scholars were supposed to be gone most of the day. There was supposed to be a big meeting of the Badralok, which was a loosely associated group of educated men who did not like the protector and who found the institution of the protectorate objectionable. Jokingly, they referred to themselves as a band of intellectual terrorists. Badralok means, more or less, the respectable people. And that was exactly what they thought they were. They were all educated, high-caste goonies which meant right away that a vast majority of the Taglian population regarded them with no sympathy at all. Their biggest problem with the protector was that she held their self-confident, arrogant assumption of superiority in complete contempt. As revolutionaries and terrorists, they were less incandescent than any of the low-caste social clubs that existed on every residential block in the city. I doubt that Soul Catcher wasted two spies watching them. But they had great fun, fulminating and crying on one another's shoulders about the world going to hell in a goat cart driven by the demon in black. And every week or so, it got most of the library crew out of my way. I did what I could to encourage their seditious fervor. I got off to a slow start. Not thirty yards from the warehouse exit, I ran into two of our brothers doing donkey work for Do Trang, while standing lookout. One made gestures indicating that they had something to report. Sighing, I strolled over. What's the story, River? The men called him River Walker. I did not know him by any other name. We got shadow traps that's been sprung. We got ourselves some new pets. Oh, no. Darn. I shook my head. That's not good? Not good. Run, report it to Goblin. I'll stick with Ran till you get back. Don't dawdle. I'm late for work. Not true, but Taglians have little sense of urgency, and the concept of punctuality is alien to most. Shadows in the shadow traps. Not a good eventuation, for sure. Near as we could determine, Soul Catcher had no more than two dozen manageable shadows left under control. As many more had gone feral in the remote south and were developing reputations as Rakshasas, which were demons or devils, but not quite like those my northern forebrethren knew. Northern demons seemed to be solitary beings of considerable power. Rakshasas are communal and pretty weak individually, but deadly. Very deadly. In ancient myth, of course, they are much more powerful. They swat each other over the head with mountaintops, grow two heads for everyone chopped off by a hero, and collect the beautiful wives of kings who are really gods incarnate, but do not remember that fact. Things must have been much more exciting in olden times, even if they did not make a lot of sense from day to day. Catcher would keep a close eye on her shadows. They were her most valuable resource. Which meant that if they had been sent out to spy, she should know exactly where each was supposed to have gone. At least that is the way I would have done it if I were committing irreplaceable resources. I did that for every single man we committed to Willow Swan's capture. I knew how they were going to get to their places, and how they were going to get home, and everything they were supposed to do in between. And just like I figured Soul Catcher might, I would have gone looking for them personally if they had failed to return home. Goblin came hobbling into the early morning light, cursing all the way. He wore the all covering brown wool of a Vaedine dervish. He hated the outfit, however necessary it was to disguise himself when he was outside. I did not blame him. The wool was hot. He was supposed to remind the holy men of the hell they were escaping by devoting themselves to chastity, asceticism, and good works. Where the hell is this shit? He growled. It's hot enough to boil eggs out here already. 
The boys say we've caught something in our shadow traps. I thought you might want to do something about that before Mama comes looking for her babies. Shit. More work. Old man, you just had something in your mouth I wouldn't even want in my hand. Vedna Pris, get the flock out of here before I give you a real language and lesson. And bring home something decent to eat when you come back. Like maybe a cow. More than once, he and One Eye had conspired to kidnap one of the sacred cattle that wander the city. To date, their efforts have come to naught, because none of the men will go along. The majority have goony backgrounds. It took no time at all to learn that our shadow captives were not the only shadows that had run wild just before dawn. Rumor was rife. The stories of the murders the shadows committed banished news of the attack on the palace and the self-immolation of the Bodhi disciple. The killings were closer to home and closer in time. And they were grotesque. The corpse of a man whose life has been devoured by a shadow is a twisted husk of the creature that was. I insinuated myself into the crowd surrounding the doorway of a family where there had been multiple deaths. You can do that when you are little and limber and know how to use your elbows. I arrived just in time to watch them bring the bodies out. I was hoping they would be exposed to the public eye. Not that I wanted to see them myself. I saw plenty of those kinds of bodies during the Shadow Master Wars. I just thought the people ought to see what Soul Catcher could do. She needed all the enemies she could get. The bodies were enshrouded already, but there was talk. I traveled on, learning that most of the dead had been people who lived on the streets. And there had been a lot of those, taken in no obvious pattern whatsoever. It looked like Soulcatcher had sent the shadows out just to demonstrate that she had the power and the will to kill. The deaths had evoked no great fear. People thought it was over. Most of them did not know any of the dead, so we're not angry either. Curiosity and revulsion were the common emotions. I considered turning back to tell Goblin to fix the captured shadows so they would go out killing again tonight and every night thereafter, till Soulcatcher tracked them down. She would not look for trappers if she thought her pets had gone rogue, and the shadows would create a lot more enemies for her before their terror ended. At first it seemed the greys had faded from the streets. They were less in evidence than usual. But as I skirted Chorbagan, it became evident why. They had the place under siege, apparently on the assumption that any black company survivors, having been branded bandits by the protector, would hide themselves amongst Taglios's homegrown thieves and villains. Amusing. Sarah and I insist that we have as little to do with the criminal element as possible, over one eye's objections, and ignoring Bondo Trang's occasional lapses. That element included folk of dubious morals and discipline, who might serve us up for enough blood money to buy one more jar of illegal wine. I hoped they and the Greys had fun. I hoped somebody forgot the rules and their day turned bloody. That would make life easier for me and mine. Any trip across town exposes you to the cruel truth about Taglios. Beggary exists there like nowhere else in the world. Were someone to sweep the city clean and organize the beggars into regiments, they would number more than the biggest army the captain put together in the days of the Shadow Master Wars. If you look the least bit foreign or prosperous, they come at you in waves. Every attempt is made to exploit your pity. Not far from Do Trang's warehouse, there is a boy with neither hands nor lower legs. Somehow, blocks of wood have been affixed in their place. He crawls around with a bowl in his mouth. Every cripple over the age of fifteen claims to be a wounded hero of the wars. The children are the worst. Often they have been maimed deliberately, their limbs deformed evilly. They are sold to men who then feel they own them because they feed them a handful of toasted grain every few days. A new mystery of the city is that men of that stripe seem to run the risk of cruel tortures and their own careers as deformed beggars. 
if they do not watch their backs very, very carefully. My route took me near one such. He had one arm he could use to drag himself around. The rest of his limbs were twisted ruins. His bones had been crushed to gravel, but he had been kept alive by a dedicated effort. His face and exposed skin were covered with burn scars. I paused to place one small copper in his bowl. He whimpered and tried to crawl away. He could still see out of one eye. Everywhere you looked, life proceeded in the unique Taglian fashion. Every vehicle in motion had people hanging off it, sponging a ride, unless it was the rickshaw of a rich man, perhaps a banker from Cowlery Street, who could afford outrunners armed with bamboo canes to keep people off. Shopkeepers often sat on top of their tiny counters because there was no other space. Workmen jogged hither and yon with back-breaking loads, violently cursing everyone in their way. The people argued, laughed, waved their arms wildly, simply stepped to the side of the street where no one was lying to defecate when the need came upon them. They bathed in the water in the gutters, indifferent to the fact that a neighbor was urinating in the same stream fifteen feet away. Taglios is an all-out, relentless assault upon all the senses, but engages none so much as it does the sense of smell. I hate the rainy season, but without its protracted sluicings out, Taglios would become untenable even for rats. Without the rains, the endemic cholera and smallpox would be far worse than they are, though the rainy times bring outbreaks of malaria and yellow fever. Disease of every sort is common and accepted stoically. And then there are the lepers, whose plight gives new depth of meaning to horror and despair. Never do I find my faith in God so tested as when I consider the lepers. I am as terrified by them as anyone, but I do know enough about some individuals to realize that very few are being visited by a scourge they deserve. Unless the goonie are right and they are paying for evils done in previous lives. Up above it all are the kites and crows, the buzzards and vultures. For the eaters of carrion, life is good, till the dead wagons come to collect the fallen. The people come from everywhere, from five hundred miles, to find their fortunes, but fortune is an ugly two-faced goddess. When you have lived with her handiwork for half a generation, you hardly notice any more. You forget that this is not the way life has to be. You cease to marvel at just how much evil man can conjure simply by existing. Chapter 12 The Library Created by and bequeathed to the city by an earlier mercantile prince, who was much impressed by learning, strikes me as a symbol of knowledge, rearing up to shed its light into the surrounding darkness of ignorance. Some of the city's worst slums wash right up against the wall, enclosing its ground. The beggars are bad around its outer gates. Why is a puzzlement? I have never seen anyone toss them a coin. There is a gateman, but he is not a guard. He lacks even a bamboo cane but a cane is unnecessary. The sanctity of the place of knowledge is observed by everyone. Everyone but me, you might say. Good morning, Adu, I said as the gateman swung the wrought iron open for me. Though I was a glorified sweeper and fetch-it man, I had status. I appeared to enjoy the favor of some of the Badralok, Status and caste grew more important as Taglios became more crowded and resources grew less plentiful. Caste has become much more rigidly defined and observed in just the last ten years. People are desperate to cling to the little that they have already. Likewise, the trade guilds have grown increasingly powerful. Several have raised small private armed forces that they use to make sure immigrants and other outsiders do not trample on their preserves or that they sometimes hire out to temples or others in need of justice. Some of our brothers have done some work in that vein. 
It generates revenue and creates contacts and allows us glimpses inside otherwise closed societies. Outside, the library resembles the more ornate Guni temples. Its pillars and walls are covered with reliefs, recalling stories both mythical and historical. It is not a huge place, being just 30 yards on its long side and 60 feet the other way. Its main floor is elevated ten feet above the surrounding gardens and monuments, which themselves cap a small knoll. The building proper is tall enough that inside there is a full-size hanging gallery all the way around at the level where a second floor should be, then an attic of sorts above that, plus a well-drained basement below the main floor. I find that interior much too open for comfort. Unless I am way down low or way up high, everyone can watch what I am doing. The main floor is an expanse of marble brought from somewhere far away. Upon it, in neat rows, stand the desks and tables where the scholars work, either studying or copying decaying manuscripts. The climate is not conducive to the longevity of books. There is a certain sadness to the library, a developing air of neglect. Scholars grow fewer each year. The protector does not care about the library because it cannot brag that it contains old books full of deadly spells. There is not one grimoire in the place. Though there is a lot of very interesting stuff, if she bothered to look. But that sort of curiosity is not part of her character. There are more glass windows in the library than anywhere else I have ever seen. The copyists need a lot of light. Most of them these days are old and their sight is failing. Master Santaraxita often goes on about the library having no future. No one wants to visit it anymore. He believes that has something to do with the hysterical fear of the past that began to build soon after the rise of the Shadow Masters, when he was still a young man back when fear of the Black Company gained circulation before the company ever appeared. I stepped into the library and surveyed it. I loved the place. In another time, I would gladly have become one of Master Centaraxita's acolytes. If I could have survived the close scrutiny endured by would-be students. I was not goony. I was not high caste. The former I could fake well enough to get by. I had been surrounded by Goonie all my life. But I did not know caste from within. Only the priestly caste and some selected commercial caste folks were permitted to be literate. Though familiar with the Vulgate and the High Mode both, I could never pretend to have grown up in a priestly household fallen on hard times. I had not grown up in much of any kind of household. I had the place entirely to myself and there was no obvious cleaning that needed doing right away. It ever amazed me that no one actually lived in the library, that it was more holy or more frightening than a temple. The Kangali, the parentless and homeless and fearless boys of the street who run in troops of six to eight, see temples as just another potential resource, but they would not trouble the library. To the unlettered, the knowledge contained in books was almost as terrible as the knowledge bound up in the flesh of a creature as wicked as Soul Catcher. I had one of the best jobs in Taglios. I was the main caretaker at the biggest depository and replicatory of books within the Taglian Empire. It had taken three and a half years of scheming and several carefully targeted murders to put me into a position I enjoyed way too much. Always before me was the temptation to forget the company. The temptation might have gotten me had I had the social qualifications to be anything but a janitor who sneaked peeks into books when nobody was looking. In quick order, I conjured the tools of my purported trade, then hurried to one of the more remote copying desks. It was out of the way, yet offered a good line of vision and good acoustics, so I would not be surprised doing something both forbidden and impossible. I had gotten caught twice already, lucky both times with tantric books illuminated with illustrations. They thought I was sneaking peeks at dirty pictures. Master Centaraxita himself suggested I go study temple walls if that sort of thing appealed to me. 
but I could not help feeling that he began to harbor a deep suspicion after the second incident. They never threatened me with dismissal or even punishment, but they made it clear I was out of line, that the gods punish those who exceed caste and station. They were, of course, unaware of my origins or associations, or of my disinclination to accept the Guni religion with all its idolatry and tolerance for wickedness. I dug out the book that purported to be a history of Taglios's earliest days. I would not have been aware of it had I not noticed it being copied from a manuscript so old that much of it had appeared to be in a style of calligraphy resembling that of the old annals I was having so much trouble deciphering. Old Baladitya, the copyist, had had no difficulty rendering the text in modern Taglian. I have salvaged the moldy, crumbling original. I had it hidden. I had a notion that by comparing versions, I could get a handle on the dialect of those old annals. If not, Girish would be offered a chance to translate for the Black Company an opportunity he ought to pounce on considering the alternative available at that point. I already knew that the books I wanted to translate were copies of even earlier versions, at least two of which had been transcribed originally in another language entirely, presumably that spoken by our first brothers when they came down off the plain of glittering stone. I started at the beginning. It was an interesting story. Taglios began as a collection of mud huts beside the river. Some of the villagers fished and dodged crocodiles, while others raised a variety of crops. The city grew for no obvious reason, beyond its being the last viable landing before the river lost itself in the pestilential delta swamps, in those days not yet inhabited by the Nguang Bo. Trade from upriver continued overland, to all the great kingdoms of the south, not a one of those was mentioned by name. Taglios began as a tributary of Baladil Taila, a city great in oral histories and no longer in existence. It is sometimes associated with some really ancient ruins outside the village of Videha, which itself is associated with the intellectual achievements of a curus empire, and is the center of ruins of another sort entirely. Baladil Tyla was the birthplace of Radranach, the warrior king who nearly exterminated the deceivers in antiquity and who harried the handful of survivors into burying their sacred texts, the books of the dead, in that same cavern where Mergen now lay entombed with all the old men in their cobwebs of ice. Not all this was information from the book I was reading. As I went, I made connections with things I had read or heard elsewhere. This was very exciting stuff for me. Here was an answer for Goblin. The princes of Taglios could not be kings because they honored as their sovereigns the kings of Nanda, who raised them up. Of course, Nanda was no more, and Goblin would want to know why. In that case, the Taglian princes could not just crown themselves. There were plenty of precedents. From the looks of the history of the centuries before the coming of the Black Company, that had been the favorite pastime of anybody who could get three or four men to follow him around. I overcame a powerful urge to rush ahead and look for the era when the free companies of Kadavar exploded upon the world. What had happened before that would help explain what had happened when they did. Chapter 13 a sudden startled thrill ran through me. I was not alone anymore. A long time had passed. The sun had swung several hours across the sky. The quality of the light within the library had changed. It had become a much paler version of its morning self. Presumably the clouds had passed away. I did not jump or, I hope, show any immediate outward reaction but I did have to respond visibly to my awareness of the presence of whoever was standing behind me. Perhaps it was his breath that alerted me. The curry and garlic were strong. Certainly I never heard a sound. I brought my heartbeat under control, smoothed my features, turned. The master of the library, my boss, 
Surendranath Santaraksita, met my gaze. Durabi, I believe you are reading. At the library, they know me as Dorabi De Banerjai, an honorable name. A man of that name died beside me in a skirmish near the Dhaka woods a long time ago. He did not need it any more, and I would do it no harm. I did not speak. The truth would be hard to deny if the master had been there long. I was halfway through the book, which was of the bound sort and contained no illustrations whatsoever, not even one tantric passage. I have been watching you for some time, Dorabi. Your interest and skill are both evident. It's clear that you read better than most of my copyists. Yet it's equally obvious that you aren't of the priestly caste. My face was still as old cheese. I was wondering if I should kill him and how I could dispose of the corpse if I did. Perhaps the stranglers could be framed. No. Master Centaraxita was old, but still hale enough to throw me around if I tried to throttle him. Being small has definite disadvantages at times. He had eight inches on me, but at the moment that seemed like several feet. And someone else was moving around at the other end of the library. I heard voices. I did not drop my eyes the way a menial should. Master Centaraxita already knew I was more than a curious sweeper though a good one. I kept the place spotless. That was a company rule. Our public characters had to be morally straight and excellent workers, which did not make some of the men at all happy. I waited. Master Santaraxita would decide his own fate. He would decide the fate of the library that he loved. So, our Dorby is a man of more talents than we suspected. What else do you do that we don't know about Dora B? Can you write as well? I did not answer. Of course. Where did you learn? It has long been the contention of many of the Badralok that those not of the priestly caste do not have the mental facility to learn the high mode. Still, I did not speak. Eventually, he would commit to movement in some direction, I would respond accordingly. I hoped I could avoid destroying him and his brethren and stripping the library of whatever might be useful. That was the course one I wanted to follow years ago. Never mind being subtle. Never mind not alerting Soul Catcher to what was happening right under her nose. You have nothing to say? No defense. A pursuit of knowledge needs no defense. Sri Sondel Ghosh, the Janaka, declared that in the Garden of Wisdom there is no caste. Albeit in an age when caste had much less meaning. Sondel Ghosh spoke at the University of Vikramas, where all the students had to pass an exhaustive examination before they were allowed to enter the grounds. Do you suppose many students of any caste were admitted who were unable to read the Panas and Pashids? Sondel Ghosh was not called the Janaka for nothing. Vikramas was the seat of Jane religious study. A janitor who knows about a religion long dead. We are indeed entering the age of Kadi, where all is turned upon its head. Kadi is the favorite Taglian name for Kina in one of her less vicious aspects. The name Kina is seldom spoken, lest the dark mother hear and respond. Only the deceivers want her to come around. Where did you acquire this skill? Who taught you? A friend started me out a long time ago. After we buried him, I continued to teach myself. My gaze never left his face. For a goofy old boffin whose stuffiness was grist for the mockery of the younger copyists, he seemed remarkably flexible mentally. But then, he might be brighter than he seemed. He might realize that he could buy himself a float down river to the swamps if the wrong words passed his lips. No. Master Surendranath Santaraxita did not 
yet live in a world where one who read and cherished sacred texts also cut throats and trafficked with sorcerers, the dead and rakshasas. Master Surendranath Santaraksita did not think of himself that way, but he was a sort of holy hermit, self-consecrated to preserve all that was good in knowledge and culture. This much I had discovered already through continuous observation. I had figured out also that we might not often agree on what was good. You just wish to learn, then. I lust after knowledge the way some men lust after pleasures of the flesh. I've always been that way. I can't help it. It's an obsession. Santaraxita leaned a little closer, studying me with myopic eyes. You are older than you seem. I confessed. People think I'm younger than I am because I'm small. Tell me about yourself, Dora B. De Banerjee. Who was your father? Of what family was your mother? You will not have heard of them. I considered refusing to elaborate. But Dora B. De Banerjee did have a story. I had been rehearsing it for seven years. If I just stayed in character, it would all be true. Stay in character. Be Doraby caught reading. Let Sleepy worry about what to do when it was time for Sleepy to come back on stage. You denigrate yourself over much, Santaraxita said at one point. I may have known your father. If he was the same Dolal de Banerjee, who could not resist the Liberator's call for recruits when he raised the original legion that triumphed at Gorja Ford, I had named dead Dorabee's father already. I could not take that back now. How could he know Dolal anyway? Banerjee was one of the oldest and most common of traditional Taglian surnames. Banerjees were mentioned in the text I had been reading till months ago. That may have been him. I never knew him well. I do recall him boasting that he was one of the first to enroll. He marched off with the Liberator to defeat the Shadow Masters. He never came back from Gorja Ford. I did not know much more about Dorabee's family, not even his mother's name. In all Taglios, how could it be possible I would encounter anyone who remembered the father? Fortune is indeed a goddess filled with caprice. Did you know him well? If that was so, the librarian might have to go. Just that would make my exposure inevitable. No, not well. Not well at all. Now Master Santaraxita seemed disinclined to say more. He seemed worrisomely thoughtful. After a moment, he told me, Come with me, Dorabi. Sri? You brought up the university at Vikramas. I have a list of the questions the gate guards put to those who wanted to enroll. Curiosity impels me to subject you to the same examination. I know little about your name, Master. If the truth were told, I was a bit shaky on the tenets of my own religion, always having been afraid to examine it too closely. Other religions do not stand up to the rigorous application of reason. For all, we have things like Kina stalking the earth. And I really did not want to find myself stumbling over any boulders of absurdity protruding from the bedrock of my own faith. The examination was not religious in nature, Dora B. It tested the prospective student's morals, ethics, and ability to think. Janaka monks did not wish to educate potential leaders who would come to their calling with the stain of darkness upon their souls. That being the case, I had to get into character very deeply indeed. Sleepy, the Vedna soldier girl from Jaikur, had stains on her soul blacker than a shadow of all night falling. Chapter 14 Then what did you do? Tobo asked. Around a mouthful of spicy Taglian-style rice, I told him, then I went out and made sure the library was clean. 
and Surendranath Santaraksita remained where he was, stunned into immobility by the answers he had received from a lowly sweeper. I could have told him that anyone who paid attention to the storytellers in the street, the sermons of mendicant priests, and the readily available gratuitous advice of hermits and yogis could have satisfied most of the Vikrama's questions. Darn it, a Vedna woman from Jaikur could do it. We got to kill him, one eye said. How do you want to do it? That's always your solution these days, isn't it? I asked. The more we get rid of now, the fewer there'll be around to aggravate me in my old age. I could not tell if he was joking. When you start getting old, we'll worry about it. Guy like that will be easy, little girl. He won't be looking for it. Bam! He's gone. And nobody'll care. Strangle his ass. Leave a rumel on him. Blame it on our old buddy Narayan. He's in town. We need to put all kinds of shit off on him. Language, old man. One eye babbled on, putting a name to animal waste in a hundred tongues. I turned my back. Sarah? You've been very quiet. I've been trying to digest what I picked up today. By the way, Jol Barundandi was distraught because you stayed home. Tried to take your kickback out of my wages. He finally found Min Subredil's limit. I threatened to scream. He would have called my bluff if his wife hadn't been around somewhere. Are you sure it's safe to let this librarian live? If it looked natural, no one would suspect. It may not be safe, but it could pay dividends. Master Centauraxita wants to make some kind of experiment out of me. To see if a low-caste dog really can be taught to roll over and play dead. What about Soul Catcher? What about the shadows? Did you learn anything? She loosed everything she had. Just an impulse. No master plan except to remind the city of her power. She expected the victims to be immigrants who live in the streets. No one much cares about them. Only a handful of shadows got back before dawn. Our captives won't be missed until tomorrow. We could go catch a few more. Bats, Goblin said, inviting himself to take a seat. One eye appeared to have dozed off. He still had hold of his cane, though. Bats! There's bats out there tonight! Sorrow offered a confirming nod. Goblin said, Back before we marched against the Shadow Masters, we killed all the bats had bounties on them big enough for bat hunters to make a living, because the shadow masters used them to spy. I recalled the time when crows were murdered relentlessly because they might be acting as soul catchers' far-flying eyes. You're saying we should stay in tonight? Mine like a stone axe, this old gal. I asked Sarah. What did soul catcher think about our attack? It didn't come up where I could hear. She pushed some sheets from the old annals across. The body suicide bothered her more. She's afraid it might start a trend. A trend? There could be more than one monk goofy enough to set himself on fire? She thinks so? Tobo asked. Mom, are we going to call up Dad tonight? I don't know right now, dear. I want to talk to him some more. You will. I'm sure he's interested in talking to you, too. She sounded like she was trying to convince herself. I asked Goblin, Would it be possible for you to keep that mist thing going all the time so we could keep Mergen connected? At any time we wanted, we could just send him where we needed to know about something? We're working on it. He took off on a technical rant. I did not understand a word, but I let him roll. He deserved to feel good about something. One eye began to snore. The smart would stay out of reach of his cane anyway. I said, Tobo could keep notes all the time. I had had this sudden vision of the son of the analyst taking over for the father. 
the way it goes in Taglian guilds, where trades and tools pass down generation after generation. In fact, one eye said, as though no time had passed since the last remark, and as though he had not been faking sleep a moment ago. Right now's the time you could play you a really great big old hairiest old-time company dirty trick, little girl. Send somebody down to the Silk Merchants Exchange. Have them get you some silk, different colors, big enough to make up copies of them scarves the stranglers use, them rumels. Then we start picking off the guys we don't like anyway. Once in a while we leave one of them scarves behind, like with that librarian. I said, I like that, except the part about Master Centaraxita. That's a closed subject, old man. One eye cackled. Man's got to stand by what he believes. It would get a lot of fingers pointing, Goblin said. One eye cackled again. It would point them in some other direction, too, little girl. And I'm thinking we don't want much more attention coming our way right now. I'm thinking maybe we're closer to figuring things out than any of us realizes. Water sleeps. We have to be taken seriously. That's what I'm saying. We use them scarves to take out informants and guys who know too much. Librarians, for instance. Would I be correct in my suspicion that you've been thinking about this for a while, and by chance you just happen to have a little list all ready to go? Very likely any such list would include all the people responsible for his several failed attempts to establish himself in the Taglian black markets. He cackled. He took a swipe at Goblin with his cane. And you said she's got the mind like a flint hatchet. Bring me the list. I'll discuss it with Mergen next time I see him. With a ghost? They got no sense of perspective, you know. You mean maybe he's seen everything and knows what you're really up to? Sounds like a perspective to me. Makes me wonder how far the company might have gone if our four brethren had had a ghost to keep an eye on you. One eye grumbled something about how unfair and unreasonable the world was. He had been singing that song the whole time I had known him. He would keep it up after he became a ghost himself. I mused, You think we could get Mergen to winkle out the source of the stink that keeps coming from the back there? Where Do Trang hides his crocodile skins? I know it's not them. Croc hides have a flavor all their own. One eye scowled. He was ready to change the subject now. The odor in question came from his beer and liquor manufacturing project, hidden in a cellar he and Do Trang thought nobody knew about. Bon Do Trang, once our benefactor for Sara's sake, now is practically one of the gang because he had a powerful taste for One Eye's product, a huge hunger for illegal and shadowy income, and he liked having tough guys on the payroll who would work hard for very little money. He thought his vice was a secret he shared only with One Eye and Gota. The three of them got drunk together twice a week. Alcohol is a definite Yuang Bo weakness. I'm sure it's not worth the trouble, little girl. It's probably dead rats. Bad rat problem in this town. Do Trang puts rat poison out all the time. By the pound. No need to waste Morgan's time chasing rodents. You've both got better things to do. I would be talking over a lot of things with Morgan if I could deal with him directly. If we could catch and keep his attention... I would like to know firsthand everything that ordinarily came to me through other people. I imply no malice, particularly from Sarah. But people do reshape information according to their own prejudices. Including even me, possibly. Though until now, my objectivity has been peerless. All my predecessors, though, their reports must be read with a jaundiced eye. Of course, most of them made the same observation in regard to their own predecessors. So we are all in agreement. Everyone is a liar but us. Only Lady was unabashedly self-congratulating. She missed few opportunities to remind those who came later how brilliant and determined and successful she was. 
turning the tide of the Shadow Master Wars when she had nothing to begin building upon but herself. Morgan was, putting it charitably, less than sane much of the time. Because I lived through many of the times and events he recollected, I have to say he did pretty good. Most of what he recorded could be true. I cannot contradict him. But a lot he set down does seem fanciful. Fanciful? Last night I had a long chat with his ghost, or spirit, or ka, whatever that was. If that was really Morgan and not some trick played on us by Kina or Soul Catcher, we can never be 100% certain that anything is exactly what it appears to be. Kina is the mother of deceit, and Soul Catcher, to quote a man far wiser and more foul of mouth than I, is a mud-sucking lunatic. Chapter 15 This is excellent, I enthused again as Sara summoned Morgan once more. She herself betrayed no enthusiasm for the task. Tobo's hovering did nothing to improve her temper. Before he does anything else, I want to have him check on Surendranath Centaraxita. So you don't trust the librarian after all, one eye said. He chuckled. I think he's all right, but why hand him a chance to break my heart if I can avoid it by keeping an eye on him? How come it's got to be my eye? There's not a sharper one available, is there? And you already turned down a chance to work on the annals. I've got to do some heavy studying in those tonight. I might be on the track of something. The little wizard grunted. I think I found something at the library today. If Centaraxita doesn't trip me up, I may have an outside view of the first coming of the company by the end of the week. An independent historical source has been a goal almost as long as has been our desire for a look at uncontaminated editions of the earliest three volumes of the annals. Sara had something else on her mind. Baron Dandy wants me to bring Sawa to work, Sleepy. No. Sawa is on hiatus. She's sick. She has cholera, if that's what it takes. I'm finally starting to make some real headway. I'm not going to let that slide now. He's also been asking about Shiki. Back when Tobo had accompanied his mother to the palace occasionally, she had called him Shikandini which was a joke Jal Barandandi never got because he was not the sort to pay attention to historical mythology. One of the kings of legendary Hastinapur had had a senior wife who seemed to be barren, a good goonie. He prayed and made sacrifice faithfully, and eventually one of the gods stepped down from heaven to tell him he could have what he wanted, which was a son. But he was going to get it the hard way, for the son would be born a daughter. And, as they say, it came to pass that the wife brought forth a daughter whom the king then named Shikandin, a name that also existed in the female form, Shikandini. It is a long and not that interesting story, but the girl grew up to become a mighty warrior. The trouble started when it came time for the prince to take a bride. Many of our public characters have obscure illusions or jokes built into them. That helped make things more interesting for the brothers playing the roles. I asked, Do we have any reason to snatch Baron Dandi? Other than his general sliminess? I thought he was most useful right where he was. Any replacement was sure to be as venal and unlikely to be as kind to me and Subradil. And could we even get him out where we could touch him? Nobody suggested a strategic reason for grabbing the man. Sara wanted to know, why do you ask? Because I do think we could lure him if we dress Tobo up pretty, then refuse to cooperate unless Barandandi meets him outside. Sara was not offended. The ruse is a legitimate weapon of war. She looked thoughtful. Maybe Gokhale instead? Perhaps. Though he might want someone younger. We can ask Swan. I was thinking of catching Gokhale in the place where the deceivers killed that other one. The enemy's leading personalities seldom left the palace, which was why we had chosen to go get Willow Swan. Sara began to sing. Morgan was reluctant again tonight. 
I said. Morgan should look at that joy house, too. He'd be the best way for us to check it out. Though, no doubt, we could find several brothers willing to risk themselves in an extended recon. Sarah nodded, did not break the rhythm of her lullaby. We might even... No. We could not just burn the place once Gokale had been inside long enough to become seriously engaged. Nobody would understand why I wanted to waste a perfectly good whorehouse though a few might find a deadly fire highly amusing. One eye looked like he was sleeping again, but was not. Without opening his eyes, he asked, You know where you're going, little girl? You got some kind of overall plan? Yes. I was surprised to find that I really believed that. Intuitively, somewhere inside, though I had not known it consciously, I had engineered a master plan for the liberation of the captured and the resurrection of the company. And it was starting to come together, after all these years. Mergen showed up, muttering about a white crow. He was distracted. I asked the wizards, You figure out how to anchor him here yet? Always some damn thing. One eye grumbled. Whatever you do, it's never enough. It can't be done, Goblin admitted. But I still don't see why we would want to. He hasn't been very cooperative. He doesn't want to be here. He's losing his connection to the real world. He'd rather sleep and wander those caverns. I took a stab in the dark. And put on his white wings. Be Cotty's messenger. White wings? They did not read the annals. The albino crow that turns up sometimes. Sometimes Mergen is inside it, because Kina puts him there, or used to put him there. And now he keeps stumbling back in, the way he kept stumbling around in time once Soulcatcher got him started. How do you know that? I read sometimes. And once in a while, I even read the annals and try to figure out what Mergen didn't tell us, what he might not actually have known himself. Right now, he may be enamored of being the White Crow, because that way he gets into actual flesh that ranges outside the caverns. Or he may just be falling under the influence of Kina as she wakes up again. But none of that ought to matter much right now. Right now, we have a bunch of spying we need him to do. I want to be able to twist his arm if I have to. The mission comes first. Mergen himself taught me that. Sara said, Sleep is right. Anchor him. Then I'll grab him by the nose and kick his behind until I've got his undivided attention. She seemed suddenly optimistic, as though taking a direct approach with her husband was some totally new concept fraught with unexpected hope. She went straight to outright confrontation, drawing Tobo in to support her. Maybe she could rebuild Mergen's ties with the outside world. I turned to the others. I found another Kina myth this morning. In this one, her father didn't trick her into going to sleep. She died. Then her husband got so upset that... Husband! Goblin squeaked. What husband? I don't know, Goblin. The book didn't name names. It was written for people who grew up in the Goonie religion. It assumes you know who they're talking about. When Kina died, her husband was so grief-stricken, he grabbed up her corpse and started doing that stomping dance Mergen talks about her doing in his visions. He got so violent that the other gods were afraid he would destroy the world. So her father threw an enchanted knife that cut her up into about fifty pieces, and every place one of the chunks fell became a holy place for Kina's worshippers. Just reading between the lines and guessing, I'd say Kadavar is where her head hit the ground. I got a notion one eye was on the right track back when he was going to desert and retire. One eye gawked. Goblin saying something positive about anything he ever did? The hell I was. I just had an attack of juvenile angst. I got over it and got responsible again. There's a new concept, I observed. One eye responsible. For catastrophes and afflictions, maybe, Goblin said. One eye said, 
I don't get the Kena story. If she died back at the beginning of the world, how could she be giving us trouble for the last twenty or thirty years? It's religion, dimwit, Goblin barked. It don't got to make sense. Kena is a goddess, I said. I guess gods can't ever be completely dead. I don't know, one eye. I didn't make it up. I just reported it. Look, the Goonie don't believe anybody dies, really. Their soul goes on. <laughs> Goblin chuckled. If these Goonie got it right, you're in deep shit, rump boy. You gotta keep going round on the wheel of life till you get it right. You got a lot of karma to work off. Stop now, I snapped. We're supposed to be working. Work. Not the favorite swear word of either man. I told them, You get Mergen nailed down, or chained down, whatever it takes to keep him under control. Then you help Sara try to get through to him. I have a suspicion things are going to get exciting before long, and we'll need him wide awake and cooperative. One Eye grumbled. Sounds to me like you don't plan to be here looking over our shoulders. I was up already. Clever man. I have some reading and some translating to do. You can manage without me, if you concentrate. One Eye told Goblin, We got to get that little bit into the sack with some guy will pork our brains out. His cure for all ills, even at his age. I paused to say, When he's given everything else the once-over, have him search for Narian and the Daughter of Night. I did not need to explain how badly we needed to keep those two from achieving their ends. Chapter 16 I've got it! I shouted, running back to the corner where Mergen's friends and family were trying to torment him into taking a broader interest in the world of the living. I found it! I've got it! I hope you ain't gonna give it to me! One eye grumbled. My excitement was so loud and intense, even Mergen, who was caught in the mist and being a real pain about his situation, paused to study me. I had a feeling, an intuition the other day, that the answer was in the annals, in Mergen's annals, and I'd just overlooked it. Maybe because it had been so long since I read them, and I wouldn't have thought to look for it back then. And behold, One eye sneered. There it is, an ink of gold on Mayrex tinted paper with little scarlet arrows saying, Here it is, little girl, the secret of the... Stuff it, dust bag, Goblin snapped. I want to hear what Sleepy found. Though it would have been him doing the sarcasm if one eye had not beat him to it. It's the whole thing with the Nguyen Bo. Well, maybe not all of it, I said as Sara scowled at me. But the part with Uncle Doge and Mother Goda, and why they came out of the swamp when they didn't have a debt of honor like your brother, Sara? Sara's brother, Tai Day, was under the glittering plain with Mergen, serving as his bodyguard because of what Mergen and the company had done to help the Nguyen Bo during the siege of Jekur. Sara, you must know some of this. That may be true, Sleepy. But you'll have to tell us what you're talking about first. I'm talking about whatever it was that the thousand voices stole from the temple of Gangisha sometime between the end of the siege and when Uncle Doge and your mother invited themselves to come stay with you here in Taglios. Mergen touches on it over and over, lightly. But I don't think he ever really caught on completely. Whatever it was that the thousand voices stole, Uncle Doge called it the key. From other internal evidence, I think it had to be another key to the shadow gate like the Lance of Passion. The Thousand Voices was what the Nguyen Bo called Soul Catcher. I think if we had that key, we could open the way for the captured. If I was guessing right here, I had created a whole new line of inquiry. Why the Nguyen Bo? Sara began shaking her head slowly. Am I wrong? What is the key, then? I'm not saying you're wrong, Sleepy. I'm saying I don't want you to be right. There are things I wouldn't want to be true. 
What? Why? Myths and legends, Sleepy. Ugly myths and legends. Some of them I'm not supposed to know. And I know I don't know them all. Probably none of the worst. Doge was their curator and keeper, as you are for the Black Company. But Doge never shared his secrets. Tobo, find your grandmother. Bring her here. Get Do Trang, too, if he's here. Bewildered, the boy shuffled away. A spectral whisper came out of the device where Mergen waited. Sleepy may be right. I recall suspecting something like that and wondering if I could find a good history of the Nguang Bo so I could figure it out. You'll need to question Willow Swan, too. I said, I'll do that later, separately. Swan doesn't need to know what's happening. Are you paying attention now, Standard Bearer? Do you have any idea where we're at and what we're doing? I do. His tone was resigned, though. Like mine when I know I have to get up in the morning, want to or not. Tell me about the Temple of Gangesha, then. Both of you. Why would this key have been kept there? Sara did not want to talk about it. Her whole body said she was caught up in a ferocious internal struggle. Why is this so hard? I asked. There is old evil in my people's past. I'm only vaguely familiar with it. Doge knows the whole truth. The rest of us just understand that our ancestors were guilty of a great sin, and until we expiate it, our whole race is condemned to live in bitter destitution in the swamp. The temple was a holy place long before some Nguyen Bo began to adopt Guni beliefs. It protected something, possibly the key you mentioned, the thing Uncle Doge has been looking for. Where did the Nguyen Bo come from, Sarah? That question had intrigued me since childhood. Each few years, hundreds of those strange people would pass through Jaikur on pilgrimage. They were quiet and orderly and stayed to themselves. And a year after they arrived from the north, they would pass through again, going back that way. Even at the height of the power of the Shadow Masters, that cycle had continued. Nobody knew where they went. Nobody ever cared. Out of the south somewhere, a long time ago, from beyond the Don de Presh? I could not imagine subjecting little children and old folks to the rigors of a journey of that magnitude. The pilgrimage had to be very important indeed. Yes. But there are no pilgrimages anymore. The one that had ended up with hundreds of Nguyen Bo dying in Jaikur was the last of which I was aware. The Shadow Master and the Kialune Wars made the next few times impossible. There's supposed to be a pilgrimage every four years. Each Nguyen Bo de Duang has to make the pilgrimage at least once as an adult. For a while, the lack was no problem. But now the protector will not permit the people to meet their obligations. Bondo Trang rasped from his wheelchair, having arrived in time to catch the drift of my interrogation. There are things we do not discuss with those who aren't Nguyen Bao. I got the feeling he was saying the same thing twice at one time. One way for my benefit and another for Sarah's. This could be ticklish. We dared not offend Bondo Trang, whose friendship we needed. If we lost him, we also risked losing Sarah, whose value to the company could not be calculated. Nothing is ever simple and straightforward. I told the old man the way I had it figured. Kai Goto waddled in just as I started. My eyes widened as one eye gallantly offered her his seat. It is a world just chock full of wonders. The little wizard went and got another seat, which he set next to Goda's. The two of them sat there leaning on their canes like a couple of temple gargoyles. A ghost of ancient beauty peeked out of the wide, permanent scowl that Goda used for a face. I explained the situation. But here's the mystery. Where is the key today? Nobody volunteered that information. 
I'd think that if the Thousand Voices still had it, she'd be running down to Kialune every month to round up a new gaggle of killer shadows, if it could open the shadow gate safely. And if Uncle Doge had it, he wouldn't be roaming around looking for it. He'd be back in the swamp, blithely letting the rest of us go to Al Shale in a handcart. Am I wrong, Mother Goda? You know the man. You must be able to offer something. Able, perhaps. Willing, of course not. The big thing that stands out to my ear about the company's sojourn in the South is the stubborn silence of so many people about everything. Like if we even discovered our own birthdays, that would be something we could use against them. The fact that the company now consists almost entirely of native soldiers has not helped at all. Our life does not attract the knowledgeable, educated portion of the population. If a priest offered to sign on, he would send him downriver, knowing for certain that he was a spy. You got the damned gimmick? One eye asked. Who? You, little girl. The villainous you. I didn't forget that you are Soul Catcher's guest for a while. When she caught you on the road coming back from running that message for Morgan, I haven't forgotten that when our sweet old Uncle Doge rescued you, it was incidental. He was looking for his missing trinket, the key. Not so? That's all true. But I didn't bring anything away from that, except a few new scars and the rags on my back. What we need to know, then, is has Soul Catcher been looking for the key? We don't know for sure. But she does fly down south occasionally and patrols the old ground like she's looking for something. We knew that, courtesy of Morgan. Though till now, her behavior had made no sense. So who else could have snatched this prize? One Eye did not press Goda for any information. The way to get around Goda was to ignore her. In time, she would insist that she be noticed. I remembered a pale, ragged little girl who, though just four years old, had seemed ageless, silent and patient, confidently unfrightened by her captivity. The daughter of night. She never spoke to me once. She acknowledged my existence only when she had to, because if she irritated me too much, I might take all of what little food Soulcatcher allowed us. I should have strangled her then, but at that time... I did not know who she was. At that time, I was having trouble remembering who I was. Soul Catcher had drugged me and gone down inside me and found half what made me me, then had tried being me in order to infiltrate the company. I still wonder how well she really knows me. Certainly I do not want her to find out that I survived the Kialune Wars. She might have the emotional weapons to crush me. Narion came to get the Daughter of Night, I mused aloud. But I caught only glimpses of him. An extremely skinny little man in a filthy loincloth who didn't look anything like the terrible monster he was supposed to be. It didn't occur to me it was him till I realized I wasn't going to be released, too. Since I couldn't see what they were doing, I don't know if they took anything with them. Morgan, you saw them then. I have it written down that you did. Did they take anything away that might have been this key? I don't know. Believe it or not, you really do miss some things out here. He seemed piqued. I realized I had not bothered to hear what he had to report. I asked. Not much useful, Sarah told me, cutting Mergen off before he could retell everything from the beginning. Can you find them now? I foresaw trouble. There was an unwilling connection to Kina. If the dark goddess was stirring again, he would have to be careful not to attract divine attention. We have these priorities regarding the daughter of night. Kill her. Failing that, kill her sidekick. Failing that, make sure she can't copy the books of the dead. 
which I'm sure she'll start doing again as soon as she develops a reliable connection with Kina. Finally, recapture anything she and Singh might have carried off when Narayan rescued her. One Eye stopped nodding off long enough to clap his hands lazily. Tear him up, little girl, tear him up! Sarky old reprobate. One Eye snickered. Goblin said, You want another angle? Find out from your library pals who makes bound blank books. Go to them and find out who's ordered some recently. Or bribe them to let you know when anybody does. Gosh, I said, somebody who actually uses his brain to think. The delight of the world is that its wonders never cease. Where the devil did Mergen go? Sarah said, You just told him to find Narayan Singh and the Daughter of Night. I didn't mean right this second. I wanted to know if he found out anything about Chandra Gokhale we can use. Pressure getting to you, little girl. One Eye's tone was so sweet I wanted to pop him. Relax. Now's the time when you don't want to force anything. A couple of men from the duty crew, Run Must Sing and the Shadowlander dubbed Kendo Cutter by his squad mates, invited themselves into the staff meeting. Kendo reported, There's all kinds of screaming going on out there tonight. I sent out word everybody should hole up someplace where there's plenty of light. Sara said, The shadows are hunting. I said, We'll be all right here. But just to be safe, Goblin, why don't you make the rounds with Kindo and Runmust? We don't want any surprises. Sara, will Soulcatcher let the shadows run completely wild? To make her point? You're the analyst. What do the books say about her? They say she's capable of anything. She has no connection with the humanity of anyone else. It must be very lonely to be her. What? We agree our next target should be Chandra Gokhale? Sarah eyed me oddly. That had been decided already, unless some better opportunity fell into our laps. We would eliminate the Inspector General, without whom the tax system and the bureaucratic side of government would stumble and stagger. He also seemed the most vulnerable of our enemies, and his removal would leave the Radisha more isolated than ever, cut off by the protector on one hand, the priests on the other, and unable to turn anywhere because she was the Radisha, the princess, unapproachable, in some respects a demigoddess. It had to be lonely to be her, too. Subtlety and Finesse I asked, what did we do today to frighten the world? Then I realized that I knew the answer. It had been part of the plan for capturing Swan. All the Brotherhood would have avoided any risks. Tonight, there would be shows from buttons previously planted. There would be more again tomorrow night. Smoke and light shows proclaiming, Water sleeps, or My brother unforgiven, or All their days are numbered. There would be more, somewhere, every evening from now on. Sarah mused, Someone who wasn't one of us brought in another prayer wheel and mounted it on a memorial post outside the north entrance. It hadn't been noticed yet when I left. Same message? I presume. That's scary. That could be a potent one. Raja Dharma. It has the Radisha thinking already. That monk burning himself definitely got our attention. Story of my life. Here I spend months working out every tiny detail of a marvelous plan, and I get upstaged by a lunatic with a fire fetish. So those body nuts found a good message. You think we could steal some of their thunder? One eye chuckled evilly. What? I demanded. Sometimes I amaze myself. Goblin, about to leave with Runmust and Kendo, observed, You've been amazed at yourself for two hundred years, mainly because nobody else bothers to get interested in insects. You better not go to sleep any time soon, Frogface.
Gentlemen? Sara said, gently. Yet she grabbed the attention of both wizards. Can we stick to business? I need some sleep. Absolutely, Goblin said. Absolutely. If the old fart has an idea, let's get it out here before it dies of loneliness. You may continue your assignment. Goblin stuck out his tongue but left. Amaze the rest of us, one eye, I suggested. I did not want him dozing off before he shared his wisdom. Next time one of those bodhi loons lights himself up, we have the smoke and flames carry our message. Water sleeps, and a new one I thunk up, nor even death destroy. You got to admit, that's got a nice religious ring to it. Indeed, I agreed. What the heck does it mean? Little girl, don't you start in on me. The ghost of evil's past whispered, I found them. Mergen was back. I did not ask who. Where? The thieves' garden. Shor Bagan? The greys have it under siege. And they were still serious about getting the place cleaned out, Mergen said. Chapter 17 Sorrow wakened me well before dawn, which is not my best time of day. When I opted for a military career, we were besieged in my hometown. I just knew that once we got out of here, we would sleep till noon, we would eat fresh food all the time, and there would be plenty of it, and never, ever would we have to go out in the rain again. In the meantime, I took the best I could get, which was the black company during the siege, with the water fifty feet deep. The only thing resembling fresh food was the long pig Mogaba and his gnar friends were enjoying, unless you counted the occasional lame rat or slow-wetted crow. What? I grumbled. Personally, I am convinced that even the priests of happy-go-lucky old Gangisha are not required to be pleasant before an hour much closer to noon than this was. I have to go to the palace. You have to appear at the library. If we want to snatch Narion and the girl right in front of the greys, we need to start planning right now. She was right. But that did not mean I had to accept it gracefully. Every company member inside Do Trang's complex and Bon himself gathered over a crude breakfast. Only Tobo and Mother Goda were absent. But they would have no part in any of this, I thought. Nobody from outside could be included now, because shadows were on the prowl. We got a plan all worked out, one eye announced proudly. I'm sure it's one stroke of genius after another, I replied as I made a groggy effort to collect a bowl of cold rice, a mango, and a bowl of tea. First thing, Goblin goes up there in his dervish outfit. Then Tobo comes strutting along. Good morning, Adu, I murmured distractedly as the gateman admitted me to the library grounds. I was worried about leaving Goblin and One-Eye to operate on their own. My mother instinct at work, they said, both showing nasty teeth as they reminded me that every hen has to trust her chicks on their own sometime. A point well made. Though few hens have to worry about their chicks getting drunk, forgetting what they are doing, and wandering off in search of adventure in a city where there is not even one other skinny little black man or ugly little white character. Adu nodded his greeting. He never had anything to say. Inside the library, I went to work immediately, though only a couple of copyists had arrived before me. Sometimes Doraby focused as intently as Sawa did, that helped turn off the worries. Doraby? Doraby de Banerjai? I started awake, amazed that I had fallen asleep. I had squatted down on my heels in a corner, in a fashion common amongst Guni and Yuangbo, but not common among Vedna, Shadar, or many of the ethnic minorities. We Vedna favor sitting on the floor or on a cushion cross-legged. Shadar like low chairs or stools. 
Not owning at least a crude stool is the truest mark of poverty among the Shadar. I was in character even in my sleep. Master Santaraxita? Are you ill? He sounded concerned. Tired. I didn't sleep well. The Skildisha were hunting last night. I used the Shadowlander name for the shadows. That did not trouble Santaraxita. It had become part of the language under the protectorate. The screams kept waking me up. I understand. I did not enjoy a sound sleep myself, though not for that reason. I was unaware of the horror till I saw its marks this morning. The Skildirsha show a proper respect for the priestly clan, then? The faintest twitch of his lip told me he had not missed the joke. I am properly appalled, Dorabi. This is evil unlike any we have ever known. The blind misfortune of flood or plague or disaster we must endure stoically. And against the darkness even the gods themselves sometimes contend in vain. But to send out a pack of these shadows to do murder randomly and often, and for no reason even an insane man can comprehend. That is evil of the sort the northerners used to preach. Doraby managed a credible job of looking slack-jawed. I'm sorry. I'm exercised. You probably never saw any of the outsiders. He placed the same stress on outsiders that many Taglians used when they meant the Black Company specifically. I did. I saw the Liberator himself once when I was little. And I saw the one they called the lieutenant after she came back from Dejagore. I was pretty far away, but I remember it because that was the same day she killed all the priests and the protector. I saw her a couple of times. I was making it up as I went, but that was the sort of thing most adult Taglians could claim. The company had been in and out of the city for years before the final campaign against Long Shadow and the Fortress Overlook. I rose. I'll get back to work now. You do your job well, Dorabi. Thank you, Master Santa Raxita. I try. Indeed. He seemed to be having trouble getting something out. I have decided that you will be allowed access to any books not in the restricted section. Restricted books were those not available in multiple copies. Only the most favored scholars were allowed near those. So far, I had been able to determine only a handful of the titles of the books so set aside. When you have no other obligations. Part of my day, every day, I spent just waiting to be told about something I needed to do. Thank you, Master Santa Raxita. I'll expect you to be able to discuss them. Yes, Master Santa Raxita. We have set our feet upon an unknown road, Dorabi. An exciting and frightening journey lies ahead. His prejudices were such that he actually meant what he said. Me reading had twisted his universe all out of shape, and now he was going to conspire in this perverted vermiculation. I took my broom in hand. Exciting and frightening things would be happening elsewhere in my universe and I hated every second that I was not there to control them. Chapter 18 The little dervish in brown wool seemed completely lost inside himself. He was busy talking to himself, paying no attention to the surrounding world. Most likely he was quoting to himself from the sacred texts of the Vedna, as understood by his peculiar splinter sect. Though tired and irritable, the greys did not challenge him immediately. They had been taught to honor all holy men, not just those already secure within the Shadar truths. Any devoted stalker after wisdom would find his path leading him to enlightenment eventually. Tolerance of such seekers was common to all Taglians. The welfare of the soul and the spirit were of grave concern to most, the Guni, indeed, considered the seeking of enlightenment to be one of the four key stages of an ideally lived life. 
once a man successfully raised up and provided for his children, he should put all things material, all ambition and pleasure aside. He should go into a forest to live as a hermit or become a mendicant seeker, or in some other way should live out his final years looking for the truth and purifying his soul. Many of the greatest names in Taglian and Southern history are those of kings and rich men who chose just such a path. But human nature being human nature... The Greys did not, however, let the dervish follow his quest into Chorbagan. A sergeant intercepted him. His associates surrounded the holy man. The sergeant said, Father, you cannot go in that direction. This street has been closed to traffic by order of Minister Swan. Even dead, Swan had to take the blame for Soulcatcher's policies. The dervish apparently failed to notice the greys till he actually collided with the sergeant. Huh? The younger greys laughed. Men enjoy seeing their prejudices confirmed. The sergeant repeated his message. He added, You must turn right or left. We are rooting out the evils and festing what lies straight ahead. He possessed a touch of wit. The dervish looked first right, then left. He shivered, then announced, All evil is the result of metaphysical error. In a raspy little voice, and started along the street to the right. It was a very strange street. It was almost empty of humanity. In Taglios, that was something seldom seen. A moment later, the Shadar sergeant squealed in surprise and pain. He began slapping his side. What's the matter? Another gray asked. Something bit me! He squealed again, which indicated that he was in a great deal of agony, for Shadar were proud of their ability to endure pain without outcry or even flinching. Two of the sergeant's men tried to lift his shirt, while a third clung to his arm in an effort to keep him immobile. He shrieked again. Smoke began to boil out of his side. The greys were so startled they backed away. The sergeant went down. He went into convulsions. Smoke continued to boil up. It assumed a form none of the greys wanted to see. Niasi! The demon Niasi began to whisper secrets no Shadar wanted to hear. Grinning to himself, Goblin slipped into Chorbagan. He disappeared long before anyone wondered if there might not be a connection between the sergeant's discomfort and the Vaidine dervish. Greys arrived from all directions. Officers barked and cursed and drove them back to their stations before the denizens of Chorbagan seized the opportunity to escape. Obviously, this was a distraction meant to give their prey the chance to run. A crowd had begun to gather, too. Among them was a Nguangbo boy who picked his moment, cut a purse, and fled past the greys, one of whom recalled him from the evening when one of their own got stoned. Discipline began to collapse. The grey officers tried, and managed rather well, considering. Only a few people escaped Chorbagan, and a half dozen slipped inside, among them a skinny little old man in the all-enveloping yellow of a leper. One Eye was not pleased. He was sure strategy had had nothing to do with it being him who had to assume the yellow. Goblin was up to something wicked. The six raiders approached the target tenement from front and rear in loose teams of three. One Eye was around front. People cleared off fast when they saw the yellow. Lepers were held in absolute terror. None of the men wanted to carry out a raid in broad daylight. It was not the company way. But darkness was denied us till Soulcatcher pulled her shadows back off the streets. And the consensus of the analysts and wizards was that it was less likely that the Daughter of Night could summon Kina's help during daylight. Daytime also offered a better chance of taking her by surprise. Each team paused to make sure every man still wore his yarn bracelet before they stormed into the tenement. Each wizard set loose an array of previously prepared low-grade confusion spells that buzzed through the ramshackle structure 
like a swarm of drunken mosquitoes. The attackers passed inside, stepping over and around frightened, shivering families who, till now, had considered themselves wildly fortunate to have a roof over their heads, even if that meant renting floor space in a hallway. Both teams posted a man who would make sure no one went outside. Another two men met at the foot of the rickety stair. They would prevent movement up or down. Goblin and One-Eye met at the cellar entrance and shared a few complaints about being desperately undermanned. Then a few exaggerated courtesies as each offered the other the opportunity to go down into the enemy's den first. Goblin finally accepted on the basis of superior youth, quickness, and alleged intelligence. He launched a couple of luminary floating stars into the pit, where the darkness was blacker than Kina's heart. Here, Goblin said. Ha! We've got... Something like a flaming tiger burst out of nowhere. It leaped at Goblin. A shadow drifted in from the side. It flicked something long and thin that looped around the little wizard's neck. One eye's cane came down on Narion's wrist, hard enough to crack bone. The living saint of the strangler lost his rumel, which flew across the cellar. One eye's offhand tossed something over Goblin's head toward the source of the tiger. A ghostly light floated up like a wisp of luminescent swamp gas. It moved, suddenly enveloping a young woman. She began to slap at herself, trying to wipe it off. Goblin did something quick, while she was distracted. She collapsed. God damn, god damn! It worked! I'm a genius! Admit it, I'm a fucking genius! Who's a genius? Who came up with the plan? Plan? What plan? Success is in the details, runt. Who came up with the details? Any damn fool could have said, let's go catch them two. Both men tied limbs as they nattered. One eye said, Plan the details on this. We got to get out of here with these people, through all the greys in the world. Already covered. They've got so much trouble, they won't have time to worry about any damned lepers. He started trying to get a yellow outfit over the head of the Daughter of Night. Remind me to warn them back at the shop that this one can put together an illusion or two. I know that's the way it's supposed to go. When I began dragging Narion Singh into another yellow outfit, in a moment, Goblin would trade his brown for yellow too. Upstairs, the four company brothers, all of Shadar origin, were turning themselves into greys. I'm saying it ain't got a prayer of working. That's because I planned it? Absolutely. You're beginning to catch on. Welcome to reality. It goes to shit in your hands. You can blame it on Sleepy, not me. It was her idea. We got to do something about that girl. She thinks too damned much. Will you quit farting around? Them goddamn greys out there are going to have time to go home for lunch. Don't hit him so hard. You want him to walk out of here under his own power. You talking to me? What the hell are you doing with... Get your hand out of there, you old pervert. I'm putting a control amulet over her heart, you dried up old turd so she won't embarrass us before we get her home. Oh, yeah, sure you are. But why don't I look on the bright side? At least you're interested in girls again. She built as nice as her mother? Better. Watch your mouth. The place might be haunted, and I got a suspicion maybe some of those ghosts can talk to each other, no matter what Mergen claims. When I began to bully the groggy Narion Singh up the steps. I do believe this is going to work, One Eye crowed. The combination of greys and lepers seemed the perfect device for exiting the thieves' garden. Particularly now that the real greys were running around distracted. I don't want to break your heart, old timer, Goblin said, but I think we done been fished. He was looking over his shoulder. One eye looked back. 
Shit. A small flying carpet dropped toward them, accompanied by crows making no sounds at all. Soul catcher and her very stance suggested mischievous glee. She threw something. Spread out, Goblin barked. Don't let those two get away. He faced the descending carpet, heart in his throat. If it came to a direct face-off, he was going to get splattered like a stomped egg. He extended a gloved hand, caught the falling black globule, whipped his arm in a circle and launched the missile back into the sky. Soulcatcher shrieked, outraged. The people of Taglios did not have that kind of nerve. She drove the carpet to one side, avoiding the black globe. And well she moved when she did. Her luck had served her yet again. A screaming fireball ripped right through the space she had vacated the same kind of fireball that had eaten all those holes in the palace wall and had set the bodies of so many men burning like bad fat candles. She continued to dive. Two more fireballs barely missed her. She put a tenement between herself and the sharpshooters. She was extremely angry, but did not let rage cloud her thinking. Above her, her crows began bursting like soundless fireworks. Blood, flesh, and feathers rained down. In seconds, she figured it out, conversing with herself in a committee of voices. They had not been hiding inside Chorbagan after all. She could not have caught anyone trying to slip away like this if they had not come in to retrieve something they did not want found. They're here in the city. But we haven't found them. We haven't seen a trace or heard a rumor that they didn't want to reach our ears. Until now. That takes wizardry. That bold little one. That was the toad man. Goblin. Though the great general of the armies, Mogaba, assures us that he saw the body himself. Who else is alive? Could the great general himself be less trustworthy than he would like us to believe? That was not possible. Mugaba had no other friends. He was committed in perpetuity. Soulcatcher brought her carpet to earth, stepped off, folded its light bamboo frame, rolled the carpet around that, surveyed the street. They had come down this way, from up there. What could they have wanted desperately enough to have exposed themselves so thoroughly. Anything they thought that important would be something she was bound to find very interesting herself. It took just one whispered word of power to illuminate the cellar. The squalor was appalling. Soul Catcher turned slowly. A man and his daughter, apparently. An old man and a young woman, anyway. One lamp, discarded clothing, a few handfuls of rice some fish meal? Why the writing instruments and ink? What was this? A book. Somebody had just begun writing in it in an unfamiliar alphabet. She caught a spot of black movement in the corner of her eye. She whirled, crouching, fearing an attack by a rogue shadow. The Skildirsha maintained an especially potent hatred for those who dared command them. A rat fled dropping the object of its curiosity. Soulcatcher knelt, picked up a long strip of black silk with an antique silver coin sewn into one corner. Oh, I see. She began to laugh like a young girl, catching on late to the meaning of an off-color joke. She collected the book, surveyed the scene once more before leaving. Dedication sure doesn't pay. Once in the street again, she reassembled her carpet, unconcerned about snipers. Those people would be long gone and far away. They knew their business, but crows should be tracking them. She froze, staring upward, but not really seeing the white crow on the peak of the tenement roof. How did they find out where those two were? Chapter 19 what happened? Sarah demanded as soon as she came in, before she began shedding me and Subradil's rags. I was still Dorby Day Banerjai myself. We lost Mergen somehow. Goblin thought they had him anchored, but he went away while we were all out. 
and I don't know how to get him back. I meant what happened in the thieves' garden. Soul Catcher was out there. Whatever she tried to pull didn't work out, but she came back a different person. I didn't get to hear everything she told the Radisha, but I do know she found something or figured out something that changed her whole attitude. Like everything suddenly stopped being fun. I said, Oh, I don't know. Maybe Mergen can tell us. If we can get him back here. Goblin joined us. He was pushing a sleeping one-eye in Bondo Trang's spare wheelchair. He announced, They arrest him peacefully. Drugged. Narion was distraught. The girl took it pretty calmly. We need to worry about her. What's wrong with him? I asked, indicating one eye. He's worn out. He's an old man. I want to see you have half the energy he does when you get to be half his age. Sarah asked, Why do we need to worry about the girl? Because she's her mother's daughter. She doesn't have much skill with it yet. Because she hasn't had anybody to teach her, but she's got the natural ability to become a substantial sorceress. Maybe even as powerful as her mother, but without Lady's rudimentary sense of ethics. It reeks off her. Tain't the only thing she reeks of, neither. One eye chirped. First thing you do with that little honey, you throw her in a vat of hot water, then throw in a couple four lumps of lye soap and let her soak for a week. Sarah and I exchanged glances. If she was bad enough to offend one eye, she had to be ripe indeed. Goblin grinned from ear to ear, but eschewed temptation. I said, I hear you ran into the protector. She was on a roof or somewhere, waiting for something to happen. She didn't get what she expected, a couple of fireballs, and she ducked and stayed ducked. You made it home without being followed. I knew the answer because I knew they knew the stakes. They would not have come anywhere near here had they had the slightest doubt that that was safe. I had to ask. Even knowing that if they had failed, the warehouse would be buried in greys already. We were ready to deal with the crows. All but one, one eye grumbled. What? I saw a white one up there. It didn't try to follow us, though. Once again, Sara and I exchanged glances. Sara said, I'm going to change and relax and get something to eat. Let's meet in an hour. If you could find it in your heart, Goblin, you might try to get Mergen back here. You're the necromancer. You're the one who claimed he anchored him. One hour. Goblin began grumbling to himself. One eye chuckled and made no offer to help. He asked me, You ready to kill your librarian yet? I did not tell him so, but I was slightly more open to the suggestion tonight. Surindranath Centaraxita seemed to suspect that Dorby Day Banerjai was something more than he pretended. Or maybe I was just paranoid enough to hear things Centaraxita never intended to say. You don't worry about Master Centaraxita. He's being very good to me. Today he told me I can look at any book I want, unless it's in the restricted stacks. Ooh, one eye breathed. Somebody finally found the way to her heart. Who'd a thunk a book would do it? Name the first one after me, little girl. I waved a fist under his nose. I'd knock out your last tooth and call you mushy. But I was brought up to respect my elders, even if they're rambling, demented, and senile. For all its one true God focus, my religion contains a strong taint of ancestor worship. Every Vedna believes his forefathers can hear his prayers and can intercede with God and his saints, if he feels he has been properly treated. I'm going to follow Sarah's example. You holler if you want to get in practice for your new boyfriend. <laughs> his cackle ended abruptly as Goda limped around me. When I glanced back, one eye appeared to be sound asleep again. Must have been some other old fool running his mouth. During the siege of Jaikur, I announced that never again would I be picky about what I ate. 
that I would respond to anything offered me with a smile of gratitude and a spoken thank you. But time has a way of wearing away at such vows. I was nearly as sick of rice and smoked fish as Goblin and One-Eye were. Breaking the tedium with the occasional supper of rice and fish meal did not seem to help. I am confident that it is their diet that makes the Nguyen Bo such humorless people. I ran into Sarah, who had bathed and let her hair down and relaxed, looking a decade younger, so that it was easy to see how, a decade earlier still, she could have been every young man's fantasy. I still have a little money I took off somebody who picked the wrong side down south, I told her, waving a tiny piece of fish caught between two bamboo chopsticks. Yuang Bo refused to adopt innovative utensils that have been in common use amongst everyone else in this part of the world for centuries. Those who did the cooking in Do Trang's complex were all Yuang Bo. What? Sara was completely baffled. I'll give it up. If we can buy a pig with it. Vedna are not supposed to eat pork. But I made the mistake of being born female, so I probably do not have a seat reserved in paradise anyway. Or anything else that doesn't go through the water like this. I made a wiggly motion with one hand. Sarah did not understand. Food was a matter of indifference to her. So long as she got some, fish and rice forever were perfectly fine. And she was probably right. There are plenty of people out there who have to eat chatu because they cannot afford rice and others cannot afford any food at all, though Soul Catcher seemed to be thinning those out now. Sara started to tell me something about a rumor that another Bodhi disciple was going to present himself at the entrance to the palace and demand an audience with the Radisha. But we were approaching the lighted area where we worked our wickednesses of evenings, and she saw something there that made her stop. I started to say, Then we need to get somebody next to him, Sara growled. What the hell is he doing here? I saw it now. Uncle Doge was back, probably determined to invite himself into our lives again. His timing seemed interesting and suspect. I also found it interesting that Sara spoke Taglian when she was stressed. She had some definite points of contention with her own people, though around the warehouse nobody used Nguyen Bo except Mother Goda who did so only to remain a pain. Uncle Doge was a wide little man who, though on the brink of seventy, was mostly muscle and gristle. And in recent years, bad temper. He carried a long, slightly curved sword he called Ashwand. Ashwand was his soul. He had told me so. He was some sort of priest, but would not bother to explain. His religion involved martial arts and holy swords, though. He was nobody's uncle in reality. Uncle was a title of respect among Nguyen Bo, and they all seemed to consider Doge a man worthy of the greatest respect. Uncle Doge has meandered in and out of our lives since the siege of Jaikur, always more distraction than contribution. He could be underfoot for years at a stretch then would disappear for weeks or months or years. This latest time, he had been out of the way for more than a year. When he did turn up, he never bothered reporting what he had been doing or where he had been, but judging from Mergen's observations and my own, he was still searching for his key diligently. Curious, him materializing so suddenly after my epiphany. I asked Sarah, Did your mother happen to leave the warehouse today? That question occurred to me, too. It might be worth pursuit. Very little warmth existed between mother and daughter. Mergen was not the cause, but absolutely had become the symbol. Uncle Doge was supposed to be a minor wizard. I never saw any evidence to support that, other than his uncanny skill with Ashwand. He was old and his joints were getting stiff. His reflexes were fading but I could not think of anyone who would remotely be his match. Nor have I ever heard of anyone else dedicating his life to a piece of steel the way he has. Maybe I did have evidence of his being a wizard, I reflected. 
He never had any trouble getting through the mazes Goblin and One-Eye had created to save us the embarrassment of unexpected walk-ins. Those two ought to tie him down till he explained how he did that. I asked Sarah, How do you want to handle this? Her voice was edged with flint. Far as I'm concerned, we can lump him right in there with Singh and the Daughter of Night. The enemy of my enemy is my enemy, huh? I never liked Doge much. By Nguyen Bo standards, he's a great and honorable man, a hero due great respect. And he's the embodiment of everything I find distasteful about my people. Secretive, huh? She betrayed a hint of a smile. In that, she was as guilty as any other Nguyen Bo. That's in the blood. Tobo noticed us watching and talking. He darted over. He was excited enough to forget he was a surly young man. Mom! Uncle Doge is here! So I see. He says what he wants this time? I touched her arm gently, cautioning her. No need to start butting heads. Doge, of course, was aware of our presence. I never saw a man so intensely aware of his environment. He might have heard every word we whispered, too. I put no store in the chance that time had weathered his sense of hearing. He gobbled rice and paid us no heed. I told Sarah, Go say hello. I need a second to put my face on. I ought to send for the greys. Have them raid the place. I'm too tired for this. She did not bother to keep her voice down. Mom? Chapter 20 I held Doge's eye. My face was cold. My voice held no emotion whatsoever as I asked, What is the key? Bound, gagged, Narayan Singh and Daughter of Night watched and waited their turn. The faintest flicker of surprise stirred in Doge's eyes. I was not the sort he expected to be a questioner. I was in character again, a borrowed one based on a gang enforcer who had offended us a few years ago, Vajra the Naga. The gang was out of business, and Vajra the Naga had gone on to a better world, but his legacy occasionally proved useful. Doge enjoyed the reasonable expectation that he would not be tortured. I had no intention of taking it that far. With him. The company's fortunes and those of the Nguyen Bo had become so intermingled that I could not brutalize Doge without alienating our most useful allies. Doge volunteered nothing, nor did I expect him to be any more vocal than a stone. I told him, we need to open the way onto the glittering plain. We know you don't have the key. We do know where to start looking for it. We'll be pleased to return it to you once we release our brothers. I paused, giving him time to surprise me by replying. He did not. You are, perhaps, philosophically opposed to opening the way. We're going to disappoint you on that. The way will open. Somehow. You have only the option of participating or not participating. Doge's eyes shifted, just for an instant. He wanted to read Sarah's stance. Hers was plain. She had a husband trapped under the glittering plain. The wishes of the lone priest of some obscure, never-explained cult carried no weight with her. Not even Bondo Trang or Kai Goda offered demonstrative support, though both would favor him mainly out of decades of inertia. If you don't cooperate, then we won't return the key when we're done with it. And we will determine what constitutes cooperation. The first step is to put an end to all of the normal Nguyen-Bo equivocation and evasion and selective deafness. Vajra the Naga was not a character I liked to adopt too often. A Naga was a mythical serpent being that lived beneath the earth and had no sympathy whatever for anything human. 
The trouble with the character was that I could slip into it like it had been tailored for me. It would take only a small emotional distortion to turn me into Vajra the Naga. You have something we want. A book. I was betting a lot on my having reasoned out or intuited the course of various hidden events based upon what I had gotten from Mergen and his annals. It's about so by so, and this thick, bound in tan vellum. The writing inside is in an untrained hand, in language no one has spoken for seven centuries. Specifically, it is a nearly complete copy of the first volume of the Books of the Dead. The lost sacred texts of the children of Kina, chances are you didn't know that. Narion and even the Daughter of Night reacted to that. I continued. The book was stolen from the fortress overlook by the sorcerer called the Howler. He concealed it because he didn't want Soul Catcher to get it, nor did he want the child to have it. You either saw him hide it or stumbled onto it soon after he did. You concealed it somewhere you feel is safe, ignoring the fact that nothing can remain hidden forever. Some eyes will discover anything, eventually. Once again, I allowed Doge time for remarks. He chose to pass on the opportunity. You have a choice in all this. I remind you, though, that you're getting old, that your chosen successor is buried under the plain with my brothers, and that you have no allies more favorable than Gotha, whose enthusiasm has to be suspect at this late date. You may choose to say nothing, ever, in which case truth will follow you into the darkness. But the key will remain here, in other hands. Have you had enough to eat? Has Do Trang been a good host? Will somebody help our guest find something to drink? We shouldn't be scorned for our failures of hospitality. You didn't get the word out of him, one I complained as soon as Doge was out of earshot. I didn't expect to. I just wanted him to have something to think about. Let's talk to these two. Scoot Singh over here. Take the gag off and turn him so he can't get cues from the girl. She was spooky. Even bound and gagged, she radiated a disturbingly potent presence. Put her in the company of people already prepared to believe that she was touched by the dark divine, and it was easy to understand why the deceiver cult was making a comeback. Interesting, though, that that was a recent phenomenon that for a decade she and Narion had been fugitives painstakingly taking control of the few surviving deceivers and evading the protector's agents. And now, just as we feel we are up to tugging a few beards, they began making their survival known too. I had no trouble seeing where the goony imagination would find connections and portents and wild harbingers of the Year of the Skulls. Narion Sin... I said in my Vajra the Naga voice. You're a stubborn old man. You should have been dead long ago. Perhaps Kina does favor you, which would suggest that here in my hands is where the goddess wants you to be. We Vedna are good at blaming everything on God. Nothing can happen that is not the will of God. Therefore, he has already measured the depth of the brown stuff and has decided to toss you in. And these are bloody hands. Make no mistake. Singh looked at me. He did not fear much. He did not recognize me. If our paths had crossed before, I had been too minor an annoyance for him to recall. The daughter of night remembered me, though. She was thinking that I was a mistake she would not be making again. I was thinking maybe she was a mistake we ought not to make, however useful a tool she might become. She almost scared Vajra the Naga, who had been too dense to comprehend fear in personal terms. You're troubled by events, but aren't afraid. You rely upon your goddess. Good. 
Let me provide assurances. We won't harm you, assuming you cooperate, however much we owe you. He did not believe a word of that, and I did not blame him. That was the usual sort of hold out a feather of hope a torturer used to leverage cooperation from the doomed. In this case, the pain will all be directed elsewhere. He tried to turn to look at the girl. Not just there, Narian Singh. Not only there. Though that's where we'll start, Narian. You have something we want. We have several things we believe to be of value to you. I'm prepared to make an exchange, sworn in the names of all our gods. Narian had nothing to say, yet. But I began to sense that his ears might be open to the right words. The daughter of night sensed that, too. She squirmed. She tried to make some kind of noise. She was going to be as stubborn and crazy as her mother and aunt. Must be the blood. Narian Singh, in another life, you were a vegetable seller in the town called Gondowar. Every other summer, you would go off to lead your company of Tuga. Singh looked uncomfortable and puzzled. This was nothing he expected. You had a wife, Yashodara, whom you called Lily in private. You had a daughter, Gaditya, which was maybe just a little too clever a naming. You had three sons, Valmiki, Sugriva, and Aridatha. Aridatha you've never seen because he wasn't born until after the Shadow Masters carried the able men of Gondowar off into captivity. Narian looked more uncomfortable and troubled than ever. His life before the coming of the Shadow Masters was a lost episode. Since his unexpected salvation, he had dedicated himself solely to his goddess and her daughter. Those times were so unsettled that you have since proceeded on the reasonable assumption that nothing of your former life survived the coming of the Shadow Masters. But that assumption is a false one, Narayan Singh. Yashidara bore you that third son, Aridatha, and lived to see him become a grown man. Though she endured great poverty and despair, your lily survived until just two years ago. In fact, until just after we located her. I still did not know for certain if some of my brothers had not grown overly zealous in their eagerness to locate Narayan. Of your sons, Aridatha and Sugriva still live, as does your daughter Kaditya. Though she has used the name Amba, since she learned, to her horror, that her very father was the Narayan Singh of such widespread infamy. By stealing Lady's baby, Narion had ensured that his name would live on amongst those of the great villains. Everyone over a certain age knew the name and a score of evil stories burdening it. The majority of them fabrications or accretions of stories, formerly attached to some other human demon whose ignominy had been nibbled up by time. I had his attention despite his determination to remain indifferent. Family is critically important to all but a handful of us. Sugriva continues in the produce business, although his desire to escape your reputation led him first to move to Ayodak, then to Jaikur, when the protector decided she wanted the city repopulated. He felt everyone would be strangers there, and he could create a more favorable past for himself. Both captives noted my unfortunate use of Jekur, which did not give them anything they could use, but which did tell them I was not Taglian. No Taglian would call that city anything but Dejagore. I continued. Aridatha grew into a fine young man, well-formed and beautiful. He's a soldier now, a senior non-commissioned officer in one of the city battalions. His rise has been rapid. He has been noticed. There's a good chance he'll be chosen to become one of the career-commissioned officers the great general had been imposing on the army. I 
fell silent. No one else spoke. Some were hearing this for the first time, though Sarah and I had started looking for those people a long time ago. I got up and went out, got myself a large cup of tea. I cannot abide the Nyongbo tea-making ceremonies. I am, of course, a barbarian in their eyes. I do not like the tiny little cups they use, either. When I have some tea, I want to get serious about it, make it strong and bitter, and toss in a glob of honey. I seated myself in front of Narion again. No one had spoken in my absence. So, living saint of the stranglers, have you truly put aside all the chains of the earth? Would you like to see your Kaditya again? She was little when you left. Would you like to see your grandchildren? There are five of them. I can say the word, and inside a week we can have one of them here. I sipped tea, looked Singh in the eye, and let his imagination toy with the possibilities. But you are going to be all right, Narayan. I'm going to see to that personally. I showed him my Vajra the Naga smile. Will somebody show these two to their guest rooms? That all you're going to do? Goblin asked once they were gone. I'm going to let Singh think about the life he never lived. I'll let him think about losing what's left of that, and about losing his messiah. When he can avoid all those tragedies, just by telling us where to find the souvenir he carried away from Soulcatcher's hideout, down by Kia Lune. He won't take a deep breath without getting permission from the girl. We'll see how he handles having to make his own decisions. If he stalls too long and we get pressed, you can put a glamour on me that'll make him think I'm her. What about her? One eye asked. You going to personally work on her too? Yes. Starting right now. Put some of those choke spells on her, one on each wrist and ankle, and double them up around her neck. He had done some herding, among other things, over the years, and one eye and goblin, being incredibly lazy, had developed choke spells that constricted tighter and tighter as an animal moved farther away from a selected marker point. She's a resourceful woman, with a goddess on her side. I prefer to kill her and be done with it, but we won't get any help from Singh if we do. If she does manage to escape, I want complete success to be fatal. I want near success to render her unconscious from lack of air. I don't want her having regular contact with any of our people. Remember what her aunt, Soulcatcher, did to Willow Swan. Tobo, has Swan said anything that might interest us? He just plays cards, Sleepy. He does talk all the time, but he never says anything. Kind of like Uncle One-Eye. Whisper. You put him up to that, didn't you, frog face? Sounds like swan to me, I said. I shut my eyes, began massaging my brow between thumb and forefinger, trying to make Vajra the Naga go away. His reptilian lack of connection was seductive. I'm so tired... Then why the hell don't we all just retire? One eye croaked. For a whole goddamn generation, it was the captain and his next year in Katavar shit that beat us into the ground. Now it's you two women and your holy crusade to resurrect the captured. Find yourself a guy, little girl. Spend a year screwing his brains out. We're not going to get those people out of there. Except that. Start believing that they're dead. He sounded exactly like the traitor in my soul that whispered in my mind every night before I fell asleep. The part about accepting that the captured were never going to be coming back, anyway. I asked Sarah. Can we call up our favorite dead man? One Eye. Ask him what he thinks of our plan. Bah! Frog face. You deal with us. I need a little medicinal pick-me-up. Almost smiling despite her aching joints, Goda waddled out behind one eye. 
we would not see those two for a while. If we were lucky, one eye would get drunk fast and pass out. If we were not, he would come staggering out looking to feud with Goblin, and we would have to restrain him. That could turn into an adventure. Well, here's our prodigal. Sara finally had Mergen back in the mist box. I told him, Tell me about the white crow. Puzzled. I go there sometimes. It's not voluntary. We took Narayan Singh and the Daughter of Night out of Chorbagan today. There was a white crow there. You weren't here. I wasn't there. More puzzled, even troubled. I don't remember being there. I think Soulcatcher noticed it, and she knows her crows, Mergen continued. I wasn't there, but I remember things that happened. This can't be happening to me again. Just calm down. Tell us what you know. Mergen proceeded to report everything Soulcatcher said and did after she ducked our snipers. He would not tell us how he knew. I do not think he could. Sara said, She does know that we have Singh and the girl. But did she guess why? The company has an old grudge with those two. She'll need to see bodies to be convinced there was nothing more to it than that. She's still not completely satisfied that Swan is dead. A very suspicious woman to protect her. A Narayan corpse would be easy, if we could make it credible. There are a million skinny, filthy little old men with green teeth out there. But we'd sure come up short on beautiful twenty-year-old women with blue eyes and skin paler than ivory. The greys will definitely become more active now, Sarah said. Whatever she suspects or doesn't, the Protector wants no one going about any tricky business in her city. A point the Radisha might argue, which reminds me of something that's been knocking around the back of my head. Listen to this and tell me what you think. Chapter 21 As the Bodhi disciples made their way through the crowds, more than one onlooker reached out to slap their backs. The disciples took that with poor grace. It told them that many of the witnesses were there to be entertained. The rite proceeded as before, but more quickly, as it was evident that the greys anticipated trouble and had instructions to head it off. The kneeling priest in orange burst into flames just as the greys began manhandling his assistants out of the way. A gout of smoke leaped upward. A black company skull formed inside it, an evil eye seeming to stare deep into the souls of all the witnesses. A voice filled the morning. All their days are numbered. And the wooden curtain wall shielding the reconstruction came to life, glowing lime characters as tall as a man proclaimed, Water sleeps, and my brother unforgiven. They crawled slowly back and forth. Soulcatcher herself materialized on the ramparts overhead. Her rage was palpable. A second and larger cloud of smoke burst off the burning disciple. A face, the best representation of the captains that one eye and goblin could manage, told the awed and silent thousands, Raja Dharma, the duty of kings, know you. Kingship is a trust. The king is the most exalted and conscientious servant of the people. I began to slide away from there. This was sure to sting the protector into some impulsive and self-defeating response. Or maybe not. She did nothing obvious. Though a sudden breeze came along, it blew the smoke away. But it fanned the flames consuming the Bodhi disciple. The smell of burning flesh spread out downwind. Chapter 22 When Master Centauraxita wanted to know why I was late, I told the truth. Another Bodhi disciple set himself on fire in front of the palace. I went to watch. I couldn't help myself. 
there was sorcery involved. I described what I had seen, as so many of the actual eyewitnesses also had, since Araxita seemed both repelled and intrigued. What do you suppose those disciples are doing that, Durabi? I knew why they were doing it. It took no genius to fathom their motives. Only their determination remained a puzzle. They're trying to tell the Radisha that she's not fulfilling her obligations to the Taglian people. They consider the situation so desperate that they've chosen to send their message by a means that can't be ignored. I, too, believe that to be the case. The question remains, what can the Radisha do? The protector won't go away just because some people believe she's bad for Taglios. I have a great deal to do today, Shri, and I'm starting late. Go, go. I must assemble the Badralok. It's possible we can present the Radisha with some means of shaking the protector's grip. Good luck, Shri. He would need it. Only the most outrageous good luck since the beginning of time was going to give him and his cronies the tools to undo Soul Catcher. Chances were good the Badralok had no idea how dangerous an opponent they had chosen. I dusted and mopped and checked the rodent traps, and after a while noticed that most everyone had gone away. I asked old Baladitya, the copyist, where everyone was. He told me that the other copyists had ducked out as soon as the senior librarians had gone off to their Badralok meeting. They knew that the Badralok would do nothing, but it would take them hours of grumbling and talking and arguing to get it done, so they made themselves a holiday. It was not an opportunity to be refused. I began examining books, even going so far as to penetrate the restricted stacks. Baladitya knew nothing. He could not see three feet in front of his face. Chapter 23 Jal Barandandi partnered Min Subradil with a young woman named Rahini and sent them to work in the Radish's own quarters under the direction of a woman named Narita, a fat, ugly creature possessed by an inflated conception of her own importance. Narita complained to Barandandi, I need six more women. I'm supposed to clean the council chamber again after I complete the royal suite. Then I suggest you pick up a broom yourself. I'll be back in a few hours. I expect to see progress. I've given you the best workers available. Barundandi went elsewhere to be unpleasant to someone else. The fat woman took it out on Subradil and Rahini. Subradil did not know who Narita was. The woman had not worked in the royal chambers before. As Subradil steered a mop around, she whispered, Who is this woman who is so bitter? She stroked her gangisha. Rahini glanced right and left, but did not raise her eyes. You must understand her. She is Barundandi's wife. You too! You aren't being paid to gossip! Pardon, ma'am, Sarah said. I didn't understand what to do and didn't want to trouble you. The fat woman scowled for a moment, but then turned her displeasure in another direction. Rahini smiled softly, whispered, She's in a good mood today. As the hours passed and her knees and hands and muscles began to ache, Sarah realized that she and Rahini had been delivered to Barundandi's wife more for who they were than for work they could do. They were not bright, and they were not among the more attractive workers. Barundandi wanted Narita to believe that these were the kind of women he always employed. Elsewhere, no doubt, he and his chief assistants would take full advantage of their bit of power over the unfortunate and the desperate. It was not a good day for exploring. There was more work than three women could possibly complete. Sarah got no chance to collect additional pages from the hidden annals. Then, not many hours after the day started, conditions within the palace became much less relaxed. The high and the mighty began to show themselves moving rapidly here and there. Rumor came apparently passing right through stone walls. 
Another Bodhi disciple had burned himself to death outside, and the Radisha was completely distraught. Narita herself confided, She's very frightened. Many things are happening over which she has no control. She has gone to the anger chamber. She does so almost every day now. The anger chamber, Sarah murmured. She had not heard of this before. But till recently, she never worked this close to the heart of the palace. What is that, ma'am? A room set aside where she can tear her hair and clothing and rage and weep without having her emotions poison surroundings used for other purposes. She won't come out until she can face the world in complete calm. Subredil understood. It was a goony thing. Only goony would come up with an idea like that. Goony religion personified everything. It had a god or goddess or demon, a diva or rakshasa or yaksha or whatever for everything, usually with several aspects and avatars and differing names, none of whom were seen much nowadays, but who had been very busy way back when. Only an extremely wealthy goonie would come up with a conceit like an anger chamber, a goonie cursed with a thousand rooms she did not know how to use. Later in the day, Subradil contrived to be allowed to service the freshly evacuated anger chamber, it was small and contained nothing but a mat on a polished wooden floor and a small shrine to ancestors. The smoke was thick and the smell of incense was overpowering. Chapter 24 A good thing I didn't have any pages on me, too, Sarah told me. The greys started searching us going out. That woman, Vancha, tried to steal a little silver oil lamp. She'll spend all morning tomorrow being punished by Jal Barandandi. Does Barandandi's boss know what he does? I don't think so. Why? We could trick him into betraying himself, get him tossed out. No. Barandandi is the devil we know. An honest man would be harder to manipulate. I loathe the man. That's because he's loathsome not unlike other men in similar positions of petty power. But we're not here to reform Taglio, Sleepy. We're here to find out how to release the captured and to torment our enemies when doing that doesn't jeopardize our primary mission. And we did a great job of that today. The Radisha was crushed by our messages. Sarah told me what she had discovered. Then I told her about my own small triumph. I got into the restricted stacks today and I found what I think might be the original of one of the annals we've got hidden in the palace. It's in terrible shape, but it's all there and it's still readable. And there may be more volumes. I only got through part of the restricted stack before I had to go help Baladitya find his slippers so his grandson could lead him home. I had the book right there on the table. I patted it proudly. Sara asked, Won't it be missed? I hope not. I replaced it with one of the moldy discards I've been saving. Sarah squeezed my hand. Good, good. Things have gone well lately. Tobo, will you find the goblin? I have an idea to run past him. I said, I'll see how our guests are doing. Somebody might be ready to whisper confidences in my ear but only Swan wanted my ear, and he did not have confidences in mind. In his way, he was as incorrigible as one eye, yet he had a style that did not offend me. I do not think Swan had an evil bone in him. Like so many people, he was a victim of circumstance, struggling to keep his head up in the turbulence of the river of events. Uncle Doge was displeased with his circumstances, even though he was not a prisoner. We can certainly get along without that book, I told him. I doubt that I could read it anyway. Mostly I want to make sure it doesn't get back to the deceivers. What we really need is your knowledge. Doge was a stubborn old man. He was not yet ready to make deals or to look for allies. 
Before I left, I asked, Will it all die with you? Will you be the last Nguyen Bo to follow the path? Tai Dei can't if he's buried under the glittering plain. I winked. I understood Doge better than he thought. His problem was not a conflict with his morality. It was a matter of control. He wanted to do everything his way, no strings. He would come around if I kept reminding him of his morality and his lack of a son or an apprentice. Nguyen Bo are famous for their stubbornness, but even they will not sacrifice all their hopes and dreams rather than adjust. I visited Narayan just long enough to offer a reminder that our interest did not lie in harming him. But the other reason we had for keeping the Daughter of Night healthy was our hope of his cooperation. You can be stubborn for a while yet. We have several tasks to wrap up before you become our main interest, and we concentrate on murdering your dreams. That was my whole focus with each of our prisoners. Make them put their hopes and dreams on the line. Maybe I could weasel my way into history as famous or infamous as Soul Catcher and Widowmaker, as Storm Shadow and Long Shadow, remembered forever as the Dream Killer. I had a vision of myself drifting through the night like Mergen, disembodied but dragging along a bottomless bag of black night into which I stuffed all the dreams I stole from restless sleepers. I was a real old-time Rakshasa there. The Daughter of Night did not look up when I went to view her. She was in a cage Bondo Trang used for keeping large animals of the deadliest sort. Sometimes leopards, but mostly tigers. A fully grown male tiger was worth a fortune in the apothecary market. She was shackled as well. The cats never were. In addition, I believe a little opium and nightshade were used to season her food. Nobody wanted to underestimate her potential. Her family had a dire history, and she had a goddess on her shoulder. Reason told me to kill her right now, before Kina wakened as much as she could. That would buy me the rest of my lifetime free of the end of the world. It would take the dark goddess generations to create another daughter of night. Reason also told me that if the girl died, the captured would spend the rest of time in those caverns under the glittering plain. Reason told me, after a moment watching her, that she was not just ignoring me. She did not know I was there. Her mind was elsewhere, which was not a comfortable feeling at all. If Kina could turn her loose the way Mergen was loose... Chapter 25 Master Santaraxita paused to tell me, It was good of you to care for Baladitya yesterday, Dorabi. I had forgotten him in my eagerness to assemble the Badralok. But you should be careful or his grandson will begin expecting you to walk the old man home for him. He tried it with me. I did not look into his eyes, though I did want to see what was there. There was a tightness in his voice that told me he had something on his mind. But I had taken too many liberties with Doraby already. He would not stare into the eyes of the priestly caste. I but did the right thing, master. Are we not taught to respect and aid our elders? If we do not when we are young, who will respect and aid us when we ourselves become frail? Indeed, nevertheless... You continue to amaze and intrigue me, Dora B. Uncomfortable. I tried to change the subject by inquiring. Was the meeting of the Badralok productive, master? Centaraxita frowned, then smiled. You are very subtle, Dora B. No, of course not. We're the Badralok. We talk, we don't act. For a moment, he mocked his own kind. We'll still be debating what form our resistance should take when the protector perishes of old age. Is it true what they say, master? That she's four hundred years old, yet fresh as a bride? I did not need to know. 
I just needed conversation to nurture Santaraxita's surprising interest in me. That seems to be the common belief, handed down from the northern mercenaries and those travelers the Radisha adopted. She must be a great sorceress indeed, then. Do I detect a note of jealousy? Would we all not like to live forever? He looked at me oddly. But we shall, Durabi. This life is only a stage. Wrong thing to say, Durabi Day. I meant in this world. I find myself largely content to remain Durabi Day Banerjai. Centaraxita frowned slightly, but let it go. How are your studies coming? Wonderfully, Master. I'm especially fond of the historical texts. I'm discovering so many interesting facts. Excellent. Excellent. If there's anything I can do to help. I asked, Is there a written young Bo language? Or was there ever? That took him from the blind side. Nyueg Bo? I don't know. Why in the world would you... Something I've seen a few times near where I live. Nobody knows what it means. The Nyueg Bo down there won't talk. But I never heard of them being literate. He rested a hand on my shoulder for a moment. I'll find out for you. His fingers seemed to be trembling. He murmured something unintelligible and hurried away. Chapter 26 Word was in that the Bodhi disciples were not happy with us for stealing their thunder at the palace gate. I wondered what they would think when the news arrived about our behavior at Semki. That seemed to be coming together perfectly for us, unless Soulcatcher was thinking farther ahead than we could detect. Mergen had Slink's party well on the way to the village, and moving faster than the group the Protector had sent to destroy the Bodhi tree. That group outnumbered our brothers, but did not expect any resistance. In a few days, it would turn really nasty down there. As the weather had here, storm season had arrived. I had been delayed coming home by a ferocious thunderstorm that flooded some streets and sent down hail an inch in diameter. The Kangali and other children went out and tried to gather up the ice, barking in pain every time a hailstone found unprotected skin. For a short while, the air was almost tolerably cool. But then the storm moved on, and the heat returned worse than it had been before. The stench of the city welled up. One storm was not enough to sluice it clean, only to turn everything over. In a few days, the insects would be more miserable than ever before. I hugged my burden and told myself I would not have to stay in this cesspool much longer. One more to locate, and I'll have everything I need from the library. My new acquisition lay open for public viewing. Of course, no one could read it, not even me. But I was confident that I now possessed another original of the three missing annals. Perhaps the very first, since it was so alien. The other seemed to be inscribed in the same alphabet, much modified and somewhat like that used in the discarded volume I had rescued. If the language was the same, I would be able to figure it out eventually. One Eye cackled. Yeah, everything but somebody to translate that stuff for you. Everything but your new boyfriend. He insisted that Master Centaraxita was out to seduce me, and that Centaraxita would be broken-hearted if he succeeded and discovered that I was female. That's enough of that, you filthy old thing. Sacrifice for the cause, little girl. He started to offer some graphic advice. He had been drinking again, or was drinking still. Sara arrived. She tossed a large bundle of pages my way. Can it, one eye. Find the goblin. There's work to do. Of me, she demanded. Why do you put up with that? He's harmless. And he's for sure too darn old to change. And if he's nagging me, he's not getting into something that's going to get us all killed. So you're sacrificing for the cause. Something like that. That was quick. Goblin had arrived. 
What happened to one eye? Taking a leak. What do I have to do now? Sarah said, I can get into the anger chamber. The rest is up to you. You do this and you'll never be able to get back into the palace. You know that, don't you? What are we talking about? I asked. Sarah said, I think we can kidnap the Radisha. With a little luck and a lot of help from Goblin and One-Eye. Goblin's right. You do that, we'd all better be a hundred miles away by the time the word gets out. I have a better idea. If we have to give away the fact that we can get inside the palace, do it by sabotaging Soul Catcher. Get to one of her carpets. Rig it to come apart under her when she's two hundred feet up and moving fast. I like the way you think, Sleepy. Put that on the list, Sarah. I want to be there. It'd be like the time the Howler flew into the side of the tower at Charm. Man, he must have been going at least three times as fast as a horse could run when he hit that wall. Blow! Hair, teeth, and eyeballs all over the... He walked away from that, you idiot. One eye was back. He's out there under the plane with our guys right now. A unique odor suggested that one eye had taken a moment out to award himself some medicinal refreshment. Stop it now. Sarah was cranky tonight. Our next step will be to neutralize Chandra Gokale. We've already decided that. These other things we can worry about down the road. I observed, we'll need to freshen up our evacuation drill in case we need to get out of Taglios in a hurry. The more active we get, the more likely it becomes that something will go wrong. If it does, we'll have Soul Catcher breathing down our necks. Goblin observed, she isn't stupid, she's just lazy. I asked Sarah, did she call in her shadows yet? I don't know. I didn't hear anything. Goblin grumbled, what we really need is a formula for doing without sleep. For about a year. Let me see Mean Subradil's Gangisha. Sara sent Tobo to fetch the statue. The boy could be much less unpleasant when he was in a group. Silence struck as Bondo Trang rolled in, pushed by one of his own people. He smiled at a private joke. He enjoyed startling us. One of my men tells me that we have a couple of outsiders caught in the confusion net. They appear to be harmless, an old man and a mute. Somebody will have to get them out and send them on their way without making them suspicious. That news gave me a little chill, but I did not suspect the truth till poor overworked Tobo and Goblin, the latter going along but staying out of sight while the boy led the intruders to safety, returned and Goblin reported, I think your boyfriend followed you home, Sleepy. What? There's this terrified old man who tried to impress Tobo with the fact that he was a librarian. A lot of Taglians would have been impressed. The ability to read was almost a sorcery in itself. He called his sidekick a do. You told us, one eye began to howl. The little girl's a regular heartbreaker. Damn. I'd give anything to be there when that old fool slides his hand into our pants and don't find what he's looking for. I was embarrassed. I do not think I have been embarrassed about anything since the first time my Uncle Rafi slipped his hand under my sari and did find what he was after. That darned fool sent a Raxita. Why did he have to go complicating things like this? That's enough of that, Sarah snapped. There's supposed to be a meeting of the Privy Council tomorrow. I think we can use it to get Gokale. But I'll need to take Sawa and Shikandini. Why? I asked. I had no desire to go back inside the palace ever again. That's great, one eye enthused. You don't show at the library tomorrow. That old goat is going to pain and whine and wonder what happened. If it's all his fault even though he knows there's no way you could know he tried to follow you home. You'll have your hook set, little girl. All you have to do is pull him in. Sarah snapped. 
I said, wait a minute. He may have a point. Suppose I do play Santaraxita's game to the point where I get him to do my translations for me. We could even add him to our collection. I don't think he has much family. Why don't we take a closer look? See how long it might be before people wondered why he was missing. Oh, you're wicked, little girl, one eye said. You're really wicked. You could find out someday you keep riding me. About the Gokale? Sarah asked. All right. Why are we taking me and Tobo both? Tobo to put an idea into his head so he gets an itch he's going to have to go scratch. You to cover us, just in case. I'll have Tobo carry his flute. Tobo's flute was a small version of the fire-projecting bamboo. He can turn it over to you once we're inside. Tobo had carried that flute every time he had accompanied his mother into the palace. We try to think ahead. Also, I want to keep you fresh in Jal Barundandi's mind. I'll definitely have to have you along when I snatch the radisha. Goblin, what can you do with my gangisha? No one else on earth would have dared hand the little wizard a straight line like that. But Sarah was Sarah. She did not have to pay the price. I started to leave. I had other things to do. Tobo asked, Is it all right if I show your annals to Mergen? He wants to read them. You two starting to get along now? I think so. Good. You can let him see them. Tell him not to be too critical. If he is, I won't come out there and dig him up. Chapter 27 Narayan seemed thoroughly puzzled by my continued interest. I do not believe he remembered me at all. But he now knew that I was female and had been the young man sleepy that he had encountered only rarely ages ago. You've had time to reflect. Have you decided to help us yet? He looked at me with pure venom, yet without obvious personal hatred. I was just a particularly unpleasant obstacle delaying the inevitable triumph of his goddess. He had gotten his mind back into a rut. All right. I'll see you again tomorrow night. Your son, Aridatha, has a leave day coming up. We'll bring him around to visit you. There was a guard watching the Daughter of Night. What are you doing here, Kendo? Keeping an eye on... Go away! And don't come back! And spread the word. Nobody guards the Daughter of Night. She's too dangerous. Nobody even goes near her unless Sarah or I tell them to. And then they don't do it alone. She don't look. She wouldn't, would she? Start hiking. I went to the cage. How long would it take for your goddess to create all the right conditions for the birth of another like you? If I decide to kill you? The girl's gaze rose slowly. I wanted to cringe away from the power in her eyes, but I held on. Maybe she should be getting even more opium than she was already. Reflect upon your value, and upon my power to destroy it. I felt puffed up. That was the kind of thing the divas or lesser gods blathered at one another on the fringes of the epics spun by the professional storytellers. She glared. There was so much power in her eyes that I decided Kendo ought to spend a little time in private with Goblin and One-Eye, making sure he had not been taken in already. I think that without you, there never will be a year of the skulls. And I know that you're still alive only because I want something from Narian, who loves you like a father. Singh was her father, for all practical purposes. Croker had been denied the chance by cruel fortune. Or, more accurately, by the will of Kina. Keep well, dear. I left. I had a lot of reading to get done. 
and some writing if I got the chance. My days were always full, and all too often they got confused. I decided to do things, then forgot. I told others to do things, then forgot that too. I was beginning to look forward to the time when our success or sufficiently spectacular failures forced us out of town. I could sneak off somewhere where nobody knew me and just loaf for a few months. Or for the rest of my life, if I wanted. I had no trouble understanding why every year a few more of our brothers gave up and faded away. I only hoped a little notoriety would bring them back. I studied the pages Sarah had brought out for me, but the translation was difficult. The subject matter was uninspiring, and I was tired. I kept losing my concentration. I thought about Master Santaraxita. I thought about going back up to the palace, armed. I thought about what Soul Catcher would do, now that she knew she did not have us trapped inside the thieves' garden. I thought about getting old and being alone, and had a suspicion that that fear might have something to do with why some brothers remained with the company no matter what. They had no other family. I have no other family. I will not look back. I am not weak. I will not relax my self-control. I will persevere. I will triumph over myself and will conquer all adversity. I fell asleep rereading my own recollections of what Mergen had reported about the company's adventure on the glittering plain. I dreamed about the creatures he had encountered there. Were they the Rakshasas and Nagas of myth? Did they have anything to do with the shadows? Or with the men who evidently created the shadows from hapless prisoners of war? Chapter 28 I have a bad feeling about this, I told Sarah, as she and Tobo and I started the long walk. You're sure the shadows are off the streets? Quit fussing, Sleepy. You're turning into an old woman. The streets are safe. The only monsters out here are human. We can handle those. You'll be safe in the palace. If you just stick to your character, Tobo will be safe as long as he remembers that he's not really Shikandini and desperate for his mother to keep her job. It's in the nature of men like Jal Barundandi that they do their bullying inside your head, not physically. They'll take no for an answer, and I won't lose my job over it. My work is being noticed by others, especially by Barundandi's wife. Now, get yourself into character. Tobo, you too. You particularly. I know Sleepy can do this when she concentrates on it. Tobo was clad as a budding young woman, Mean Subridil's daughter, and I hoped we could get him back inside the warehouse unnoticed by Goblin and One-Eye, because they would ride him mercilessly. With the investment of a little artifice on his mother's part, Tobo made a very attractive young woman. Jol Barundandi thought so, too. Mean Subridil was the first worker called forward, and Barundandi never bothered with his customary grumble about taking Sawa as part of the package. Sawa had trouble keeping a straight face later when we found Barundandi's wife, Narita, waiting to pick women to work for her. One glance at Shiki was enough. Min Subridil's family definitely belonged under her direct supervision. Min Subridil had done a good job of ingratiating herself with Narita. For the very good reason that Narita was in charge of cleaning those parts of the palace of most immediate interest to us. Sawa had not worked for Narita in the past. Subridil explained Sawa to Narita, who seemed more patient than she had the few times I had seen her before. Narita said, I understand. There's plenty of simple things that need doing. The Radisha was particularly restless last night. These days, when she has trouble sleeping, she breaks things and makes messes. The woman actually sounded sympathetic but the Taglian people loved their ruling family and seemed to feel that they deserved more room than the man on the street. Perhaps because of the burdens they bore, always in the past with maximum respect for Rajadharma. Subradil maneuvered me into a spot whence I could observe well without being noticed. She and Narita brought me several brass treasures that needed cleaning. The ruling family had to be very fond of brass. Sawa cleaned tons of it. 
but Sawa could be trusted not to damage anything. Shiki came to me and asked, Will you take care of my flute for me, Aunt Sawa? I took the instrument, studied it briefly, pasted on an idiot grin, and tooted on the thing a few times, just so everybody would know it was a real flute and not imagine that it might be a small fireball thrower, capable of making life both brief and painful for the first half-dozen people who got too close to a flautist in a bad temper. Barandandi's wife asked Shiki, You play the flute? Yes, ma'am, but not very well. I was quite a skilled player when I was a girl. She noticed her husband peeking in for the second time this morning and began to suspect he was interested in more than just the progress of the day's work. So, Bradil, I don't think it's wise for you to bring your daughter here. And a moment later, she growled, I'll be back in a minute. I have to talk to that man. I have to straighten him out. The moment she stepped out, Mean Subradil moved with startling rapidity. She vanished into Radish's anger chamber. I had to admire her. Her mind never seemed clearer than when she was in a dangerous position. I suspected she actually enjoyed her role as a palace menial, and the more dangerous the times, the more effective she seemed. Despite a massive workload and Narita's frequent trips away to sabotage her husband's efforts to weasel in close to Shikandini or to draft Shiki into a different working group in mid-afternoon, we left the Radish's personal suite for the gloomy chambers where the Privy Council assembled. There was a rumor that the Bodhi disciples were about to send another suicidal goof to the gateway. The Radisha wanted to forestall that somehow. We were supposed to get the place ready for a council session. The Bodhi rumor had had its birth in the mind of Kai Sara. It was supposed to be the device by which we could bring Shikandini face to face with Chandra Gokale. We had almost two hours before the staffers appeared. The quiet little men who wrote everything down. Then the Purohita arrived, accompanied by the ecclesiastical members of the Privy Council. The Purohita did not deign to note our existence, even though Shiki mistook him for Gokale and batted her eyes, till Subradil signed her off. I could hear the excuse that would come later. All old men looked alike. Neither Arjuna Drupada nor Chandra Gokale considered themselves old. We continued our work, ignored, the folk of the palace, particularly the inner circle, were lucky we had other things we wanted to do with our lives. Had we not cared about our own survival, we could have slaughtered scores of them. But getting rid of the Purohita would not mean much in the grand scheme. The senior priests would replace him with another old man just as nasty and narrow of mind before Drupada's bones got cold. Chandra Gokale came in, and he did not overlook the help. Sarah must have gleaned a few suggestions from Willow Swan about what the old pervert liked, because he stopped dead, staring at Shikandini, like somebody had clubbed him between the eyes. Shiki had the roll down perfectly. She was a shy virgin and a flirt at the same time, as though her maidenly heart had been smitten instantly. God apparently fashioned men so that they would swallow that sort of bait nine times out of ten. Barundandi's timing was good. He came to move us out of the meeting chamber, just as the protector swooped in like some dark, angry eagle. Gokale watched our departure with moon eyes before we completed our evacuation. He was whispering to one of his scribes. Jal Barundandi unfortunately had a sharp eye for some things. Me and Subredil, I believe your daughter has charmed the inspector general of the records. Subradil appeared surprised. Sir? No, that can't be. I won't let my child stumble into the trap that destroyed my mother and condemned me to this cruel life. Sawa caught Subradil's arm. Apparently, she had become frightened by that intense outburst. But in reality, she squeezed, warning Subradil not to say anything that Barundandi might remember if Chandragokale disappeared. We might want to consider a change of plan. 
We did not want anyone to have any reason to connect anything outside with any of us. Superdeal's outburst faded. She became embarrassed and anxious to be elsewhere. Shiki, come on. I was ready to kick Shikandini's bottom myself. She was being a positive slut. But she did respond to her mother's command. Sawa sort of settled down out of the way with the last of her dirty brass in hopes of being overlooked while the Privy Council convened. But Jal Barundandi was alert. Me and Subradil, bring her sister-in-law. He tried to flirt with Shikandini. He got a look of disgust for his trouble. Me and Subradil got me going. Then went after her daughter. What did you think you were doing in there? I was just having fun. The man is a disgusting old pervert. Softly, as though not meant for Baron Dandy's ears while the words really were, Subradil said, Don't ever have fun like that again. Men like that will do whatever they like with you, and there isn't anything anybody can do about it. That warning was not all acting. The last thing we needed was one of the mighty dragging Shikandini into a dark corner to do a little groping. That was not supposed to happen. It was unthinkable, supposedly. And for ordinary people, that was mostly true. But not so at a level where men began to believe that they existed outside the usual rules. Narita, Barundandi called. Where have you gotten to? That damned woman. She's slipped off to the kitchen again. Or she's gone somewhere to sneak a nap. I heard the radisha behind us in the meeting chamber, but could not make out individual words. An angry voice responded. That had to be Soul Catcher. I wanted to be somewhere a little farther away. I started moving. Sawa, of course, did things others did not always understand. Subradil grabbed hold and started to fuss. Barundandi told her, Take this bunch to the kitchen. Get something to eat. If Narita is there... Tell her I want her. The moment he was out of sight, I announced, Sawa is going to wander off. Sawa was not completely happy with the pages Subradil kept bringing sleepy. Subradil could not read them, worked in a rush, and seemed incapable of collecting anything interesting. I hoped I remembered the way. Even when you wear the yarn bracelet, the palace is a confusing place and I had not roamed it since the days when the captain was the liberator and a great hero of the Taglian people. And even then, I had been only an occasional visitor. As soon as I began to feel unsure, I got out a small piece of chalk and began to leave tiny marks in the Sengal alphabet. I had managed to learn a little of that language during our years in the far south, but it had been a struggle. I hoped anyone who discovered the marks would not recognize what they were. I did find the room where the old books were hidden. It was obvious that someone came there often. The dust was disturbed badly, which, in itself, would raise questions if discovered. I tried to drag out the book that looked the oldest. Darn, that thing was heavy. Once I got it open, I found that the pages were real stubborn about tearing. They were not paper at all, which never has been very common. I could tear them only one at a time. Which maybe explained why Subradil just grabbed whatever came easiest. She would not have time to pick and choose. I worried that I had been away too long myself, convinced that Barundandi or his wife must have noticed that I was missing. I hoped it did not occur to them to wonder why Subradil was not making a scene because she had lost track of me. Even so, I continued to tear pages until I had all I thought the three of us could carry away. I hid everything in an unusual room, not far from the service postern, uncertain how we would recover it heading out. Then took myself way down inside Sawa, almost to the point of incapacitating confusion. They found me dirty and tear-stained, and still trying to find the way back to the meeting chamber. They, being some of the other day workers... In moments, I was reunited with Subradil and Shikandini. 
I clung to my sister-in-law like a wood chip desperate to shed the embrace of a rushing flood. Jal Barundandi was not happy. Min Subredin, I accepted this woman here for your sake, out of kindness and charity. But lapses of this sort are not acceptable. No work got done while we were searching. His voice trailed off. The Radisha and the Protector were headed our way, following a most unusual route. This was backstairs country, which meant nothing whatsoever to Soul Catcher, of course. That woman had no sense of class or caste. There was the Protector, and beneath the Protector there was everyone else. Sawa just sort of folded up and squatted with her face in her lap. Subradil and Shikandini and Jal Barundandi partially tried to get out of the way, partially gawked. Shiki had not seen either woman before. Sawa crossed her fingers out of sight in her lap. Subradil whispered prayers to Gangesha. Jal Barundandi shivered in terror. Shikandini stared with a teen's inability to feel appropriate fear. The Radisha paid us no heed. She stamped past, talking about ripping the guts out of Bodhi disciples. Her voice contained almost no emotional conviction. The protector, though, slowed down and considered us all intently. For an instant, I found myself almost overcome by the dread that she really could read minds. Then she went on, and Jal Barundandi ran along behind, forgetting us and Narita both because the Radisha barked some command back his way. Sawa rose and whimpered. I want to go home. Subradil agreed that it was enough of a day. Neither the greys nor the royal guards were searching anyone. A good thing, too. I carried so much paper in my small clothes, I could fake a normal walk for only a few dozen yards. Chapter 29 I got through my part of the evening meeting quickly and ran off to my own little corner so I could compare my newly acquired pages with those of the book I had stolen from the library that I thought was an exact copy, if not the genuine original, of the true first volume of the Annals of the Black Company. I was so cheerful I am sure one eye must have had great fun talking about me behind my back. It did not occur to me to stick around to see how our temptation of Chandra Gokhale played out. The story I got later was, Gokhale had a man try to follow Shiki home. When that man did not report back within a reasonable time, on account of he ran into Runmust and Iqbal Singh, someplace he should not have been, and ended up taking a long swim downriver. Gokhale headed for the joy house that specialized in serving him, his associates, and those who shared their select but hardly rare tastes and pleasure. River Walker and several other brothers picked him up when he left the palace. He was accompanied by two companions who would regret their wishes to ingratiate themselves with the inspector general by joining him in an evening of indulgence. Mergen followed events closely, too. Knowing that he would do so, I felt at ease snuggling up with my new acquisitions. It took me over an hour to conclude that what I had brought out today was indeed a later version of the first ever annal, and most of another hour to realize that I would not be able to winkle out the book's secrets without skilled help, or a lot more time than I had. Chandra Gokhale apparently died in that joy house. Likewise, his two companions. There were witnesses. People saw them strangled. Then a red rumel got left behind in the killer's haste to get away. The greys arrived almost immediately. They loaded the corpses into a cart, saying the protector wanted Gokhale's back in the palace instantly. But the greys stopped being greys moments after they left the pleasure house. Their course led them toward the river rather than toward the palace. The extra bodies vanished into the flood. A white crow dozing on a rooftop wakened when they started downhill. It stretched and followed them. Chapter 30 Mergen was there when Soulcatcher received the news. The report reached the palace in a remarkably short time and was unusually complete. The greys worked hard to please their mistress. The party bringing Gokhale to the warehouse had not yet arrived. 
Mergen had been asked to look around the protector's quarters while he was there. We knew nothing about them. Nobody ever went into her suite, not since Willow Swan had gone to his reward. Mergen would have to be questioned about how she lived in private. Soulcatcher did not retreat there, however. She went out looking for the Radisha right away. The Radisha knew something had happened to Gokale, but she had not had detailed reports. The women settled in the receiving chamber of the Radisha's austere suite. Soulcatcher told what she knew. She used a very businesslike voice. It was said sometimes that the protector was her most dangerous and least stable when she stopped being capricious and seemed calmest and most serious. It seems the Inspector General shared some habits with Peril Koji. In fact, I'm now assured that his particular weakness was common amongst the senior men of his ministry. There were rumors. And you did nothing? Chandra Gokhale's private amusements, loathsome as I found them personally, did not prevent his performing perfectly as Inspector General of the Records. He was particularly adept at generating revenue. Indeed. Soulcatcher's business-like manner wavered momentarily. Mergen would report his amusement at the thought she might actually have a moral opinion. He was attacked in the same manner as Koji was, suggesting somebody might have a grudge against the ministry as a whole, or that the deceivers pick men of his particular weakness as ceremonial targets? Deceivers didn't kill Gokhale. Of that I'm sure. This was done by the people who lured Swan out and killed him. If they killed him. If! The Radisha was startled by the implication. We saw no corpse. Note that we have no body this time either. Men disguised as our men were right there to haul the body away. That's two members of the Privy Council lost in less than a week. Organizationally, they were the most important. They made the machinery work. If the great general was anywhere nearby, I'd predict that he would be their next target. That gaggle of priests means nothing. They do nothing. They control nothing. My sister proved that if they're killed, they can be replaced by other do-nothings within minutes. Nobody can replace Swan or Gokhale. The greys are beginning to unravel already. Mergen made a mental note to mention that Willow Swan might have been less a puppet than he led the world to believe. Why couldn't it be the Stranglers? The Radisha asked. Because those people cut the head off that particular serpent the other day. She described events in the thieves' garden. Obviously, she had not bothered to share the news before. It was clear that the protector considered the princess a necessary but junior partner in her enterprise. In a matter of days, these people whom we thought ruined forever have cut the head off one enemy and have crippled the other seriously. There is a dangerous mind behind this. Not dangerous at all. Not even that lucky. But a sufficiently paranoid mind will discern patterns and threats where only fortune has conspired. Soul catcher was ever alert for evils as great as her own. We knew they couldn't remain in the darkness forever, the Radisha said. She corrected herself hastily. I knew. The captain reminded me often enough. She did not need to bring up the past and her belief in mistakes she had made. That devil was buried deep, hundreds of miles away. A much more immediate danger was right there in the room with her. The protector was a mistake she had abandoned hope of living long enough to correct. Blind to the consequences at the time, she had chosen to mount the tiger. Now her sole choice was to hang on for the rest of the ride. Soulcatcher said, We have to recall the great general. If we can get his troops into the city before our enemies make their next move, we'll have the manpower to hunt them down. You should send the orders immediately. And once the courier is safely off, we should announce that the great general is returning. Their special dislike for Mogaba should cause them to delay their other plans till they can gather him in as well. You'll think you know what they'll do. I know what I'd do, 
If I came down with the kind of sudden, burning ambition that seems to have taken them over, I wonder if there hasn't been some kind of coup or something. Exasperated, the Radisha demanded, What will they do next? I'll keep that to myself for now. Not that I don't trust you. Soulcatcher probably had abiding suspicions about herself. I just want to make sure I've identified enough of a pattern to begin tapping into the workings of this new mind. I'm quite talented at that, you know. The Radisha knew, to her own despair. She said nothing. Soulcatcher sat silently herself, as though waiting for the princess to speak. But the Radisha had nothing to say. The protector mused, I wonder who it could be. I knew the wizards of old. Neither one has the ambition or imagination or drive, even though both do have the hardness. The Radisha made a squeak of sound. The wizards? The two little men. The day and night pair. They aren't much of anything but lucky. They survived? I said they're lucky. Do you recall anyone who didn't go onto the plane who looked like a potential leader? I don't. I thought all those people were dead. As did I, in most cases. Our great general claims to have seen most of their bodies personally, but the great general identified them assuming that the two wizards had been killed first. Hmm... Here I had begun to be suspicious of him. Perhaps his only crime is that he's a fool. Can you think of anyone? Not inside the company I knew. But there was a young beau who had something to do with the standard bearer's wife, a priest of some sort. He seemed to be totally obsessed with weapons and the martial arts. I ran into him only a few times, and he's never been accounted for in any reports. A master of the path of the sword? That would explain a lot. But I killed them all when I... Have you noticed how people keep turning up alive when there's every reason to believe that they're dead? An actual smile tried to gnaw its way out of the radish's mouth. The woman talking could be considered the mother of all those whose death had been celebrated prematurely. There's sorcery afoot. Nothing should be any great surprise. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's a blade that can have more than one edge. Soulcatcher rose to leave. Her voice changed, became cruel. More than one edge. A master of the path of the sword. It's been a long time since I visited those people. They may be able to tell me something useful. She stalked out of the room. The Radisha remained motionless for several minutes, clearly troubled. Then she got up and went to her anger chamber. She settled herself there. The unseen spy went after the protector. She, he discovered, had gone directly to the ramparts. She assembled her small, single-rider carpet, all the while arguing with herself in a dozen querulous voices. He barely listened. He was too surprised and shocked. There was a white crow up there. It was watching the protector, who remained unaware of Mergen's presence. Although, historically, she had been more sensitive to him than to any of the living except her sister. But the bird had no trouble seeing Mergen. It examined him with first one eye, then with the other. Then it winked deliberately and then it launched itself into the night when the protector's rookery took flight to accompany her on her travels. But I am the white crow. The disorientation was brief, but as frightening as it had been years ago, when first Mergen had started stumbling around outside his flesh. Chapter 31 I said, Better get Uncle Doge before we go any farther with this, Tobo. I spotted Kendo Cutter and Runmust. You guys finally back? How did it go? 
Perfect. Just like you planned it. Sarah asked, You have my present? They're logging him in now. He's still out cold. Drop him right here where I can chat with him when he comes around. Sarah had a wicked gleam in her eye. I chuckled. Soulcatcher thinks we're following some grand, carefully orchestrated master plan, exquisitely fashioned by a great strategic mastermind. If she knew we were just stumbling around in the dark, hoping we stay lucky until we can open the way for the captured. One eye barked. You telling me you masterminds don't got a next step ready to go, little girl? We have several. I did. And I'm sure the next one hasn't ever occurred to Soulcatcher as being within the realm of possibility. I'm going to bring Master Centaraxi to home for supper and give him a chance to sign up for the adventure of a lifetime. <laughs> I knew it. Uncle Doge joined us. He was seriously peeved about the way he had been treated lately. I told him. One of our friends just reported a conversation between the Thousand Voices and the Radisha. The process of reasoning is beyond my imagination, but the Thousand Voices has decided that all her troubles recently are the fault of a master of the Path of the Sword who should have been killed a long time ago. When last seen, she was off to visit the folks at the Vingol Gang Temple to ask about the man. You may be familiar with that temple. Doge lost color. His sword hand trembled for an instant. His right eyelid twitched. He turned toward Sara. Sara told him, It's true. What can she learn there? Speak the tongue of the people. No. The master of the path of the sword accepted what he could not control. You would have to say he was somewhat less than gracious about it, though, if you wanted to report the whole truth. I said, You still have a book we want, and you could tell us a great deal that we could use, I think. He was a stubborn old man. He was determined not to let me stampede him into anything. I said, The Thousand Voices has sent for Mogaba. She means to have the army come dig us out. If I could... I'd like to get out of Taglios before she starts. But we have a lot to do and a lot to find out before we can go. Your help would be invaluable. As I keep reminding you, you have people under that plane too. Huh? What? Sleepy? Sara said. Goblin, see what's the matter with her? I'm all right. I I'm fine. I just had what you call an epiphany, I think. Listen. All the evidence indicates that Soulcatcher thinks the captured are dead, which would mean that she believes Longshadow is dead. We know he's not, which is why we're not worried right now. But if she doesn't know, why isn't she amazed that the world hasn't been overrun by shadows? I got a lot of blank looks for my trouble. Even from the wizards. I said... Look, what it means is, it doesn't matter if Longshadow is dead or alive after all, as long as he stays inside the Shadow Gate. There isn't a doomsday sword hanging over the world, certain to fall when the madman croaks. Somebody besides the cleverest wizards will survive. The less clever wizards caught on then. They brightened up dramatically. Not that either had ever cared much what became of the world after they staggered out of it. What to do about the Shadow Master had never been a significant issue to us because there were always more immediate obstacles to overcome before he could become a major concern. Sarah said as much. If we can't open the way, there's no point in worrying about how we can keep it closed to those not in our favor. I wonder how the Shadow Masters did it. Brute force? The Black Company was still in the far north and the lance of passion was up there with them. I stared at Uncle Doge. Others began to do so, too. I wondered aloud. Could it be that the great shame of the Nguyen Bo isn't nearly as ancient as I thought? Could it be that it just goes back a couple of generations, to about the time that the Shadow Masters appeared, practically manifesting themselves overnight? Uncle Doge closed his eyes. They stayed that way for a while. When the old priest opened them again, 
He glared at me. Come walking with me, stone soldier. Chandra Gokhale, inspector general of the records and favorer of very young girls, chose that moment to groan. I told Doge, Indulge me for a few minutes, uncle. I have a guest to entertain. I promise not to take too long. Goblin knelt beside the minister, patted his face gently, helped Gokhale to a sitting position. The inspector general began to puff up for a bluster storm. As his mouth opened, I leaned down to whisper, Water sleeps. Gokhale's head jerked around. In a moment, he recalled where he had seen me before. Goblin told him, All their days are numbered, buddy. And it looks like some of you got a few less days than some others do. Gokhale recognized him, too, though he was supposed to be dead. And when he remembered where he had seen Sara before, he began to tremble. Sara asked, Would you recall abusing Min Subridil on several occasions? Subridil certainly remembers. What I think we'll do to requite that is to return it fivefold. The brothers will install you in a tiger cage in a moment. You will be well treated otherwise. And in a few days, maybe we'll bring in the Purohita to keep you company. She chuckled so wickedly I felt a chill. For all the rest of their days, calling the heaven and the earth and the day and the night like brothers, Chandra Gokhale and Arjuna Drupada. Part of that was some Nguyenbo formula I didn't understand. But I got the point, and so did Gokhale. He would be caged all the rest of his days with the man he most loathed. Sara chuckled again. She made me nervous when she got like that. Chapter 32 I watched the old priest closely as we eased through the spell net surrounding the warehouse. He did not have a yarn amulet. His head twitched and jerked. His feet kept wanting to change direction, but his will hacked away through the illusions. Possibly that was a result of his training on the path of the sword. I recalled, though, that lady had insisted he was a minor wizard. Where are we going, uncle? And why are we going there? We go where no Nguyenbo ear will hear what I tell you. Old Nguyenbo would label me a traitor. Young Nguyen Bo would call me a lying fool, or worse. And I? I was generally a proponent of the latter view whenever I heard him preaching about his path to inner peace through obsessively continuous preparation for combat. His philosophy had appealed only to a very few of Bondo Trang's employees. All Nguyen Bo, all too young to have witnessed actual warfare. I understood that the path of the sword was not militaristic. But others had trouble grasping that fact. You want to maintain your image as an old stiff neck who wouldn't be caught dead helping a subhuman Jengali fall and break her skull. It was too dark to tell, but I thought he smiled. That's an extreme way of stating it, but it approximates the facts. His taglia never poor improved now that he had no other audience. Are you overlooking the fact that every bit of darkness out there might harbor a bat or a crow or rat, or even one of the protector's shadows? I have nothing to fear from those things. The thousand voices already knows everything I'm going to tell you. But she might not want me to know, too. We walked in silence for a long time. Taglio seldom fails to amaze me. Doge cut across a wealthy section, where whole families fought up in estates surrounded by guarded walls. Their youths were out on Solara Road, which grew up ages ago to provide them with their diversions. Reason insisted that beggars ought to be plentiful where the wealth was concentrated, but that was not the case. The extremely poor were not allowed to offend the sight of the mighty with their presence. There, as everywhere, Odors assailed the nostrils, but these scents were sandalwood, cloves, and perfumes. After that, Doge led me into the dark, crowded streets of a temple district. We stepped aside to let a band of goonie acolytes pass. The boys were bullying the people living in the streets. 
I thought we might have trouble with them, too. Which would have ended with them suffering a lot of pain, but a break on their misbehavior saved them from its consequences. That arrived in the form of three greys. The Shadar do not disdain the caste system entirely, but they do hold to the notion that the highest caste must include not just the priests and men qualified by birth to become priests, but also, certainly, any men of the Shadar faith. And that faith, which is an extremely heretical and goony infected bastard offshoot of my own one true faith, contains a strong strain of charity toward the weak and the unfortunate. The greys methodically applied their bamboo canes and invited the youths to take up any complaints with the protector. The acolytes were smarter than they pretended. They got the hell out of there before the greys used their whistles to invite all their friends to the caning. All part of night in the city. Doge and I drifted onward. Eventually he led me to a place called the Deer Park, which is an expanse of wilderness near the center of the city. It had been created by some despot of centuries past. I told Doge, I really don't need all this exercise. I wondered if he had some goofball plan to murder me and leave the body under the trees. But what would be the point? Doge was Doge. With him, you never knew. I feel more comfortable here, he said. But I never stay long. There is a company of rangers charged with keeping squatters out. They consider anyone not Taglian and high caste a squatter. This is good. This log has shaped itself to my posterior. The log in question tripped me. I got back onto my feet and said, I'm listening. Sit. This will take a while. Leave out the begats which was a Jakuri Vedna colloquialism having to do with difficulties memorizing scripture, which you have to do as a child. I meant, don't bother telling me whose fault it was and why they're such bloody villains for it. Just tell me what happened. Asking a storyteller not to embellish is like asking a fish to give up water. I do have to go to work tomorrow. As you will. You are aware, are you not, that the free companies of Katovar and the roving bands of stranglers who murder for the glory of Kina share a common ancestry. There's enough suggestion in our recent annals to allow for that interpretation, I admitted. Caution seemed indicated. My place among the Nyuengbo would correspond roughly with yours as analyst of the Black Company. It includes, as well, the role of the priest in the strangler band, whose secondary obligation is to maintain a sound oral history of the band. Over the centuries, the Tug have lost their respect for education. My own studies suggested that a great deal of evolution had taken place in my company during those same centuries, probably a lot more than had been the case with the deceiver bands. They had stayed inside one culture that had not changed a lot. Meanwhile, the black company kept moving into stranger and stranger lands, old soldiers being replaced by young foreigners who had no connection with the past and no idea that Kadovar even existed. Doge seemed to echo my thoughts. The Strangler bands are pale imitations of the original free companies. The black company retains the name and some of the memories, but you're philosophically much farther from the original than the deceivers are. Your band is ignorant of its true antecedents, and has been kept that way willfully, mainly through the manipulations of the goddess Kina, but also, to a lesser extent, by others who didn't want your company to become what it had been in another time. I waited. He did not volunteer to explain, though it was difficult that way. He did, I suppose, do something that was even harder for him. He told the truth about his own people. Nyuengbo are the almost pure-blooded descendants of the people of one of the free companies. One that chose not to go back. But the black company is supposed to be the only one that didn't go back. The annals say, They tell you only what those who recorded them knew. My ancestors arrived here after the black company finished laying the land to waste and moved on north already having lost sight of its divine mission, deserting in its own way through ignorance 
of what it was supposed to be. By then it was already three generations old and had made no effort to maintain the purity of its blood. It had just fought the war, which is the first that your analysts remember, and was almost completely destroyed. That seems to be the fate of the Black Company, to be reduced to a handful, then to reconstitute itself, again and again, losing something of its previous self each time. And the fate of your company? I noted that he did not mention a name. No matter, really. No name would mean anything to me. To sink ever deeper into ignorance itself. I know the truth. I know the secrets and the old ways. But I am the last. Unlike other companies, we brought our families with us. We were a late experiment. We had too much to lose. We deserted. We went and hid in the swamps. But we've kept our lineage pure. Almost. And the pilgrimages? The old people who died in Jaikur? Hong Tre? And the great dark terrible secret of the Nuang Bo that Sarah worries about so much? The Nuang Bo had many dark secrets. All the free companies had dark secrets. We were instruments of the darkness. The soldiers of darkness. The bone warriors charged with opening the way for Kina. Stone soldiers warring for the honor of being remembered for all eternity by having our names written in golden letters and glittering stone. We failed because our ancestors were imperfect in their devotion. In every company, there were those who were too weak to bring on the Year of the Skulls. The old people? Kaidam and Hong Trey. Kaidam was the last elected Nguyen Bo captain. There was no one to take his place. Hong Trey was a witch with the curse of foresight. She was the last true priest, priestess. Curse of foresight? She never foresaw anything good. I sensed that he did not want to get into that subject. I recalled that Hong Trey's final prophecy involved Morgan and Sarah, which certainly was an offense to all right-thinking Nguyen Bo, and was not yet a prophecy completely fulfilled, probably. The great sin of the Nguyen Bo? You had that idea from Sarah, of course. And she, like all those born after the coming of the Shadow Master, believes that sin is what caused the Nguyen Bo to flee into the swamps. She believes wrongly. That flight involved no sin but survival. The true black sin occurred within my own lifetime. His voice tightened up. He had strong feelings about this. I waited. I was a small boy, just taking my first small steps on the path of the sword when the stranger came. He was a personable man of middle years. His name was Ashutash. Yaksha. In the oldest form of the language, Ashutash meant something like despair of the wicked. Yaksha meant much the same as it does in Taglian today, which was good spirit. People were prepared to believe he was a supernatural being because he had a white skin, a very pale white skin, lighter than goblin or willow swan, who sometimes gets some sunlight. He wasn't an albino, though. He had normal eyes. His hair wasn't quite as blonde as Swan's is. In some, he was a magical creature to most Nguyen Bo. He spoke the language oddly, but he did speak it. He said he wanted to study at the Vingo Gang Temple, the fame of which had reached him far away. When pressed about his origins, he insisted that he hailed from the land of unknown shadows, beneath the stars of the noose. He claimed to have come off the glittering stone? Not quite. That was never clear. There or beyond. No one pressed him hard. Not even Kai Dam or Hong Trey, though he troubled them. Very early, we learned that Ashutash was a powerful sorcerer. And in those days... Many of the older people still knew about the origins of the Nguyen Bo. It was feared that he might have been sent to summon us home. That proved to be untrue, 
For a long time, Ashutosh seemed to be nothing but what he claimed, a student who wanted to absorb whatever wisdom had accumulated at the temple of Gangesha, which had been a holy place since the Nguyen-bo first entered the swamp. But there's a but, right? The man was a villain after all? He was indeed. In fact, Ashutosh was the man you knew later as Shadow Spinner. He was there to find our key, sent by his teacher and mentor, whom you came to know as Long Shadow. At a young age, this man had stumbled across rumors that not all the free companies had returned to Katova. What he understood from that, that nobody else realized, was that each company still outside must possess a talisman capable of opening and closing the Shadow Gate. An ambitious man could use that talisman to recruit Rakshas as he could send out to do evil for him. The power to kill becomes the ultimate power in the hands of a man who has no reservations about employing it. So this Ashutash Yaksha found the key? He only assured himself that it existed. He wormed his way into the confidence of the senior priests. One day, someone let something drop. Soon afterward, Ashutash announced that he had received word that his teacher, mentor, and spiritual father, Maricha Mantara Dumraksha, impressed by his reports on the temple, had chosen to come visit. Dumraksha turned out to be a tall, incredibly skinny man, who always wore a mask, apparently because his face was deformed. You heard a name like Maricha Mantara Dumraksha and you didn't suspect something? I could not see Doge in the darkness, but I could feel his unhappy frown. He said, I was a small child. And the Nguyen Bo aren't interested in anything not their own. Yes, I'm Vedna, uncle, but I recognize the names Mantara and Dumraksha as those of legendary Guni demons. Even though you walk amongst lesser beings, you might keep your ears open. That way when a nasty Jengali sorcerer pulls your leg, you'll at least have a clue. Doge grunted. He had a golden tongue, Dumraksha did. When he discovered that each decade, as the custom was then, a band of the leading men undertook a pilgrimage south, he invited himself along and tricked somebody into letting him examine the key. Close, but not quite. Yes, you did guess correctly. The pilgrimage went to the very shadow gate. The pilgrims would spend ten days there waiting for a sign. I don't believe anyone knew what that might be anymore, but the traditions had to be observed. The pilgrims, however, never took the actual key with them. They carried a replica charged with a few simple spells meant to fool an inattentive thief. The real key stayed home. The old men didn't really want a sign from the other side. Long Shadow got in a hurry. He did. When the pilgrims arrived at the Shadow Gate, they found Ashutash Yaksha and a half dozen other sorcerers waiting. Several were fugitives from that northern realm of darkness where the Black Company was then in service. When Dumraksha used the false key, his band found themselves under attack from the other side of the Shadow Gate. Before the gateway could be stopped up, using the power of Long Shadow's true name, three of the would-be Shadow Masters had perished. The one called the Howler, cruelly injured, had fled. The survivors quickly became the feuding, conquering monsters your brothers found in place when they arrived. And the same disaster caused the Mother of Night to reawaken and begin scheming toward the Year of the Skulls once more. And that's the great sin of the Nguyen Bo? Letting themselves be hoodwinked by sorcerers? In those days, there was little contact with the world outside the swamp. Bando Trang's family managed all outside trade. Once a decade, a handful of the older men traveled to the Shadow Gate. About as frequently, Guni ascetics would enter the swamp hoping to purify their souls. These Guni hermits were obviously crazy, or they wouldn't have come into the swamps in the first place. They were always tolerated, and Gangesha found a home. Where does the thousand voices fit? She learned the story from the howler around the time we were trapped in Dejagore. 
or soon afterward. She came to the temple soon after we returned, the best of us exhausted, our old men all dead, including our captain and speaker, and witch Hong Tre with them. There was no one but me left who knew everything, though Gota and Tai Dei knew some, and Sarah a little, they being the family of Kai Dam and Hong Tre. The thousand voices went to the temple while I was away. She used her power to intimidate and torture the priests until they surrendered the mysterious object that had been given them for safekeeping ages ago. They didn't even know what it was anymore. They really can't be blamed, but I can't help blaming them. And there you have it. All the secrets of the Nguyen Bo. I doubted that. I doubt that seriously, but it's a basis from which to work. Are you going to cooperate? If we get Narayan Singh to divulge what he did with the key? If you'll undertake a promise never to tell anyone what I told you here tonight. I swear it on the annals. This was too easy. I won't say a word to a soul. But I did not say anything about not writing it down. I did not extract an oath from him. Sometime, eventually... He would face the moral dilemma that had swallowed the Radisha once it seemed that the company would fulfill its obligation to her, and it was coming time for her to deliver on her own commitments. Once Uncle Doge had his own people out from under the glittering stone, his reliability as an ally would turn to smoke. Easily dealt with when the time came, I thought. I told Doge, I still have to work tomorrow, and it's a whole lot later now than it was an hour ago. He rose, evidently relieved that I had not asked many questions. I did have a few in mind, such as why the Nguyen Bo had risked more frequent pilgrimages to the Shadow Gate once the Shadow Masters were in power, adding women and children and old people to the entourage. So I asked anyway while we were walking. He told me, The Shadow Masters permitted it. It added to their feelings of superiority and it let us keep them thinking that we didn't have the real key, that we were searching for it. Our own people believed that was what we were doing. Only Kai Dam and Hong Tre knew the whole truth. The Shadow Masters were hoping we'd find it for them. The Thousand Voices figured it out. Yes, her crows went everywhere and heard everything. And in those days, she had a very sneaky demon at her beck and call. I continued to pester him all the way back to the warehouse, cleverly trying to find his remaining secrets by coloring in more map around the blank spaces. It did not fool him a bit. Before I dragged off to bed, I visited Sarah, Mergen, and Goblin one more time. You people get all of that? Most of it, Mergen said. This weary old slave has been doing some other chores, too. Think he told the truth? Mostly, Sarah admitted. He told no lies that I noticed. But I don't think he told the whole truth. Well, of course not. He's Nguyen Bo, right down to his twisted toe bones. And a wizard, besides. Before Sarah got indignant, Goblin told me, There's a white crow out there with you. I saw it, I said. I figured it was Mergen. Mergen said, It wasn't Mergen. I was there disembodied, same as now. What was it then? Who was it? I don't know, Mergen replied. I did not entirely believe him. Maybe it was a false intuition, but I was sure he had a strong suspicion. Chapter 33 Master Santaraxida hardly waited till there was no eavesdroppers before he approached me. Dorabi, your record is beginning to look bad. Two days ago you were late. Yesterday you didn't show up at all. This morning you don't look alert and ready for work. I was not. I would have been testy with anyone else. In this case, I barely noticed that his words were not spoken in a tone in keeping with their content. I sensed relief in him at my return and a lingering whiff of a fear that I would not. I lied. I had a fever. I couldn't stay on my feet for more than a few minutes at a time. 
I tried to come in, but I was so weak. I got lost for a while and eventually ended up just going home. Should you even be here today, then? Changing course, sounding overly worried. I have a little more strength today. I have a lot of work to do. I really want to keep this job, Shri. None other would put me so close to so much wisdom. Where is home, Doribi? I had collected my broom. He was following me. Eyes were following us. Some with a knowing look that told me Centaraxita may have pursued other young men in the past. I was ready for this one because I knew he had tried to follow me. I share a small room near the waterfront in the Sirada neighborhood with several friends from the army. A common situation throughout Taglios, where men outnumbered women almost two to one because so many men have come in from the territories hoping to make their fortunes. Why didn't you go home when you came back, Durabi? Oh, oh. Shri? Your mother, your brothers, your sisters and their wives and husbands and children all still dwell in the same place where you lived as a child. They believed you were dead. Oh, darn. He had gone to see them? The busybody. I don't get along with those people, Shri. Which was an outright lie on behalf of Dorby Day Banerjai. The man I had known had been very close to his family. When I came back from the Kialune Wars... I was so horribly changed that they wouldn't have recognized me had I gone home. It wouldn't have been long before they found out things about me that would have caused them to disown me. I preferred to let them think Dorby was dead. The boy they remembered no longer exists anyway. I hoped he would interpret that according to his own wishful thinking. He bit. I understand. I am grateful for your concern, Shri. If you will excuse me. I went to work. I worked briskly, deep in thought. What I needed to do required me to let myself be seduced. I had no experience along those lines, from either of the possible viewpoints. But the old men tell me I am clever, and after a while I thought I saw a way by which events could proceed as desired without Surendranath Centaraxita putting himself in a position of emotional or moral risk greater than he had when he tried to follow me home and I had to send Tobo out to rescue him. Which, of course, he did not know. I had a weak spell toward mid-morning, at a point where old Baladitya could repay his small debt by being solicitous. By the time Master Centaraxita manufactured a reasonable excuse to put himself into my proximity, I had collected myself and was back to work. A few hours later, I contrived to throw up my lunch, then made a show of cleaning up. I suffered dizzy spells later still. The last occurred after most of the librarians and copyists had gone home, despite the threat of further showers. The afternoon storm had not been as terrible as most. Taglians generally viewed that as a bad omen. Santaraxita played his part perfectly. He was beside me before my spell was over. Nervously, he suggested, You'd better quit now, Dorabi. You've put in more than your day's work. The rest will be here tomorrow. I'll walk along with you to make sure you're all right. A relapse threatened as I began to protest that that was not necessary. So I said, Thank you, Shri. Your generosity knows no bounds. What about Baladitya? The old copyist's grandson had failed to show again. He is practically on our way. We'll just leave him off first. I tried to think of some small act or something I could say that would encourage Centaraxita's fantasy, but could not. That proved unnecessary anyway. The man was determined to hook himself, all because I knew how to read. Weird. Riverwalker just happened to be hanging around outside when Master Centaraxita, Baladitya, and I left the library grounds. I made a little gesture to let him know we were going to do it. More signs and gestures along the way let him know that the old man should be rounded up as soon as Centaraxita and I left him. He was a witness who could say that the master librarian had been seen last in my company, and he might be useful. Not far from the warehouse, I suffered another mild spell. Centaraxita put an arm around me to help. 
I drifted back into my safe place some, and went on with the game. By now we were surrounded, at a distance, by company brothers. Just straight ahead, I told Santaraxita, who was becoming confused by the outer web of spells. Just hold my hand. Moments later, a gentle tap at the base of the master librarian's skull let me step away from my uncomfortable role. Here I'm known as Sleepy. I'm the analyst of the Black Company. I brought you here to assist in the translation of material recorded by some of my earliest predecessors. Centaraxida began to fuss. Kendo Cutter placed a hand over his mouth and nose so he could not breathe. After several such episodes, even a member of the priestly class recognized the connection between silence and unimpeded breathing. I told him, We have a pretty cruel reputation, Shri, and it's rightly deserved. No, I'm not Dorby Day Banerjai. Dorby did die during the Kialune Wars, fighting on our side. What do you want? In a shaky voice. Like I said, we need to translate some old books. Tobo, get the books from my work table. The boy went away grumbling about why was it always he who had to run and fetch. Master Santaraxita was very put out when he discovered that some of what I wanted translated had been pilfered from his own restricted stacks. In fact, when I told him, I want to start with this one, and showed him what I believed to be the earliest of the annals, he lost some color. I'm doomed, Dorabi. I'm sorry, young man. Sleepy, was it? Ha! Huh. One eye bellowed, having appeared only moments before. Did you ever go sniffing up the wrong tree? My little darling Sleepy here is all girl. I smirked. Darn! Here we go again, Shri. Now you have to get your mind around the fact that a woman can read. Ah, here's Baladitya. You'll be working with him. Thank you, River. Did you run into any trouble? Centaraxita began to bulk again. I won't. Kindo silenced him again. You'll translate and you'll work hard at it, Tree, or we won't feed you. We aren't the Badralok. We quit talking about it a long time ago. We're doing it. It's just your misfortune to get caught up in it. Sarah arrived. She was soaked. It's raining again. I see you landed your fish. She collapsed into a chair, considered Surindranath Santaraxita. I am exhausted. My nerves were on edge all day. The protector returned from the swamp at noon. She was in a totally foul mood. She had a huge argument with the Radisha right in front of us. The Radisha stood up to her. She did. She has reached her limit. Another Bodhi disciple came this morning, but the Grey stopped him from burning himself. Then the Protector announced that she was going to take the night away from us by letting the shadows run loose from now on. That's when the Radisha started screaming. Santa Raxita looked so completely appalled by the implications of Sarah's revelations that I had to laugh. No, he insisted. It's not funny. Then we discovered that he was not really concerned about the shadows. The protector is going to clip my ears, at the very least. These books weren't supposed to be in the library at all. I was supposed to have destroyed them ages ago. But I couldn't do that to any book. Then I forgot about them. I should have locked them up somewhere. Why? Sarah snapped. She did not get an answer. I asked her, Did you make any headway? I didn't get a chance to pick up any pages. I did get into the Radish's suite. I did eavesdrop on her and Soulcatcher. And I did pick up a little other information. For example? For example... The Purohita and all the sacerdotal members of the Privy Council will be leaving the palace tomorrow to attend a convocation of senior priests in preparation for this year's Druga Pavi. The Druga Pavi is the biggest Guni holiday of the Taglian year. 
Taglios, with all its numerous cults and countless minorities, boasted some holiday almost every day, but the Druga Pavi beggared all the rest. But that doesn't come up until after the end of the rainy season. I had a funny feeling about this. I got a premonition from it myself, Sarah admitted. River, take the master and copyist and make sure they're as comfortable as we can make them here. Have Goblin provide them with chokers and make sure they understand how they work. I asked Sarah. Did you happen to hear about this before or after Soulcatcher got back from terrorizing the swamp? After, of course. Of course. She suspects something. Kendo, as soon as it's light out tomorrow, I want you to head for the Cairn Miwat. See what you can find out about this meeting without giving away how interested you are. If you see a lot of greys or other shadar around, don't bother. Just get back here with that word. Suppose this is a genuine opportunity? Sarah asked. It'll stay genuine as long as they're outside the palace, won't it? Maybe it would be best to just kill them. Put some flash buttons on the corpses. That would make Soulcatcher really mad. Wait, I'm having a thought. It might just be straight from Al Shiel. I waved a finger in the air as though counting musical beats. Yes, that's it. We need to hope the protector is trying to bait and trap with the Purohita. I explained my thinking. That's good, Sarah said. But if we're going to make it work, you and Tobo will have to go inside with me. And I can't. There's no way I can miss work the day after Master Centaraxita disappears. Get Mergen. See if he was around the palace today. Find out if there's a trap and where it's at. If Soulcatcher is going to be away, maybe you and Tobo can do it on your own. I don't want to belittle your genius, Sleepy, but this is something I've thought about a lot. Off and on for years. The possibility is partly why I keep trying to worm my way closer to the center of things. The truth is, it can't be managed by fewer than three people. I need Shiki and I need Sawa. Let me think. Sarah got Mergen's attention while I thought. Mergen seemed to be more alert and more interested in the outside world now, particularly where his wife and son were concerned. He must have begun to understand. I've got it, Sarah. We can have Goblin be Sawa. Hey, no fucking way, Goblin said. He repeated himself four or five times in as many languages, just in case somebody missed his point. What the fuck is the matter with you, woman? You're as small as I am. We rub a little betel nut juice on your face and hands, dress you up in my Sawa outfit, have Sarah sew your mouth shut so you can't shoot it off every time the urge hits you. Nobody will know the difference, as long as you keep looking down, which is what Sawa mostly does. That may be a solution. Sarah said, ignoring Goblin's continued protests. In fact, the more I think about it, the better I like it. No disrespect meant, but in a major pinch, Goblin would be a lot more useful than you would. I know. There you go. And I could go ahead and be Dorby Day besides. Isn't it wonderful? Women, Goblin grumbled. Can't live with them, but they won't go away. Sara said, You'd better start learning Sawa's quirks from Sleepy. To me, she said, There'll be plenty of work for Sawa. I made sure. And Arita is eager to get her back. Tobo, you need to get some sleep. Nobody's connected you with Gokale, but you'll still need to be alert. I really don't like going up there, Mom. You think I do? We all have... Yes, I think you do. I think you keep going up there because you want the danger. I think it might be hard for you when you do have to stop taking risks. I think when that happens, we're all going to have to watch you close so you don't do something that might get us all killed along with you. That was a kid who had been doing a lot of thinking. Maybe with a little help from one or more uncles. 
sounded to me like he might be riding knee to knee with the truth, too. Chapter 34 I settled into a chair outside the cage where Narayan Singh was being kept. He was awake, but he ignored me. I said, The daughter of night still lives. I know that. You do? How? I didn't know if you'd harmed her. Then you need to know this. She isn't going to stay unharmed a whole lot longer. The only reason she's healthy now is that we want your cooperation. If we can't get it, then there's not much reason to keep on feeding her. Or you, either. Though I do intend to keep my word about taking care of you. Because I'd want you to see everything you value destroyed before you're allowed to die yourself. Which reminds me. Aridatha couldn't be with us tonight. His captain was concerned that there might be some unrest. Another Bodhi disciple planned to burn himself. So we'll have to wait until tomorrow night. Narion made a sound like a whispered moan. He did not want to have to acknowledge my existence, for existence, and mine in particular, was making him very unhappy, which made me happy, though I had no personal grudge. My anemone was all very sanitary, very institutional, very much on behalf of my brothers who had been injured, and on behalf of my brothers who were imprisoned beneath the earth. I suggested... Maybe you should go to Kina for guidance. Such a look he gave me. Narayan Singh had no sense of humor and did not recognize sarcasm when it struck from the grass and sank its fangs in his ankle. I told him, Just to recap, I don't have much patience left. I don't have much time left. We've leaped onto the tiger's back. The big catfight is coming. Catfight. Universal male slang for a squabble amongst women. Oh, really? It had just occurred to me. We were all women in this fight. Sarah and I. The Radisha and Soul Catcher. Kina and the Daughter of Night. Uncle Doge was as close to a principal as any man was right now. And Narion though he was mainly the daughter of Night's shadow. Strange. Strange. Narayan, when the fur starts flying, I won't be much interested in looking out for your friend, but I'm definitely going to take care of you. I started to leave. I can't do this thing. Singh's voice was almost inaudible. Work on it, Narayan. If you love the girl, if you don't want your goddess to have to start all over from scratch. I thought I had that much power. By killing the right people, I could lay Kina down to sleep for another age. And I would if I could not get my own brothers out of the ground. I found Bondo Trang, awaiting me in the little corner where I worked and slept. He did not look well, which was not surprising. He was not too many years younger than Goblin, and did not have Goblin's wondrous resources. Can I be of any service, Uncle? I understand, Doge. Told you the story of our people. The best he could manage was a hoarse whisper. He told me a story. There are always doubts left behind when any Nguyen Bo shares a secret with me. <laughs> You're a bright young woman, sleepy. Few illusions and no obvious obsessions. I think Doge was as honest with you as he could compel himself to be. Assuming he was honest with me when he consulted me afterward. He finally heard me when I told him that this is a new age. That that was what Hong Tre wanted to show us when she chose the Jengal to become Sarah's husband. We're all lost children. We must join hands. 
That too is what Hong Tre wanted us to understand. She could have said so. She was Hong Tre, a seeress, a Nguengbo seeress. Would you have her issue blunt rescripts like the Radisha and the Protector? Absolutely. Do Trang chuckled. Then he seemed to fall asleep. Was that that? I wondered. Uncle? Huh? Oh, I'm a sorry young woman. Listen, I don't think anyone else has mentioned it. Maybe no one else but Gota and I have seen it. But there's a ghost in this place. We've seen it several times the past two nights. A ghost? Was Mergen getting so strong people were starting to see him? It's a cold and evil thing, Sleepy. Like something that's happiest skulking around the mouths of graves or slithering through a mountain of bones. Like that vampire child in the tiger cage. You should be very wary of her. And I think I should find my way to bed before I fall asleep here and your friends begin to talk. If they're going to gossip about me, I can't think of anyone I'd rather have them connect me with. Someday, when I'm young again, next time around the wheel. Good night, Uncle. I thought I might read for a while, but I fell asleep almost instantly. Sometime during the night, I discovered that Do Trang's ghost did exist. I awakened, instantly alert, and saw a vaguely human shimmer standing nearby, evidently watching me. The old man had done a good job describing it, too. I wondered if it might not be death himself. It went away as soon as it sensed my scrutiny. I lay there trying to put it together. Morgan? Soul catcher spying? An unknown? Or what it felt like, the girl in the tiger cage out for an ectoplasmic stroll. I tried reason, but was still too tired to stick with it long. Chapter 35 There was something wrong with the city. In addition to its extraordinarily clean smell, the rain had continued throughout most of the night, and in addition to the stunned looks on the faces of street dwellers who had survived their worst night yet. No. It was a sort of bated breath feeling that got stronger as I approached the library. Maybe it was some sort of psychic phenomenon. I stopped. The captain used to say you had to trust your instincts. If it felt like something was wrong, then I should take time to figure out why I felt that way. I turned slowly. No street poor here. But that was understandable. There were dead people around here. The survivors would be clinging to whatever shelter they could find, afraid the greys would replace the shadows by day. But the greys were absent too. And traffic was lighter than it should be. And most of the tiny one-man stalls that sprawled out into the thoroughfare were not in evidence. There was fear in the air. People expected something to happen. They had seen something that troubled them deeply. What that might be was not obvious, though. When I asked one of the merchants who was bold enough to be out, he ignored my question completely and tried to convince me that there was no way I could manage another day without a hammered brass censer. In a moment, I decided he might be right. I paused to speak to another brass merchant, whose space lay within eyeshot of the library. Where is everyone this morning? I asked, examining a long-spouted teapot sort of thing with no real utility. A furtive shift of the merchant's eyes toward the library suggested there was substance to my premonitions. And whatever had spooked him had taken place quite recently. No Taglian neighborhood remains quiet and empty for long. I seldom carry money, but did have a few coins on me this morning. I bought the useless teapot. A gift for my wife, for finally producing a son. You're not from around here, are you? The brass smith asked. No, I'm from Dejagore. 
The man nodded to himself, as if that explained everything. When I started to move on, he murmured, You don't want to go that way, Deja Gorin. Ah? Uh? Be in no hurry. Find a long way around that place. I squinted at the library. I saw nothing unusual. The grounds appeared completely normal, though some men were working on the garden. Ah, I continued forward, only till I could slide into the mouth of an alley. Why were there gardeners there? Only the master librarian ever brought them in. I caught glimpses of something wheeling above the library. It drifted down to settle on the ironwork of the gate, above Adu's head. I took it for a lone pigeon at first, but when it folded its wings, I saw that it was a white crow, and a crow with a sharper eye than Adu had. But Adu was accustomed to posting himself in the gateway. That constituted another warning sign. The white crow looked right at me and winked, or maybe just blinked. But I preferred the implication of intelligence and conspiratorial camaraderie. The crow dropped onto Adu's shoulder. The startled gateman nearly jumped out of his sandals. The bird evidently said something. Adu jumped again and tried to catch it. After he failed, he ran into the library. Moments later, Shadar, disguised as librarians and copyists, rushed out and began trying to bring the crow down with stones. The bird got the heck out of there. I followed its example, heading in another direction. I was more alert than I had been in years. What was going on? Why were they there? Obviously, they were lying in wait. For me? Who else? But why? What had I done to give myself away? Maybe nothing, though failing to show up to be questioned would count as damning evidence. But I was not lunatic enough to try to bluff my way through whatever it was the greys were trying to do. The milk was spilt, no going back. But I did want to mourn the one volume of ancient annals I had not yet been able to locate and pilfer. All the way home, I tried to reason out what had brought out the greys. Surendranath Santaraxita had not been missing long enough to cause any official interest. In fact, some mornings the master librarian did not arrive until much later than this. I gave it up before I threw my brain out of joint. Mergen could go poking around down there. He could find the answer by eavesdropping. Chapter 36 Mergen was busy eavesdropping even though it was daytime. He was worried about Sara and Tobo, and maybe even a little about Goblin. I found one eye, hungover but attentive, at the table where the mist engine resided. Mother Goda and Uncle Doge were there as well, tense and attentive themselves, which told me that Sara was determined to go ahead with our most daring stroke yet. To my amazement, one eye hustled over, in reality, a slow shuffle, and patted me on my back. We heard you were coming in, little girl. We were scared shitless they were going to get you. What? Morgan warned us there was a trap. He heard some of the grey bosses talking about it when he was scouting to see what Sarah was headed into. The old bitch soul catcher herself was out there waiting for you. Well... Not exactly you personally. Just somebody who goes around stealing books that aren't supposed to be there in the first place. You've lost me good, old man. Start someplace where I can see a couple of landmarks. Somebody followed you and your boyfriend yesterday. Somebody more suspicious of him than of you. Evidently a part-time spy for the protector. We knew there were informants out there getting paid piecework rates. We tried not to be vulnerable to them. Also evidently with a boner for your boyfriend. One eye. All right, for your boss. More or less literally. He went and told the greys that this dirty old man was about to force perversions on one of the youths who worked for him. 
A few greys went to the library and started poking around and asking questions, and quickly discovered that some funds had gone missing, and sent their axe that as well. When they started dragging people out of bed and pulling them in. Then they discovered several books missing, also, including some great rarities, and even a couple that were supposed to have been removed from the library years ago, but had not been. That got back to Ketcher. She got her sweet little behind down there in about ten seconds and started threatening to eat people alive and hurting anybody whose looks she didn't like. And I almost walked into the middle of it, I mused. How did they know the books were gone? I replaced them with discards. But maybe Master Centaraxita, if he was a crook, had been doing that too. If he had been corrupt, he had had me fooled. We would have to talk. Near as Morgan could find out, Dorby de Benerjai isn't suspected of anything worse than naivete. Surrendering off Santaraxita, though, is in deep shite. Soul Catcher is going to kill him one limb at a time and let him watch the crows eat them as they go. And after that, she's going to get nasty. One eye grinned a grin in which just the one lonely tooth loomed. Not exactly a recommendation of his talents as the company dental specialist. See what you like about Soul Catcher. She doesn't put up with any corruption. Which was just another black mark in her ledger as far as one eye was concerned. I'm safe, I said. Here's food for thought. A white crow was waiting at the gate, possibly to warn me. It made a definite attempt to communicate. So what's the story with Sarah? She's going ahead. That Joel Baron Dandy is a real dimwit. He bought Goblin's feeble imitation of your Sawa character. Then he tried to get Tobo away from Sarah. Sarah threatened to tell his wife. Me and Superdeal was going to have trouble staying employed if she kept up the bad attitude. The cover team in place? Little girl, who's been doing this shite since before your great-grandmother was born? You always check again, and keep on checking, because sooner or later, you're going to save someone who overlooked something. Is the evacuation team operational? Chances were good we were going to have to leave Taglios long before I wanted. Soul Catcher soon would be hunting us hard. One eye said, Ask Do Trang. He said he'd take care of it. You might find it interesting to note that Catcher dropped the watch on Arjana Drupada when the library jumped to the head of her list and she needed trustworthy people there. She doesn't have enough to go around? Not that she trusts. Most of those she's had watching the Bodhi disciples so she can head them off before they pull any more suicide stunts. Then we have to hit Drupada. Go teach your granny to suck eggs, little girl. Like I said, who was playing these games when granny's mummy was still shiting her nappies? Who's covering the warehouse then? Having so many things in the air meant that every brother had to be occupied somewhere. Soulcatcher was not alone in facing manpower limitations. You and me, little girl. Pooch and Spiff are around somewhere, being a mixture of sentries and carriers. You sure Drupada is clean? Morgan checks every half hour. Much as he'd rather be hunting his honey. Friend Arjana is clean. For now. But how long will it last? And Morgan's also been keeping his eye on Slink and Simki. Checking him every couple of hours. Looks like that's going to happen today, too. Soulcatcher is going to shite. She's just going to shite rocks. We're going to do everything but stroll up and bite her on the tit today. Language, old man. Language. Uncle Doge murmured something. One eye hastened to the mist projector. Chapter 37 Despite her enthusiasm the night before, Sarah had been worried about having Goblin along playing Sawa's role. The little man was not reliable. He was bound to do something. She did not give him enough credit. 
He had not survived so long by doing stupid things in tight places. He was determined to be more completely Sawa than ever I had played the role. He did nothing on his own. Mean Subradil guided him completely. But over his conservative role-playing, he laid a glamour of disinterest. Jol Barandandi and everyone else merely gave the idiot woman a glance and concentrated on Shiki, who appeared particularly attractive this morning, who carried her flute hung on a thong around her neck. Anyone who tried to use force would suffer a cruel surprise. The flute was not new, but the gangisha that Shiki carried was. Today, even Sawa carried a statue of the god. Jol Barandandi mocked Subradil. When will you start carrying a gangisha in each hand? This was after he had been threatened because of Shiki, and he was not feeling kindly. Subradil bent and whispered to her gangisha, something about pardoning Barandandi, because at heart he was a good man who needed help finding his anchor within the light. Barandandi heard some of that. It disarmed him for a while. He turned the mad woman and her companions over to his wife, who had developed an almost proprietary interest lately. Subradil, in particular, made her look good, because she got so much work done. Narita, too, noted the gangisha. If religious devotion will win you a better life next time around the wheel, Subradil, you're headed for the priestly class for sure. Then the fat woman frowned. But didn't you leave your gangisha here yesterday? Ah. Uh... Ah, ah, I did. I thought I lost that one forever. I didn't know what had come of it. Where is it? Where is it? She had prepared for this, though the gangisha had been left behind intentionally. You see, you see. Superdeal's love affair with her gangisha amused everyone. We took good care of it. There was a lot of work scheduled for the day, which was good. It helped pass the time. Nothing else could be done till much later, and even then, luck would have to play a big part. Another dozen gongishas would not have been out of place where the need for luck went. During the noon break over kitchen scraps, Subradil's party heard rumors of the protector's rage over someone having stolen some books from the royal library. She was out there now, investigating personally. Subradil shot warning looks at her companions. No questions. No worrying about the people they could not possibly help. Later in the day, there were more rumors. The Purohita and several members of the Privy Council, along with bodyguards and hangers-on, had been treated to a wholesale slaughter on the very steps of the Kermi Wat, in what sounded like a full-scale military assault supported by heavy sorcery, Reports were vague and confused, because everyone but the attackers had been trying to find somewhere safe to hide. Subradil tried to take that into account, but could not control her anger entirely. Kendo Cutter was too violent a man to have been in charge, and too devout a Vedna. The Guni were not going to be pleased about bloodshed happening on the very steps of a major temple. There was much talk about the signs and portents thrown up as cover and diversion while the attackers faded away. There would be no doubt who had been responsible, nor even who was next on the list of the doomed. Any smoke cloud that did not declare water sleeps thundered, My brother unforgiven. It had been rumored only for a day that the great general had been summoned to Taglios to deal with the dead who refused to lie down. To the people in the street, it looked like the company would be waiting. Sarah was worried. Soulcatcher was sure to abandon the library when she heard about the attack. If she returned to the palace extremely agitated, Sarah's operation might have to be abandoned because the sorceress would be too alert. The Radisha stormed through not long after the news began to make the rounds. She was distraught. She headed directly for her anger chamber. Sawa looked up from the brasswork she was cleaning, just for an instant, apparently badly troubled. Subradil set her mop aside and went to see what was wrong. No one else paid them any attention. Not much later, when Jal Barandandi dropped in to see how the work was going and somehow got into an argument with Narita, Sawa wandered away when no one was looking. 
no one noticed right away because Sawa almost never did anything to be noticed, and today she wore charms reinforcing that. Shiki drifted closer to her mother. She looked pale and troubled and kept touching her flute. She whispered, Shouldn't we be going? It isn't time. Place your gongisha. Shiki was supposed to have done that hours ago. Rumor rushed through, pursued by uglier rumor still. The protector had returned, and she was in a frothing rage. She was visiting her shadows now. It was going to be another night of terror in the streets of Taglios. The women started talking about the possible wisdom of finishing work before the protector decided she had to see the Radisha. The protector would not respect the privacy of the princess. She made no secret of her contempt for Taglian custom. Even Narita seemed to hold the opinion that it would be best not to be where you could be seen when the protector was in a mood. At that point, Shiki discovered that her aunt was missing. Damn it, Subradil, Narita fumed. You promised you'd watch her closer the last time this happened. I'm sorry, mistress. I became so frightened. She probably decided to go to the kitchen. That was what she was trying to do when she got lost last time. Shiki was going already. Not more than a minute later, she called. I found her, mother. When the rest of the women arrived, they found Sawa seated against a wall, brass lamp in her lap, unconscious, with vomit all over her. Oh, no! Subradil cried. Not again! And in a whirlwind of nonsense and apparently vain efforts to get Sawa's attention, she got across the hint of a fear that Sawa might be pregnant after having been abused by one of the palace staff. Narita was away in seconds, fuming. Subradil and Shiki were right behind her, supporting Sawa between them, heading for the servant's postern. Nobody noticed that none of the women were carrying their gongishes. Not even the one that Subradil had forgotten the day before. Because of the state Sawa was in, and the state Narita was in, and the imminent explosion of displeasure expected from the protector, the women managed to draw their pay, then to escape without having to deal with Barandandi's kickback lieutenant again. They were able to lay Sawa inside a covered ox cart not long after they got into the twisty streets downhill from the palace. Subradil had to caution Shiki repeatedly against celebration. Chapter 38 Everything we did must have been seen by somebody, I told the gathered troops. When word gets out that the Radisha has vanished, all those people are going to remember and try to help. Soulcatcher is supposed to have a knack for separating wheat from chaff. Also a knack for calling up the kind of supernatural assistance that can pick your particular trail out of a thousand, Willow Swan volunteered. He was present because he had agreed to take care of the Radisha. She was going to be in a state when she awakened and discovered that her demons had caught up with her at last. Bondo Trang wanted to know, Are you going to flee or not? The old man was at the edge of collapse. He had been working since before dawn. Can we? I asked. You could go this instant if the situation became totally desperate. It will be a few hours yet before the barges are completely provisioned, however. Nobody wanted to go, though. Not just yet. A lot of the men had developed ties. Everyone had unfinished business. That was life. The same situation had come up time and again over the course of the company's history. Sara said, You still haven't gotten Narion to give you the key. I'll talk to him. Is River back yet? No. What about Kindo? How about Pooch and Spiff? We had people running all over on special assignments. Good old One-Eye had sent our last two men, the barely competent Pooch and Spiff, to assassinate Adu, the gate man, because Mergen had been able to determine that it had been he who had caused all the excitement at the library. More, Adu knew the general neighborhood where I lived. One-Eye informed me, Kindle Cutter is coming through the web right now. Arjana Drupada appears to be reasonably healthy for a man with a dozen knife wounds, 
Hang on. Mergen was whispering something. It was thundering and hailing outside. I could not hear a word. It started at Semke, Mergen says. Slink! Hit them just as they were starting to pitch camp. Cut them off from their weapons. Darn! I swore. Darn, darn, darn! What's the matter with you, little girl? He should have waited until they tried to do something to the Bodhi tree. This way, nobody will know why we jumped them. There's why you don't have you a man. What? You ask too much. You sent Slink out there to kill some people. Unless you told him it's got to be a show, all our guys allowed to fight only left-handed or something. He's going to do it fast and dirty, and with as little risk to our guys as he can. I thought he understood. Did you assume, little girl? At this late stage in your career? You, who's got to run a checklist on lacing your own boots? He had me, and he had me good. I tried to change the subject. If we decide to evacuate, we're going to have to run somebody out there to warn Slink and tell him where to rendezvous. Don't try to change the subject. I turned away. Kendo, does he need medical attention? Jupiter? He's not bleeding that much anymore. Then let's take him back to meet his new roommate. One eye catching me out had me feeling particularly evil. This seemed like a good time to take it out on the enemy. The rest of you, take real good care of the Radisha. We don't want her coming up with a hangnail anybody can blame on us. Cutter bobbed his head and muttered something under his breath. Hey, pervert, I called to the Inspector General of the Records. I don't want you ever to say that the Black Company don't cater to its guests. So here's your very own human play toy. Maybe a little longer in the tooth than you prefer, but it's only until the protector gets around to rescuing you. Kindo planted a boot in Drapada's behind and shoved. Into the cage, the Purohita went. He and Gokale backed off into opposite corners and glared at one another. Human nature being what it is, each man probably thought the other was responsible for his dismay. I told Kindo, Relax now. Get something to eat. Take a nap. But stay away from the girl. Hey, I got it the first time, sleepy. And more so now she started sleepwalking, so ease up. Give me a reason. Well, don't we just scrag her? Because we need Singh to help open the way through the Shadow Gate, and he won't unless he feels confident that we'll be good to the Daughter of Night. I don't know any of the captured that well. Don't feel like you've got to save them on my account. I feel like we have to save them on the company's account, Kendo. Just the same as we'd be doing if it was you out there. Sure, right. Kindo Cutter was one of those people who tended to look on the dark side no matter what. Get some rest. I went to talk with Narayan while I waited for Mergen to generate some report on what was happening inside the palace. I did not want to run away, but knew it was very close to time for the company to go. We had to see what Soulcatcher's reaction to the kidnapping would be, and we had to get Goblin out of the palace if Soulcatcher did not come after us like a screaming monsoon storm. I was going to get really worried about what she was up to. I've had a real good day, thank you, Mr. Singh. A whole lot of planning and a little inspired improvisation fell into place all at once. Just one thing more could make the day perfect. I sniffed the air. It smelled like one eye and friends were cooking up a new batch probably so they could take a little something along when we had to run. I kicked a bundle of hides of some kind over beside the bars of Singh's cage, settled myself. I caught him up on the latest gossip, including, None of your people seem to be worried about you, too. Maybe you were just a little too secretive. Be kind of pathetic if the whole cult faded away because everyone just sat around waiting to find out what was going on. 
I've been told that I'm free to deal with you. There was no cringe to the man tonight. He had gotten a little backbone somewhere. I'm prepared to discuss the object you seek if I receive absolute assurances that the Black Company will never do the Daughter of Night any harm. Never is an awful long time. You're out of luck. I got up. Goblin's been wanting to work on her just forever. I'm going to let him pull a few fingers off now to show you we have no conscience or remorse where certain old enemies are concerned. I offered you what you asked. You offered me a delayed death warrant. If I agree to that kind of nonsense, ten years from now the black-hearted witch will start poisoning us and we'll be stuck with the disastrous choice of keeping our word and accepting destruction or breaking our word and seeing our reputation destroyed. I'm certain you don't know much northern mythology. There's an old religion up there that tells how a leading god allowed himself to be slain so his family would no longer be bound by a promise he made foolishly to an enemy who wore it like a turtle shell. Narion stared at me, cold as a cobra, waiting for me to crack. And I did, a little, because I bothered to explain. One Eye has told me a hundred times that I should not explain. I just don't want that artifact badly enough to commit my people to the level of vulnerability that you're asking. In particular, I won't undertake commitments for those of us who are buried. On the other hand, maybe you'd like to undertake commitments whereby assuming you get out of this alive, you guarantee never to be a pain in the company neck ever again whereby you agree to go to the captain and the lieutenant and beg her forgiveness for stealing their child. The very suggestion appalled the living saint of the deceivers. She is the child of Kina, the daughter of night. Those two are irrelevant. Evidently, we don't have anything to talk about yet. I'll send you a few fingers for breakfast. I went to see if Surendranath Centaraxita was being a good fellow in pursuing the tasks I had suggested he could use to help overcome the tedium of his captivity. To my surprise, I found him hard at work, with old Baladitya assisting, translating what I had presumed to be the first volume of the Lost Annals. They had a whole stack of sheets already done. Dorabi, Master Centaraxita said. Excellent! Your friend the foreigner keeps telling us we can't have any more real vellum when we're done with these last few sheets. He wants us to use those ridiculous bark books they still employ out in the swamps. Before there were modern paper and vellum and parchment, there was bark. I do not know what kind of tree it came from, just that the inner bark was removed carefully, treated and pressed and used to write on. To make a book, you stacked the bark sheets drilled a hole down through the upper left-hand corner of the stack, then bound everything together with a cord of ribbon or length of very light chain. Bondo Trang would favor bark because it was both cheap, traditional, and hardier than animal products. I'll talk to him. There's nothing earth-shaking in there, Doraby. My name is Sleepy. Sleepy isn't a name. It's a disease or a misfortune. I prefer Doraby. I'll use Doraby. Use whatever you like. I'll know who you're talking to. I read a couple of sheets. He was right. This is tedious stuff. This looks like an account book. That's what it is, mainly. The things you want to know are just the things the writer assumes any reader of his own time would know already. He wasn't writing for the ages or even for another generation. He was keeping track of horseshoe nails, lance shafts, and saddles. All he has to say about their battle is that the lower-ranking officers and non-commissioned officers failed to demonstrate an adequate enthusiasm for appropriating weapons lost or abandoned by the defeated enemy, preferring to wait till the next dawn to begin gleaning. As a consequence... 
Stragglers and the local peasantry managed to scavenge all the best. I notice he doesn't bother to name a single name, person, or place. I had begun reading while the master talked. I could listen and read at the same time, even though I was a woman. He does give mileage and dates. The context suggests the appropriate systems of measure. It can be figured out. But what I've already started to wonder, Dora B., is why we've all been deathly afraid of these people all our lives. This book gives us no reason to be afraid. This book is about a troop of crabby little men who marched off somewhere they didn't want to go for reasons they didn't understand, fully believing that their unstated mission would last only several weeks or, at most, a few months. Then they would be able to go home. But the months piled into years, and the years into generations, and still they didn't really know. The material also suggested we needed to revise our old belief that the free companies exploded into the world at the same time, in a vast orgy of fire and bloodshed. The only other company mentioned was noted to have returned years before the black company marched, and in fact several senior company non-coms had served as private soldiers in that earlier unnamed band. I can see it, I grumbled. We're going to translate these things find out all sorts of things, and not be an inch closer to understanding anything. Santaraxita said, That's much more exciting than a meeting with the Badralok, Dorabi. Then Baladitya spoke for the first time. Do we have to starve to death here, Dorabi? Nobody brought you anything to eat? No. I'll just see about that. Don't be startled if you hear me shouting. I hope you enjoy fish and rice. I took care of that, then hid in my corner for a while. I was feeling a little depressed after having seen Master Centaraxita's work. I suppose that sometimes I invest too much in my goals, then suffer a correspondingly huge disappointment when things do not work out. Chapter 39 Tobo woke me. How can you sleep, sleepy? I guess I must be tired. What do you want? The protector has finally started to grumble about the Radisha. Dad wants you to come keep track yourself, so you don't have to record anything third hand. At the moment, my name felt entirely appropriate. I just wanted to lie down on my pallet and dream about finding another kind of life. Trouble was, I had been doing this since I was fourteen. I did not know anything else, unless Master Centaraxita was willing to let bygones be bygones and take me back at the library. Right after we buried Soul Catcher in a fifty-foot deep hole, we filled in with boiling lead. I dragged a stool in between Sara and One Eye leaning forward with my elbows on the table and stared into the mist where Mergen appeared to report when it suited him. One eye was fussing at Mergen, even though Mergen was away. I said, Anybody would think you were worried about Goblin, the way you're carrying on. Of course I'm worried about Goblin, little girl. The runt borrowed my transidetic locator before he went up there this morning. Not to mention he still owes me several thousand pace for... Well, he owes me a bunch of money. My recollection had it the other way round. One eye always owed everyone, even when he was doing well. And several thousand pace is not exactly a fortune. A pay being a tiny seed of such uniform weight that it is used as a measure for gems and precious metals. It takes almost 2,000 of them to equal a northern ounce. Since one eye had not specified gold or silver, the standard assumption would be that he had meant coin-grade copper. In other words, not very much. In other words, still, he was worried about his best friend, but he could not say so because he had a century-long history of reviling the man in public. If there was any such magical instrument as a transidetic locutor, one eye invented it an hour before he loaned it to Goblin. He muttered, 
That ugly little turd gets himself killed. I'm going to strangle him. He can't leave me holding the bag on. He realized he was thinking out loud. Sarah and I both made mental notes to investigate the bag metaphor. It sounded like there were business plans afoot. Secret plans. Surprise, surprise. Mergen materialized practically nose to nose with me. He murmured, Soulcatcher is out of patience. A flock of crows just brought the news from Semke. She's in a complete black mood. She says she's going into the Radish's anger chamber after her if she doesn't come out in the next two minutes. Hey, Goblin! One eye barked. Hiding, Mergen replied. Waiting for sunrise. He was not going to try leaving during the night, the way we had planned originally. Soulcatcher had loosed her shadows just to punish Taglios for irritating her. We had a few traps out, randomly distributed through likely neighborhoods, but I did not expect to catch anything. I figured our luck along those lines was about used up. Goblin was armed with a shadow-repellent amulet left over from the Shadow Master Wars, but did not know if it was any good anymore. Being bright and full of forethought, it had not occurred to any of us to test it on real shadows while we had some in stock. You cannot think of everything, but you should make the effort. One of the royal guards actually tried to stop the protector when her patience failed, and she went to dig the Radisha out of her hideaway. He went down without a sound, stricken by a casual touch. He would recover eventually. The protector was not feeling particularly vindictive for the moment. She crashed through the door of the anger chamber and howled in frustration before the pieces finished falling. Where is she? The power of her rage wilted the onlookers. A subassistant chamberlain, bowing almost double, continuing to bob and get lower, whined, she was in there, oh great one. Someone else insisted. We never saw her leave. She has to be in there. From somewhere echoing almost as if coming from some distance in time as well as place, there was the sound of brief laughter. Soulcatcher turned slowly, her stare a cruel spear. Come closer. Tell me again. Her voice was compelling, chilling, terrible. She stared into one pair of eyes after another, making full use of the fear so many had that she could read the deepest secrets in their minds. None of the Radish's people changed their stories. Out of here. Out of this whole apartment. Something happened here. I want no distractions. I want nothing disturbed. She turned again, slowly, extending a sorceress's senses to feel the shape of the past. It was more difficult than she anticipated. She had been loafing for too long, falling out of practice and getting out of shape. The remote laughter sounded again for an instant, seeming just a touch closer. You! Soulcatcher snapped at a fat woman, one of the housekeepers. What are you doing? Ma'am? Narita was barely able to croak her response. In a moment, she would lose control of her bladder. You just pushed something into your left sleeve, something off the altar. A single white candle, almost consumed, still burned in the tiny shrine to ancestors. Come here. Soulcatcher extended her gloved right hand. Narita could not resist. She stepped toward the dark woman, so trim and evilly feminine in her leather. Idly, Narita hated her for maintaining that sleek body. Give it to me. Reluctantly, Narita removed the gangisha from her sleeve. She began to babble about not wanting her friend to get into trouble, making no sense at all, failing to realize that if she had not tried to conceal the gangisha, the protector would have overlooked it entirely. Soulcatcher stared at the little clay figurine. The cleaning woman. 
It belongs to the cleaning woman. Where is she? Far mocking laughter. She's a day employee, ma'am. She comes in from outside. Where does she live? I don't know, ma'am. I don't think anybody does. Nobody ever asked. It never mattered. One of the other staffers offered. She was a good worker. Soulcatcher continued to examine the Gangisha. Something's odd here. Now it does matter. To me. Find out. How? I don't care. Be creative. But do it. Soulcatcher hurled the clay figurine to the floor. Shards flew in every direction. A wisp of a ghost of darkness curled up and stood like a rampant cobra a foot high for an instant. Then it struck at the protector. The staffers squealed and began trampling one another, trying to get away. They had not seen a shadow before, but they knew what a shadow could do. The laughter was closer now, louder and lasting longer. Soulcatcher offered a convincing squeal of surprise and fright, like a young woman who had just stepped on a snake. Her apparel and the handful of generalized protective spells that always surrounded her saved her from becoming a victim of her own cruelest weapon. Even so, for a minute she was like a child swatting mosquitoes as the shadow enthusiastically strove to terminate their relationship. Failing to reclaim control of the shadow, Soulcatcher destroyed it. The necessity told her that a pretty clever mind had prepared it, probably hoping that she would be too angry to pay close attention for just that instant needed. Woman, come back here! The protector extended a hand in the direction Narita had fled. Somehow a single strand of the woman's hair had become entwined through Soulcatcher's fingers. Those fingers shimmered momentarily. The air became charged. The other staffers whimpered, and wished they had even had the nerve to try to run. Narita reappeared slowly, taking short zombie steps. Here, Soulcatcher said. She pointed at a spot on the anger chamber floor. The rest of you, go away quickly. She did not have to add any encouragement. Fat woman, tell me everything about the creature who always carried the Gangisha. I've told you everything I know, Narita whined. No, you have not. Start talking. She may have kidnapped the Radisha. Soulcatcher regretted mentioning that the instant the words left her helmet. The laughter sounded like it was coming from just out in the hallway, a diabolic snickering. The protector's head twitched toward that direction. She sensed no threat. It could wait a minute. Her name is Min Subradil. It took Narita only another thirty seconds to relate everything she knew about Min Subradil, her daughter Shikandini, and her sister-in-law Sawa. Thank you, Soulcatcher snarled. You've been most unhelpful, and for that I shall provide an appropriate reward. She gripped the fat woman's throat in her right hand. Squeezed. As Narita went limp and laughter sounded once more, there might have been a word there, too. Ardath? Or perhaps Silath? Or might it have been? No matter. Soulcatcher would not listen to that, just to the mockery. She hurled herself toward the sound, but when she burst into the hallway, there was nothing to see. She started to call for guards, for greys, but recalled that she had just slain the one person other than herself who knew for sure that the Radisha had disappeared. The Radisha had shut herself away from the world. That was all anybody really needed to know. The princess could live forever right there in her anger chamber. She did not need to venture forth ever again. She had her good friend the protector to handle the boring chores of managing her empire for her. More laughter, apparently from nowhere and everywhere. Soulcatcher stamped away. This was not over yet. 
A white crow dropped out of the murk near the ceiling of the hallway, flapped heavily, landed beside the fat woman. It held its beak poised beneath her nostrils momentarily, as though checking for breath. Then it flapped away suddenly, sharp ears having caught the sound of a stealthy footfall. A shivering Jal Barandandi eased into the chamber. He knelt beside the woman. He took her hand. He remained there, tears streaking his cheeks, until he heard the protector returning, arguing with herself in a variety of voices. Chapter 40 What do you know about that? I said to Sarah. Narita tried to cover for you, and then Barandandi got all broken up about what happened to her. Sara waggled a finger. She was thinking. Morgan, what do you know about that white crow? Morgan hesitated before responding. Nothing. Which meant he was telling an approximate truth, but he had some definite ideas. Sara and I both knew him that well. Sara said, Suppose you tell me what you think is going on then. Mergen faded away. What the heck is that? I snapped at one eye. You were supposed to rig this thing so he has to do what he's told. He does, most of the time. He could be carrying out the previous instruction. But the old fool sounded to me like he had no idea what Mergen was doing. Soulcatcher worked quickly then summoned the staff members who had been present when she had broken into the anger chamber. The continuing excitement was too much for this poor woman. I've tried to resurrect her, but her soul refuses to respond. She must be happy where she is now. There were no witnesses to contradict her, though remote laughter mocked her. I did find the Radisha. She'd fallen asleep. She has retreated into the anger chamber and does not wish to be disturbed again. Not for a long time. I should have honored her wishes before. We would have avoided this disaster. She indicated the fat woman. Even the staffers who had looked into the anger chamber earlier and had seen nothing had to admit that someone was inside now, moving around angrily, muttering the way the Radisha did, and looking very much like the Radisha in glimpses caught through cracks in the poorly restored door. The protector suggested... Let's all turn in for the night. Tomorrow we'll begin repairing the mess I made. She watched her audience intently, feeling for anyone who could cause trouble. The staff departed. They were relieved just to be away from Soulcatcher. Soulcatcher sat down and thought. There was no way to tell what was going through her mind till she began muttering in a committee of voices. Then it was clear that she was trying to work out the mechanics of the abduction. She seemed willing to give considerable weight to the possibility that the Radisha had stage-managed the whole thing herself. A very suspicious woman, the protector. One by one, she found and questioned each of the people who had dealt with Min Subradil, Sawa, and Shikandini, beginning with Jal Barandandi and finishing with Del Mukarji. The man Barandandi usually trusted to collect the kickbacks from the outside workers. You will cease that, the protector informed Mukherjee. You and anyone else involved. If it happens again, I will put you into a glass ball and hang you above the service postern with your whole body turned inside out. I'll add a couple of imps to feed on your entrails for the six months it will take you to die. Do you understand? Del Mukherjee understood the threat just fine but he had no idea whatsoever why the protector would want to interfere with his livelihood. The protector had a passion about corruption. In time, the protector reasoned that three women had come into the palace and three women had gone away again. It seemed very likely that the three women who had departed were not the three women who had entered, and no one the Radish's size had gone out since, which meant that someone with some answers might still be inside. Chuckling wickedly, Soulcatcher began to look for evidence that someone had slipped off into the untenanted wilds of the palace. Goblin was asleep on a dusty old bed. Occasionally his snores would turn to sneezes and snorts when too much dust got into his nostrils. 
A squawk had him bouncing up so suddenly he almost collapsed from lightheadedness. He spun around. He saw nothing. He heard soft laughter, then a bizarre squawking voice that sounded almost familiar. Wake up! Wake up! She is coming! Who's coming? Who's talking? There was no response. He did not feel any strong sorceress presence. It was a puzzle. Goblin had a good idea who might be coming, though. Not many women were likely to be hunting him here in the middle of the night. He was ready. His little pack was carrying the two books Sleepy most wanted to save. Taking all three was physically impossible. His traps were set. All he had to do was move on into the now empty part of the palace that had been occupied by the Black Company back when its staff and leadership had been quartered there. There were ways to get out unnoticed. He and One Eye had found them in olden times. The trouble was, he had no desire to be on the streets after dark, amulet or no. Soulcatcher gave up most of her sense of touch when she chose to wrap every inch of her body in leather and helmet. She never noted the touch of or resistance of the strand of spider silk stretched across the corridor. But she did have a marvelously well-developed sense for personal danger. Before the gongisha hit the floor, she was moving to defend herself. It was such reflexes that made it possible for creatures like her, her sister Lady, and the Howler to have survived for so long. This time she had the proper controlling spells ready, hung about her, sparkling like spanking new tools. The shadow trapped inside the figurine barely got its bearings before it was attacked itself, seized and constrained, then twisted and crushed down into a whining, seething ball completely enclosed inside one of the protector's gloved hands. A merry young voice called, You'll have to do better than that! Soulcatcher continued to move forward, amused by the idea of tossing the shadow back into someone's face. The trail began to grow indistinct, then disorienting. Experimentation showed her the cause was external. The corridor had been strewn with cobwebs of spells, so subtle that even she might not have noticed had she just been hurrying along. Oh, you clever devils! How long has this been here? Ah, a very long time indeed, I see. You were still in favor when you started this. Have you been hiding here all along? I certainly couldn't find you in the city if you never were out there. In another voice entirely, she asked, What have we here? It smells like somebody very frightened is hiding behind this door. And he didn't even bother to lock it. How stupid does he think I am? She shoved the door with her toe. A clay gongisha plummeted from its place atop the door. Soulcatcher giggled. She was even quicker to recapture this shadow, which she squeezed down inside her other hand. Then she pushed into the room. There was no one there anymore. That was easy to sense. But there was a curious feel to the place. It demanded an investigation. She generated a small light, stood in place, turned slowly while she read the history of the room for subtle clues. A great deal had happened there. Much of the recent history of the Black Company had been shaped in that room. It retained a strong smell of old fear she identified eventually with the long-dead Taglian court wizard Smoke. All this she debated with herself in a committee of argumentative voices. In the end, she seemed entertained. Most of the time, life was a great entertainment for Soul Catcher. And what do we have here? Something with inked characters on it peeped from beneath a dusty old bed where someone had been lying until minutes ago. Thoughtlessly, she reached for the object, opened her hand to grasp it. Damn! That was stupid! She wasted several minutes regaining control of the shadow. It was very agile this time. She stuffed it into the hand restraining the other. The two were extremely unhappy in there. One thing shadows seemed to hate more than the living was other shadows. 
What Soulcatcher had found was a book with half the pages torn out. It was alone. So, this is what became of those. I was never quite sure who took them. I wonder if they got any use out of them. As she was about to depart, the protector glanced at the damaged book once more. Been taking these pages a few at a time. That would take a long time, which means they've been coming in and out of the palace for a long time, which therefore suggests that the Radisha didn't engineer her own disappearance. Oh, well. She's gone. It amounts to the same thing. Let's catch our little rat and let him play with our little friends. Unlike Soul Catcher, Goblin could not see in the dark. But he had the advantage of knowing where he was going. He did manage to stay ahead and did slide out of one of the old hidden exits. There was a little light outside from a fragment of moon peeking through scurrying young clouds trying to catch up with Mother Storm. Goblin laid the last Gangisha on the cobblestones in plain sight, then ran. The books on his back beat against him, pounding the breath out of him. He muttered something about the good news being that it was all downhill from here. The bad news was that it was dark out. There were shadows on the prowl, and he was not so sure about the quality of his fifteen-year-old amulet. He had to hope that in a city this vast, none of the handful of night stalkers would cross his path while he was huffing and puffing and concentrating on staying ahead of Soul Catcher. It did not occur to him that she might have recovered the shadows he had left in ambush, that they might be after him too. Soulcatcher stepped into the night, close enough behind to glimpse a flicker of her quarry vanishing into the shadows between structures across the open area outside the palace. She spied the abandoned Gangisha and several other small items that looked like they had been dropped in the rush to get away. She tossed her two shadows into the air and stomped her heel down on the clay figurine at the same time. This would set a pack of small deaths on the little man's heels. By now, she was reasonably certain that she was chasing the wizard called Goblin. She screamed. The pain in her heel was beyond anything she had ever experienced. As she collapsed, trying to will her throat to seal itself, she watched three ferociously bright balls of light streak into the night in pursuit of the shadows she had sent to claim Goblin. Still fighting the incredible pain, she produced a dagger and used its tip to dip another fireball out of her heel. Already it had eaten all the way to the bone and in, and had done some damage as high as her ankle, despite her normal protection. I'll be crippled, she snarled. He lulled me. He set me up so I'd think this would be another easy shadow trap. None of her voices were amused now. Clever little bastard will pay for this. The fallen fireball burned its way into the cobblestones. Still ignoring her pain, Soulcatcher tried to stand. She discovered that she was not going to be able to walk. She was, however, not losing any blood. The fireball had cauterized her wound. My beloved sister, if you weren't already dead, I'd kill you for inventing those damned things. Laughter echoed down the ramparts of the palace. A flicker of white glided after Goblin. I think I'll kill somebody anyway. Soulcatcher made her way toward the palace entrance on hands and knees, muttering continuously. She had isolated her pain in a remote corner of her mind and was now concentrating on being angry about what this odyssey was doing to her beautiful leather pants and gloves. Chapter 41 Can you believe that? I asked. She was as mad about ruining her outfit as she was about losing Goblin and getting hurt. One Eye chuckled, immensely relieved because Goblin had gotten away. I believe it. What? You too? It's a northern thing. Everything she wears is leather. You people are all goofy about stuff like that. She probably has to fly 5,000 miles every time she wants a new pair of pants. Means she's really got to watch her waist and behind. Unlike some. Hey! No punching! 
We're all on the same side here. Do you believe this little pervert? I asked Sarah. You go ask Swan, one eye showed me his tooth. The one he was about to lose. He'll tell you the woman's got her good points. Sarah remained all business. What are we going to do if she just pretends the Radisha is all right? How many people normally see the princess? Not many, I know. And there's no privy council anymore. We've seen to them. Except for Mogaba. We've got to see about him, too, one eye grumbled. Let's not overreach. The great general would be harder to take than the others were. I mused. She wouldn't actually have to keep the Radisha in hiding very long. Maybe two weeks, while she builds a new council, handpicked to woof yes, ma'am, and how high, when she tells them to jump. One eye blew out a bushel of air. She's right. Maybe we should have considered that. I said, I did consider it. Having the Radisha under our control looked like the best deal. We can trot her out any time Soulcatcher gets too bizarre, and Soulcatcher will realize that. She won't let temptation carry her too far, not until she sorts us out. She will do everything she can to find and recover the Radisha, Sarah said. I'm sure of that, which means we need to hurry up and get out of the city. I said, I have one little thing to do before I go. Don't anybody wait on me. Mergen, be a pal and put a little real effort into finding out about this other white crow. I did not await his response. Now that Goblin seemed safe, I was eager to interview our newest prisoner. Someone had taken some effort to make the Radisha comfortable. Nor had she been forced into a cage. Presumably, one eye had provided a sampler of choker spells. I studied her while she remained unaware of my presence. She had had a formidable reputation when first the company had come to Taglios. She had put up a good struggle, too, but the years had worn her down. She looked old and tired and defeated now. I stepped forward. Have they treated you well so far, Radisha? She showed me a weak smile. There was a twinkle both of anger and sarcasm in her eye. I know, it's not the palace, but I've enjoyed worse, including chains and no roof at all. And animal hides? I've lived here for the last six years. You get used to it. It had been longer than that, but I was not taking time to be precise. Why? Water sleeps, Radisha. Water sleeps. You were expecting us. We had to come. At that point, it became completely real to her. Her eyes grew big. I've seen you before. Many times. Lately around the palace. Once upon a time, long ago, around the palace also, with the standard bearer. You're the idiot. Am I? Perhaps one of us... She began to grow angry then. I told her, that won't help. But if you need to rage to feel better, consider this. The protector is covering up your disappearance already. The one person who knew for sure, not counting us villains, of course, is dead already. There'll be more deaths, and you'll begin making the most outrageous pronouncements from the anonymity of your anger chamber. And in six months... The protector will be so solidly in control behind her greys and those who think they can profit from an alliance with her that you won't matter anymore. As long as Soulcatcher could come to an accommodation with Mogaba. I did not mention that. The Radisha began to speak quite rudely of her ally. I let her run for a while, then offered another slogan. All their days are numbered. What the hell does that mean? Sooner or later, we're going to get everyone who injured us. You're right. It's not really sane, but it's the way we are. You've seen it happening lately. Only the Protector and the Great General are still running free. All their days are numbered.
The reality sank in a little deeper. She was a captive. She did not know where. She did not know what was going to happen. She did not know that her captors were willing to pursue their grudges to insane lengths, just as they had promised they would, before she made the mistake of letting herself be seduced by Soul Catcher's deadly promises. You have no designated heir, do you? The change of direction startled her. What? There isn't any clear-cut line of succession. Again, what? At the moment, I don't just hold you hostage. I have the entire future of Taglios and the Taglian territories firmly under my thumb. You don't have a child. Your brother has no child. I'm too old for that now. Your brother isn't. And he is still alive. I left her then. To think, her mouth hanging open. I considered seeing Narion sing again. Decided I would seem too eager. I was too tired anyway. You do not treat with a deceiver without full command of your faculties. Sleep was the lover whose arms I needed to wrap me up. Chapter 42 I was playing Tonk with Spiff and Jojo and Kendo Cutter, an interesting mix. At least three of us took our religion somewhat seriously. Jojo's real name was Cho Dai Cho. He was Nguyen Bo and, in theory, One-Eye's bodyguard. One-Eye did not want a bodyguard. Jojo did not want to be a bodyguard, so they did not see much of one another. And the rest of us saw as little of Jojo as we did of Uncle Doge. Jojo complained, You're just ganging up on the dumb swamp boy, I know. I said, Me getting cahoots with a heretic and an unbeliever? You'll ambush them after you finish picking my bones. I had been having an unusual run of luck. Everybody resents it when their favorite mark gets lucky. I said, I can't get used to this not having to go to work. Jojo discarded a six I needed to fill in to the inside of a five-card straight. Maybe this is my day. Be a good time to get out and find you a man, then. Goblin, you're still alive. As mad as Soulcatcher was last night, I figured she would have you for a midnight snack before you got halfway home. Goblin gave me his big frog grin. She's gonna walk funny for a while. I couldn't believe she actually stomped on it. His grin faded. I've been thinking. Maybe nailing her that way was a mistake. I could have led her somewhere where we could have got her in a crossfire. She would have been looking for that. In fact, her suspecting something like that was probably one reason she didn't keep chasing you. You want to sit in? All three of my companions glowered. Goblin was not one eye, but they did not trust him a bit. They knew with the confidence of ignorance that Goblin was just more clever when he cheated. The fact that his history was one of losing more than he won was just a part of the cover-up. You might have noticed that the human animal is fond of forming and clinging to prejudices, remaining their steadfast curator in the face of all reason and contradiction. Not this time, Goblin could take a hint. He would also take them some other way sometime and laugh himself silly behind his hand, and it would serve them right. Got work to do. I'm already getting complaints from everybody about a ghost that was all over the warehouse last night. Got to scope it out. I had a losing hand, or foot. I tossed it in. He's making me feel guilty for loafing. I collected my winnings. You can't quit now, Kindo grumbled. You proved your point. Women can't play cards. I stay here much longer. I won't have a copper left to my name. Then you wouldn't get a birthday present this year. Didn't get one last year either. I must have played Tonk with you then, too. So many of you do it. I have a hard time keeping track of which ones of you guys keep beating up on me. They all grumbled now. Goblin said, 
Maybe I can sit in, just for a hand or two. That's all right. You better help Sleepy, or Sleepy can help you. The grumbling stopped till we were out of earshot. Goblin chuckled, so did I. He said, We ought to get married. I'm too old for you. See if Chandra Gokhale can fix you up. Aren't those two like a couple of starving rats? Gokhale and Drupada were at one another constantly. Their squabbles had not yet devolved into anything physical, only because they had been warned in the strongest of terms that the winner of any fight would be punished terribly. Maybe one of them will kill and eat the other one, I said. If we're lucky. You're a dreamer for sure. What's your opinion on this ghost? He shrugged. You know it's the girl, don't you? I'm pretty sure. You think she's going through the same thing Mergen did when he started? Falling through time and everything? I don't know. There's a difference. Nobody ever saw anything with Mergen. Can you stop her from doing it? Spooking you out? In the sense that I'm scared she'll go out and get help, sure. Oh. I didn't think about that. Do think about it, goblin. What about the white crow? Could she be the white crow? I thought Mergen was the white crow. He knew better. Mergen's here, being Sarah's recon slave. It wouldn't be the first time Mergen was in the same place, looking at things from two different times. He tells me he can't remember being the crow. Maybe that's because he hasn't done it yet. Maybe it's a Mergen from next year or something. I did not know what to say to that. That possibility had not occurred to me, and Mergen had done that sort of thing before. On the other hand, personally, I don't think it's Mergen or the brat. He grinned his big toad grin. He knew I would stub my toe on that. I did. What? You little rat. Who is it then? He shrugged. I got a couple ideas, but I'm not ready to talk about them yet. You got the annals. All you need to follow my reasoning is right in there. He began giggling, pleased with himself for stumping the analyst at her own game, so to speak. Ha <laughs> ha! He spun around, dancing. Let's go beat up on Narion Singh. Oh, look who's here. Swan, you're too damned old to wear your hair that long. Unless you're going to comb it all up on top there to kind of cover the thin spot. I held a finger above Goblin's dome, pointing down. He had not had a crop come in during my lifetime. Swan said, Kind of looks like your widow's peak is sagging back a little too. Probably comes from banging your head on the bottoms of so many tables. Swan looked at me, an eyebrow raised. He been in the ganja or something? No. He just hasn't gotten over the fact that he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with your girlfriend and came out ahead on points. Swan had suggested a good point indirectly, though. With hemp such a common weed, it was a wonder that Goblin and One-Eye had not gotten in on the entertainment side of that crop. Goblin understood what I was thinking without me saying a word. He told me, We don't have anything to do with it because it screws up your head. And that water buffalo urine you brew back there doesn't? That's pure medicine, Sleepy. You ought to try it. It's chock full of stuff that's good for you. My diet is just fine, Goblin, except for the fish and the rice. That's what I'm saying. We take up a collection, buy us a pig. Never mind what Sarah says. There ain't nothing sweeter than some fat back and beans. Swan had invited himself to accompany us in our 70-foot trek to Narion's cage. He said, I'll kick in on that myself. I haven't tasted bacon in over 20 years. Shit, Goblin said. You're going to kick in? Man, you don't even have a name anymore. You're dead. I could run up to the palace, dig around under my mattress. Times haven't been all bad for me. You won't marry me, Sleepy, Goblin said. And you ought to marry Swan. He's got a horde put back, and he's too damn old to bother you with any of that man stuff. 
Narayan Singh, get your skinny, shit-smelling ass up from there and talk to me, Swan whispered. Survival must be a real powerful drug. I expect it is when you're goblins age, I agreed. I guess it is at any age. Meaning, I asked. Meaning, I guess I should have headed back north a long time ago. I got nothing going for me here. I should have started moseying when Blade and Cordy went down, but I couldn't. And it wasn't just Soul Catcher twisting my arm. Um, I'm a loser. We were all losers, all three of us. We couldn't even make it as soldiers in the old empire. We deserted. Blade got his ass thrown to the crocodiles for smarting off to the priests back in his home country. We never had no real startup, any of us. Me and Cordy only headed on down here because once we got to running, it took a long time to stop. Now I don't have my friends anymore. I don't have anybody to goose me into doing things. I did not enlighten him about the health of Blade and Mather, who were among the captured, but I did point out, you can't be entirely inadequate. You've had some kind of commission or other from the Taglian throne practically since you got here. I'm an outsider. I make a great fall guy. Everybody knows who I am and everybody can recognize me. So the protector or the Radisha puts me out in front where I can take the heat for all their unpopular decisions. Now they'll need to find somebody else. Don't give me that look. I wouldn't join the Black Company if you promised to marry me and make me captain, too. You guys got doom written all over you. What do you want? Me? Since I don't got the stones or the young body to go home anymore, and home wouldn't be there when I showed up anyway, what I'd like to do is what we tried to do when we first came down here. Set me up a little brewery. Spend my last few years making people's lives a little easier. I'm sure Goblin and One-Eye would be happy to take on a partner. Them too? No way. They'd drink up half the product. They'd get drunk and get in a fight and start throwing the barrels at each other. He had a point. You have a point. Though they've shown considerable self-control lately. It helps you pay attention if your fuck-up will get you killed. I'm always surprised by this guy. He meant Narayan Singh. He looks like such a trivial little wart. There are 10,000 that look just like him out there on the streets right now. And not one will ever do anything more important than starve to death. If I thought it would do any good, I'd starve this one to death too. Narian, I'm back. Are you going to talk to me today? Singh raised his eyes. He seemed serene, at peace. That could be said for stranglers. They never had trouble with their consciences. Good morning, young woman. Yes, we can talk. I took your advice. I went to the goddess, and she approved your petition. Frankly, I was surprised. She set down no special conditions for making a bargain. Other than that... The lives and well-being of her chief agents remain unimpaired. Swan was more taken aback than I was. You got the right guy here, Sleepy? I don't know. I figured they'd still try to weasel a little even after they couldn't stall anymore. This required a little thought, or a lot of thought, and maybe some worry. I'm definitely pleased. Narion, definitely. Where's the key? Narion smiled, a smile almost as ugly as one eyes. I'll take you to it. Aha, I murmured. I see. The first shoe drops. Fine. When will you be ready to travel? As soon as the girl recovers? You may have noticed she's been sick. Yes, I did. I thought it must be her time of the month. A horrible, horrible thought occurred to me. She's not pregnant, is she? 
The look on Singh's face told me that notion was completely unthinkable to him. That's good. But it doesn't matter, Narayan. As long as we're conspiring together, deceivers and black company, you two aren't going to be a team. It's a sad truth, Narayan Singh. But I just don't trust you. And her I wouldn't trust if she was in her grave. He smiled like he knew a secret. But you expect us to trust you. Based on the well-known fact that once it has sworn a thing, the company always keeps its word, yes. A slight exaggeration, of course. Narion glanced at Swan for just a second. He smiled again. I guess that's just going to have to be good enough for me. I pasted on my most scintillating false smile. Wonderful. We're in business together. I'll get some people ready for an expedition. Do we have far to go? Smile. Not far. Just a few days south of the city. Ha! The Grove of Doom. I should have guessed. I led Swan away. I rejoined the fellows at the card table. I want Singh's son brought in as soon as we can get him. It could not hurt to have a little extra ammunition. Chapter 43 I don't know what to do with myself. Not having to work, Sarah told me. She and Tobo were huddled in front of the mist box, sharing what they could with Mergen. I was pleased to see mother and son getting along. I suggested, There's always work for those who want to put out the buttons that'll remind everyone about us after we're gone. There's always something that needs lugging down to the river. To paraphrase Goblin, I don't miss work so much I'm actually going to volunteer to do some. Was there something? The guys just brought in Singh's son. Good-looking fellow. They also brought in a couple of rescripts they found posted on the official announcement pillars. Put up since the Radisha went into seclusion. What do they say? Mainly that she's willing to pay some pretty big rewards for information leading to the apprehension of any member of the gang of vandals masquerading as members of the long-defunct Black Company and causing public disorders. Will anybody believe that? If she says it often enough... I don't care about her telling tall tales. I care about the reward offers. There are people out there who'd sell their mothers. She puts a couple of no goods on the street throwing money around and bragging about how they cashed in. Somebody who really knows something might decide to bet the long odds. Then why don't we just go? There isn't that much more we can do here anyway, is there? We can get Mogaba. Let the world think that. Start a rumor. Start a bunch of rumors about the great general and about the Radisha. While we evacuate. When are you leaving to get the key? I'm not sure. Soon. I'm stalling for time. So a message can get through to Slink. Sarah nodded. She smiled. Good thinking. Singh will have something up his sleeve. Willow Swan suddenly invited himself to join us. The girl is having some kind of a problem. I scowled at him. Sarah did the same, but was polite enough to ask, The daughter of night? What kind of problem? I think she's having a fit. A seizure-like. Perfect timing, I grumbled. At the same time, Sarah yelled for Tobo to get Goblin. I growled, what are you doing anywhere near her, Swan? He showed some color and said, Uh... Ah, oh, you dumb mud sucker! Lady did you in. You panted after her for years. Then you put the screws to a dozen million people by letting Lady's baby sister threaten to blow in your ear. Now you're going to let Lady's brat put a ring in your nose and make an even bigger idiot out of you? 
You really are stupid and pathetic, Swan. I was just thinking with something that isn't your brain. As though you're some dopey 15-year-old. This woman isn't some cute little virgin, Swan. She's worse than your worst nightmare. Come here. He came. I moved suddenly, violently, the way I had wanted to do so many times with my uncles. The tip of my dagger penetrated the skin underneath his chin. Do you really want to die a really stupid, humiliating, pointless death? Let me know. I'll arrange it. Without the rest of us having to pay the price again. One eye's cackle filled the air. It's your wonder, Swan. You ought to think about her instead of your usual black widows. He was in Do Trang's spare wheelchair again, but getting around under his own power. I could arrange something pointless and humiliating for you too, old man. He just laughed at me. You invited the soldier Aridatha down here to meet his long-lost daddy, Sleepy. You ought to be dealing with him instead of here flirting with Swan. He could be maddening at times, and he loved it. If he could find any kind of lever at all. I told Swan, you explain to One Eye what you mean about the girl. One Eye, deal with it. Solve it. Short of killing her. Singh won't give me the key if we kill the skinny little... witch. Chapter 44 Darn. Aridatha Singh was almost enough to make me change my mind about swearing off men. He was gorgeous. Tall, well-proportioned, a beautiful smile that showed magnificent teeth, even when he was under stress. His manners were perfect. He was a gentleman in every sense but condition of birth. I told him, Your mother must have been a marvel. Excuse me? Nothing, nothing. Around here I'm called Sleepy. You're Aridatha. That's enough of an introduction. Who are you people? Why am I here? He did not bluster or threaten. Amazing. Few Taglians ever recognize that as a waste of time. It isn't necessary for you to know who we are. You're here to meet a man who is also our prisoner. Don't mention the fact that you'll be released after your interview. He won't be. Come with me. Moments later, Aridatha Singh remarked, You're a woman, aren't you? I was the last time I checked. We're here. This is Narayan. Narayan, get up. You have a visitor. Narayan, this is Aridatha. As promised. Aridatha looked at me, trying to understand. Narayan stared at the sun he had never seen and saw something there that made him melt just for an instant. And I knew that I could reach him if I could keep it from looking like I was asking him to betray Kina. I stepped back and waited for something to happen. Nothing did. Aridatha kept glancing back at me. Narayan just stared. Out of patience, at last, I asked Narayan, Shall I send people to collect Kaditya, and Sugriva as well, and their children too? This threatened Narayan, and told Aridatha that he had been abducted because he belonged to a particular family. I recognized the instant the truth occurred to him. There was an entirely different look in his eyes when he glanced back at me again. I said, not much good can be said about this man, from my point of view. But you can't call him a bad father. Fate never gave him the chance to be good or bad. Except to the girl, for whom he had done everything possible to her complete indifference. He's very loyal. Aridatha realized that this was not about him at all. That he was a lever meant to get some kind of movement out of Narayan Singh. The Narayan Singh, the infamous chief of the Strangler cult. Aridatha won my heart all over again when he squared up his shoulders, stepped forward and offered his father a formal greeting. There was no warmth in it, but it was absolutely proper. 
I watched them try to find some common ground, some point at which to start. And they found it quickly enough. We had not found any evidence, ever, to disdain Narayan Singh's affections for his lily. Aridatha thought quite highly of his mother. The man's a piece of work, isn't he? I was startled. I had not heard a sound, but River Walker was behind me. River did not have much talent for light-footing it, which left me with the perfectly scary notion that Aridatha Singh really was having an effect on me. Yes, he is, and I don't quite know why. Well, I'll tell you. He reminds me of Willow Swan, a bedrock decent guy, only smart, and still young enough to be unspoiled by life. River! You should hear yourself talk. You're halfway intelligent. Don't mention it in front of the guys. One eye will figure out why he can't cheat me at Tonk more than half the time. He considered Aridatha again. Pretty, too. Better keep him away from your librarian. They'll elope on you. Another broken heart. You think? What kind of clues? Oh, I don't know. I could be wrong. When does he have to be back? Can we keep him all night? You figuring on testing him out? River did not usually rag me much, so I knew I had to be asking for it somehow. No, not that way. The villain in me came up with an idea. We introduce him to the Radisha before we turn him loose. Now you're matchmaking? No. Now I'm showing a four-square guy that his ruler isn't in the palace. He can make the rumors credible, because he can tell the truth. Couldn't hurt. You keep an eye on those two here. I'll go talk to the woman. Riverwalker raised an eyebrow. Nobody but Swan used that term to describe the Radisha anymore. You're picking up bad habits. Probably. Chapter 45 I found the Radisha lost inside herself, not asleep, not meditating, just wandering around inside, probably feeling immensely guilty about having been relieved by her recent lack of stress. I felt a moment of compassion. She and her brother might be our foes, but they were sound people at heart. Raja Dharma had been bred into them. Ma'am? She was due respect, but I could not use princely titles. I need to speak to you. She raised her eyes slowly. They seemed to be knowing, caring eyes, even in despair. Were all of my household staff my enemies? We didn't choose to become your enemies. And even today we honor and respect the royal office. You would, of course to remind me of my folly, like the body and their self-immolations. Our quarrel with you won't ever be as great as our quarrel with the Protector. We could never find a path to peace with her. You'd never unleash the skilled Deersha on the city. She would. And the depth of her evil is such that she doesn't see the wickedness in what she's doing. You are right. Do you have a name? If she was safely a few hundred years in the past, we might consider her a goddess, a power capable of smashing kingdoms out of whimsy, the way a child might kick over an anthill just to see the bugs scramble. I'm called Sleepy. I'm the analyst of the Black Company. I'm also the villain who plans most of your misfortunes. This situation wasn't an intentional part of the master plan, but the opportunity presented itself. Now it looks like we might have outmaneuvered ourselves. The Radisha had become focused. Go on. The Protector has chosen to cover up your disappearance. Officially, you're in your anger chamber, purifying yourself and asking the gods and your ancestors to calm your heart and give you wisdom in the coming troubled times. You have taken breaks to issue some fairly bewildering rescripts, though. 
My brothers brought back these two. My brothers are illiterate, so they couldn't select for content, but these are probably representative. I'll have more brought in if you like. The Radisha read the announcement of rewards first. It was straightforward and sensible. This must make you uncomfortable. It does. She doesn't have the money. What is this? A ten percent reduction in the rice allowance? We don't have a rice ration. We don't need to ration rice. No, you don't. Though everybody who wants rice can't afford it. And some of us, who would be happy to see the last of the stuff, don't get to eat anything else. You know what this is? The Radisha pounded her right forefinger against the rescript, like she was trying to peck a hole through. I'll bet. All those strange personalities. They don't just come out as voices. Or she was in an especially strange humor when she dictated these. She has those spells. When the voices seem to take over completely, they never last long. Ah, I said to myself. This is an interesting tidbit, worth pursuing later. Would you care to counter with something more sound? I don't have the manpower to cover the entire city, but I can see that new rescripts are posted in the more important places. How do you prove they're genuine? Anyone can take a piece of treated nada and write something on it. I'm working on that. We have a guest, a highly respected soldier from one of the city battalions. We brought him in to visit another prisoner. I thought he might pass the word that you're our prisoner, too. Interesting. You know what she'll do, don't you? Call your bluff. Produce an imitation or illusory version of me and challenge you to produce your radisha. Which you won't do because you're not really interested in getting killed. Correct? We can deal with that. The protector has a serious handicap. Nobody believes anything she says. They've started thinking that way about you, too, because you're beginning to come across as her stooge. Why did you always have such a hateful and treacherous attitude toward the company? I'm not her stooge. You have no idea how many of her mad schemes I've managed to stifle. I did not tell her what we did. I had her angry enough to talk, but prodded just a little more. Why did you hate my brothers before they ever came down the river? I didn't hate. Maybe I chose the wrong word. There was something. The analysts before me all sensed it and knew you'd turn on the company as soon as you felt safe from the Shadow Masters. You weren't as obsessed as Smoke was, but you shared his disease. I don't know. I've wondered about that a lot the past decade. It went away after I gave the order to turn on you. But Smoke and I weren't the only ones. The whole principality felt the same. There was a memory of a time, before, when the company, there was no such time. Not that anybody bothered to record in the histories and documents of those days. The little I've been able to decipher of our own annals from back then is dully routine. The only terrible battle I found came when the company was three generations old. It took place not far from here, and the company lost. It was almost wiped out. Its three volumes of annals fell into enemy hands. They've been in Taglian libraries ever since. From the moment the company returned to Taglios, access to those has been denied us. All kinds of crazy things were done to keep us from getting to those books. People died because of those books. And from all I can see, the real secret that's hidden there, that had to be kept at all cost, was that nothing extraordinary happened during those early years. It was not an age of rapine and endless bloodshed. How could all the people of a dozen states remember something that never happened and become terrified that it was going to happen again? I shrugged. I don't know. We'll ask Kina how she did it. Right before we kill her.
The radish's expression told me she was thinking she was not alone in her ability to believe the impossible. I said, You want to shake loose from your lunatic friend? You want to get off the hook with us? You want to get your brother back? Presumably the possibility that the Prabhrindra Dra still lived had grown significant in her recent thoughts. The Radisha opened and closed her mouth several times. Never an attractive woman. Age and present circumstance conspired to make her almost repulsive. I should condemn? Time was doing no favors for me, either. I said, It can be managed. All of it. My brother is dead. No, he's not. No one outside the company knows, not even Soul Catcher. But the people she trapped out there under the plane are frozen in time. Sort of. I don't understand the mystic science involved. The point is, they're there, they're healthy, and they can be brought back out. I've just made a deal that will give us the key we need to open the way. You can bring my brother back. Cordy Mather, too. The light was not good, but I detected the rush of color to her neck. There are no secrets from you people, are there? Not many. What do you want from me? I never expected to be at this point with the woman, despite her down-to-earth, sensible, business-like reputation. So I didn't have a ready answer. But I did manage to come up with a wish list quickly. You could step out in public someplace where a whole lot of people would see you and recognize you and repudiate the protector. You could exculpate the black company. You could fire the great general. You could announce that you've been under Soulcatcher's evil spell for 15 years, but now you've finally made your escape. You can make us the good guys again. I don't know if I can do that. I've been afraid of the black company for too long. I'm still afraid. Water sleeps, I said. What's the protector done for you? The Radisha had no answer for that. We can bring back your brother. Think of the pressure that would take off you. Raja Dharma. In a tightly controlled voice, the Radisha snapped. Don't say that. That tears my entrails out and strangles me with them. Exactly what I had wished on her a time or two when I was in a less forgiving mood. Aridatha Singh looked at me oddly. He wasn't anything like I thought Narayan Singh would be. Seeing his sovereign had not impressed him nearly so much as seeing his father had. Not many people are once you get to know them. River, you want to take this man back where you found him? It was night, yes, but we still had those two protective amulets left over from the Shadow Master Wars. They definitely looked like they were still good. I wished we had another hundred, but Goblin and One Eye could not make them anymore. I'm not sure why. They shared no trade secrets with me. I suppose they were just too old. I worry a lot when I consider a future without them in it and a future without one eye cannot be far away. O oh, Lord of hosts, preserve him until the captured are delivered and all our quarrels are resolved. Chapter 46 Men were charging everywhere around the warehouse. Some were continuing frenetic preparations for the company's evacuation. Some were getting ready to accompany Narayan and me to the Grove of Doom to collect the Nguyen Bo key. The Nguyen Bo, Do Trang's confederates, and the handful still attached to the company somehow, seemed to be doing a lot of nervous moving around just to be moving. They were scared and worried. Bondo Trang had suffered a stroke during the night. One Eye's prognosis was not encouraging. I told Goblin, I'm not saying she had anything to do with it, but Do Trang was the first one to realize that the girl was roaming around outside her flesh. He's just old, sleepy. Nobody did it to him. You ask me, he's really way overdue. 
He hung on here because he cares about Sarah. She's all right now. It looks like her husband might actually be freed. And he's too old to run away. Soulcatcher is going to find this place eventually. Once Mogaba arrives and starts searching. I wouldn't be surprised if Do Trang just decided that dying was the best thing he could do for everyone right now. I did not want Do Trang to go, for all the reasons none of us like to see those close to us die. But also because he was, in his quiet way, the best friend the company had had in generations. Like everyone else, I tried to lose myself in work. I told Goblin, Even if she's totally innocent, I want the girl fixed so she can't wander. Whatever you have to do short of permanently crippling or killing her. Goblin sighed. Lately that was all he did when someone gave him more work. I guess he was too tired to squawk anymore. Where's one eye? Uh... Furtive look around. A whisper. Don't say I said anything. I think he's trying to figure out how to take his equipment with us. I shook my head and walked away. Centaraxita and Baladitya called out to me. They had accepted their situation and were applying themselves with a will. The master librarian seemed particularly excited about facing a real academic challenge for the first time in years. He said, Dora B., in all the excitement, I forgot to mention that I did get an answer to your question about a written Yuang Bo language. There was one. And not only was there one, this oldest book is written in an antique dialect of that language. The others were recorded in an early Taglian dialect, although the original of the third volume does so employing the foreign alphabet instead of native characters which argues that the invader alphabet had well-defined phonetic values that at the time must have been more precise than those of the native script. Right? Centaraxita gawked. After a moment, he said, Durabi, you never cease to amaze me. Absolutely correct. So have you discovered anything interesting? The Black Company came off the plain, which was called Glittering Stone, even then, and mostly minced around from one small principality to the next, squabbling internally over whether or not they were going to sacrifice themselves to bring on the Year of the Skulls. There was plenty of enthusiasm among the priests attached to the company, but not much among the soldiers. Many of those apparently volunteered as a way to escape something called the Land of Unknown Shadows, not because they wanted to bring on the end of the world. The Land of Unknown Shadows, eh? Anything else? I've developed some very good information on the price of horseshoe nails four centuries ago, and on the scarcity of several medicinal plants that are now found in every herb garden. Earth-shaking stuff. Stay with it, Sri. I meant to tell him he had to evacuate with the rest of us, but decided not to upset him right away. He was having a good time. No point making him face a choice between abduction and being put to death just yet. Uncle Doge materialized. Dotrang wants to see you. I followed him to the tiny room the old man had built for himself in a remote corner of the warehouse. On the way, Doge warned me that Do Trang was unable to speak. He's already seen Sarah and Tobo. I think he was fond of you, too. We're going to get married in the next life, if the Goonie are right. I am ready to travel. I stopped. What? I'm going with you to the Grove of Doom. You'd better not have some crazy idea about snatching the key. I agree to help. I'll help. I want to be there to make sure the deceiver keeps his word. The deceiver, Miss Sleepy. Deceiver. Also, I agreed to turn over that volume of the books of the dead. Its hiding place is on the way. Very well. The presence of Ash Wand will be a comfort to me and a vexation to my enemies. 
Doge chuckled. It will indeed. We won't be coming back here. I know. When we leave, I'll be carrying everything I wish to retain. You won't need to pretend with Dortrang. He knows his path. Do him the honor of an honest farewell. I did more. I became all teary for the first time in my adult life. I rested my head on the old man's chest for a minute and whispered my thanks for his friendship and renewed my promise to see him in the next life. A small heresy, but I do not think God has been monitoring me too closely. Bond lifted a hand weakly and stroked my hair. And after that I got up and went away, somewhere to be alone with my grief for a man who, it seemed, had never been that close, yet who is going to have a major impact on the rest of my life. I understood that, after the tears stopped, I would never be quite the same sleepy again, and that that was one legacy Do Trang wanted to leave behind. Chapter 47 the biggest problem I expected with the evacuation was one that came up every time the company picked up and moved out after having been settled in one place for a long time. Roots had to be torn up, ties had to be severed, men had to abandon the lives they had created for themselves. Some just would not go. Some who did go would tell someone where they were headed. The nominal strength of the company was somewhat over two hundred people, a third of whom did not live in Taglios at all, but maintained identities at scattered locations where they could aid brothers who were traveling. Overall, it was very much like what the deceivers used to do. Partly that was intentional, because those people had spent centuries finding the safest ways. Early on, Couriers went out carrying code words to all our distant brothers to warn them that a time of trouble was coming. Nobody would be told what was happening, only warned that something was and that it was going to be big. Once that code word arrived, it would already be too late to drop out of anything. Behind the couriers, eventually, would come the majority of the men, in driblets small enough not to attract attention, disguised a dozen ways, departing Taglios in what I considered their order of plausible risk. The last to leave town would be those with the heaviest entanglements. All the men would pass through a series of checkpoints and assembly points, each time being informed only of an immediate destination. The key hope, though, was that Soul Catcher would not begin to catch on until those who were going to go were well away. Those who refused to go would be excused, if they remained loyal to the company interests in the city. It would be useful to have a few agents on hand after the company appeared to have gone. That, too, was something the deceivers had done for generations. There would be flashy smoke shows. The demon Niasi would be much more prevalent, putting a damper on gray efficiency. The men who stayed, I would not know who they were because I would be among the first to leave, would be expected to undertake what was supposed to look like a series of random assaults, break-ins, and acts of vandalism that later would begin to appear to be part of a terror campaign meant to peak during the Druga Pavi. If Soul Catcher took the bait, she would spend her time preparing to ambush us there. If not, every hour bought was an hour farther down the road my brothers would be before the Protector realized that we had done the unexpected again. And even then, I expected her to look in the wrong places for a long time. Chapter 48 My party was the first to leave Taglios. We went the morning Bondo Trang died. With me went Narayan Singh, Willow Swan, the Radishidra, Mother Gota, and Uncle Doge, Riverwalker Iqbal Singh, with his wife Suru Vija, and two children and baby, and his brother Runmust. In addition, we had several goats with small packs and chickens tied to their backs, two donkeys, one or the other of which Goda rode much of the time, and an ox cart drawn by a beast we strove hard to keep looking sadder and scruffier than it really was. 
most everyone adopted some form of disguise. The Shadar trimmed their hair and beards, and the whole family adopted Vedna dress. I stayed Vedna, but became a woman. The Radisha became a man. Uncle Doge and Willow Swan shaved their heads and became Bodhi disciples. Swan darkened himself with stain, but there was no way to change his blue eyes. Gota had to do without Nguyen Bo fashions. Narayan Singh remained exactly the same, virtually indistinguishable from thousands of others just like him. We looked bizarre, but even stranger bands collected to share the rigors of the road. And we would collect together only when we camped. On the road, we stretched out over half a mile. One Singh brother out front, the other in back, while River stayed fairly close to me. The brothers carried a pair of devices given them by Goblin and One-Eye. If Narayan, the Radisha, or Swan strayed far from a line running between them, choke spells would begin constricting around their throats. None of the three had been informed of that. We were all supposed to be friends and allies now, but I believe in trusting some of my friends more than others. On the rock road that the captain had had built between Taglios and Jaikur, we did not catch the eye at all. But a crowd like that, with a baby and an ox cart and regular Vedna prayers and whatnot, is not swift. Nor did the season help. I became thoroughly sick of the rain. The last time I traveled down the rock road, I rode a giant black stallion that covered the distance between Taglios and Gorgia on the river Main in a day and a night without hurrying. Four days after leaving the city, we were still at least that long from the bridge at Goja, which would be our first dangerous bottleneck. In the afternoon, Uncle Doge chose to announce that we had come as close as the road would carry us to the place where he had hidden the copy of the Book of the Dead. Ah, darn, I said. I was hoping it would be way farther down the road. How are we going to explain having a book if we get stopped? Doge showed me his palms and a big smile. I'm a priest, a missionary. Blame it on me. Despite the hardships, he was happy. Come, help me dig it up. What is this place? I asked two hours later. We had come into something that might have come from one of Mergen's old nightmares about Kina. Twenty yards of woods formed a palisade all around it. It's a graveyard. During the chaos of the first Shadowlander invasion, before the Black Company came, possibly even before you were born, one of the Shadowlanders' armies used this as a camp, then as a burial ground. They planted the trees to conceal the tombs and monuments from enemy eyes. Noting my appalled expression, he added, Down there, they have different customs for dealing with the dead. I knew that. I had been there. I had seen it. But never had I seen it so concentrated, nor exuding such an air of depression. This is grim. A spell makes it seem that way. They thought they would come back and turn the place into a memorial after they won the war. They wanted to keep people away. I'm willing to go along with their wishes. This is too creepy for me. It's not that bad. Come on. This shouldn't take more than a few minutes. It did, but not a lot longer. It was a matter of pulling the door away from one of the fancier tombs and digging out a bundle wrapped in several layers of oilskins. This is a place worth remembering, Doge said as we went away. People around here won't come near it. People from farther away don't know about it. It's a good hideout. I can't wait. You love the Grove of Doom, too. I've been there. I didn't like it either. But at the time, I was too worried about stranglers to be scared of ghosts or ancient goddesses. It's another good place to hide. I am not suspicious by nature the way Soul Catcher is, but I am suspicious occasionally. I am particularly suspicious of reticent old Nguyen Bo, who suddenly turned chatty and helpful. The captain hid out here once, I said. He didn't find the place congenial either. What are you up to? 
up to? I don't understand. You understand perfectly, old man. Yesterday I was just another Jengali, albeit one you had to tolerate. Today, suddenly I'm getting unsolicited advice. I'm being offered the benefit of your accumulated wisdom, like I'm some kind of apprentice. You want me to take a turn carrying that? He was, after all, an old man. As the pace and pressures have increased, and events have taken unexpected, but usually favorable, twists, I've begun reflecting more intently on the wisdom of Hong Tre, on the foresight she showed, even upon her devilish sense of humor. And I believe I'm finally beginning to grasp the full significance of her prophecies. Or of mass quantities of bull feathers. Tell it to Sarah and Mergen next time you see them and put a little honest sentiment into your apologies. My attempt to be unpleasant did not subdue him. That took the arrival of the afternoon rains, a little early, a lot heavy, supported by a truly ferocious fall of hail. Along the road, dashing out from under the trees where we had left our own party, a score of travelers tried to collect the ice before it melted. Taglians never see snow and rainy season storms provide the only time they ever see ice, unless they travel far down into what used to be the Shadowlands, to the higher elevations of the Don de Presh. Scavenging hailstones was a young people's game. The old folks pushed under the trees as far as they could get, wearing their rain gear. The baby would not stop crying. She did not like the thunder. Runmust and Iqbal tried to keep an eye on the children, as well as to watch unknown travelers closely. They were convinced that anyone met on the road might be an enemy spy, which seemed a perfectly sensible attitude to me. Riverwalker prowled, cursing the rain. That also seemed a perfectly sensible attitude. Uncle Doge did a fine job of not drawing attention to his burden. He settled beside Goda. She began to gripe, but without her usual enthusiasm. I sat down near the Radisha. We were calling her Tajik these days. I said, have you begun to understand why your brother found life on the road so appealing? I trust you're being sarcastic. Not entirely. What was the worst crisis you faced today? Your feet got wet? She grunted. She got the point. I believe it was the politics he resented. The fact that no matter what he considered doing, there were always a hundred selfish men who wanted to subvert his vision for their own profit. You knew him? The Radisha asked. Not well, not to philosophize with. But he wasn't a man who kept his views secret. My brother? Being away must have changed him a lot more than I thought it could then. He never revealed his inner self while he lived in the palace. That would have been too risky. His power was more secure out there. He didn't have to please anyone but the Liberator. His men came to love him. They would have followed him anywhere, which got most of them killed when you turned on the company. He is really alive? You aren't just manipulating me for your own ends? Of course I am. Manipulating you, that is. But it is true that he's alive. All the captured are. That's why we left Taglios, even though we had your side on the run. We want our brothers out before we do anything more. I heard a whisper. Sister, sister. What? The Radisha had not spoken. She eyed me inquisitively. I didn't say it. I glanced around apprehensively, saw nothing. Must just be the rain in the leaves. Um... The Radisha was not convinced either. Hard to believe. I really missed Goblin and One Eye. I found Uncle Doge again. Lady insisted that you're a minor wizard. If you have any talent at all, please use it to see if we're being watched or followed. Once Soul Catcher started looking for us outside Taglios, it should not take long for her crows and shadows to find us. Uncle Doge grunted noncommittally. Chapter 49 
Real fear found us the morning after next. Just when it seemed we had every reason to be positive. We had made good time the day before. There were no crows around yet, and it looked like we would reach the grove of doom before the afternoon rains, which meant we could complete our business there and get clear before night fell. I was happy. A band of horsemen appeared on the road south of us, headed our way. As they drew nearer, it became evident that they were uniformly clad. What should we do? River asked. Just hope they aren't looking for us. Keep moving. They showed no interest in travelers ahead of us, though they forced everyone off the road. They were not galloping, but were not dawdling either. Uncle Doge drifted nearer the donkey not carrying Goda. Ash Wand lay hidden amidst the clutter of tent and tent poles that formed that animal's burden. Several precious fireball projectors were among the bamboo tent poles, too. We had very few of those left now. We would have no more until we fetched Lady out of the ground. Goblin and One-Eye could not create them themselves, though Goblin admitted privately that the opposite would have been the case even just ten years ago. They were too old for almost anything that required flexible thought and, especially, physical dexterity. The mist projector was, in all probability, the last great contribution they would make. And most of the non-magical construction on that had been accomplished using Tobo's young hands. I caught a glint of polished steel from the horseman. Left side of the road, I told River. I want everybody over there when we have to get out of their way. But I spoke too late. Point man Iqbal had already jumped off to the right. I hope he has sense enough to get back across after they pass by. He hasn't stupid, Sleepy. He's out here with us, isn't he? That's a fact. The band of horsemen turned out to be what I expected. The forerunners of a much larger troop which, in turn, proved to be the vanguard of the 3rd Territorial Division of the Taglian Army. The 3rd Territorial Division was the great general's personal formation which meant that God had chosen to bring us face to face with Mogaba. I tried not to worry about what sort of practical joke God was contemplating. Only he knows his own heart. I just made sure my whole crowd was on the left side of the road. I got us loosened up even more. Then I worried about which of us might be recognizable by Mogaba or any veterans who had been around long enough to recall the Kialune and Shadowmaster Wars. None of us were memorable. Few of us went back far enough to have crossed paths with the great general. That is, except Uncle Doge, Mother Goda, Willow Swan. Right, and Narayan Singh. Narayan had been a close ally of the great general in the days before the Shadow Master War. Those two had had their wicked heads together innumerable times. I will need to alter my appearance. What? The skinny little deceiver had materialized beside me, startling me. If he could sneak up like that. This will be the great General Mogaba. Not so? And he might recognize me, even though it has been years since last we stood face to face. You astonish me, I admitted. I do what the goddess desires. Of course. There is no god but god. Yet every day I had to deal with a goddess whose impact on my life was more tangible. There were times when I had to struggle hard not to think. In forgiveness, he is like the earth. Suppose you just borrow some clothing and get rid of your turban. Though doing nothing struck me as the perfect solution with him. As noted before, Narayan Singh resembled the majority of the poor male Guni population. I thought Mogaba would have trouble recognizing him, even if they had been lovers. Unless Narayan gave himself away. And how could he do that? He was the master deceiver, the living saint of the cult. That might work. Singh drifted away. I watched him, suddenly suspicious. 
he could not be unaware of his own natural anonymity. Therefore, he must be trying to create a predisposed pattern of thought inside my mind. I wished I could just cut his throat. I did not like what he did to my thinking. I could easily become obsessed with concerns about what he was really doing. But we needed him. We could not collect the key without him. Even Uncle Doge did not know exactly what we were seeking. He had never actually seen or even known about the key before it was stolen. I hoped he would recognize it if he saw it. I might spend a little time thinking how we could get around my having given him such solid guarantees that he was willing to travel with us and trust us not to murder the Daughter of Night while they were separated. The cavalry finished clattering past. They had paid us no heed, since we had not insisted on getting in their way. Behind them, a few hundred yards, came the first battalion of infantry, as neat, clean, and impressive as Mugaba could keep them while on the march. I received several offers of temporary marriage, but otherwise the soldiers were indifferent to our presence. The Third Territorial was a well-disciplined professional division, an extension of Mogaba's will and character, nothing like the gangs of ragged outcasts that constituted the company. We were a military nil, anyway. We could not get together and fight our weight in lepers today, let alone deal with formations like the Third Territorial. Croker's heart would be broken when we dragged him out of the ground. My optimism began to fade. With the soldiers hogging the road, we traveled much slower. The landmarks showing the way to the Grove of Doom were in sight, but still hours away. The cart and the animals could not be pushed on muddy ground. I began to watch for a place to sit out the rain, though I did not recall any good sight from previous visits to the area. Uncle Doge was no help when I asked. He told me, There is no significant cover closer than the grove. Someone should go scout that. You have reason for concern. We're dealing with deceivers. I did not mention that Slink and the band from Semki were supposed to meet us there. Doge did not need to know. And Slink might have gotten slowed down if he had to duck around Mogaba's army and patrols. I'll go, when I can leave without arousing curiosity. Take Swan. He's the most likely to give us away. The Radisha was a risk, too. Though thus far, she had shown no inclination to yell for help. But Riverwalker was close enough to grab her by the throat if she even took a deep breath. She was not stupid. If she intended to betray us, she meant to wait till she could manage it with some chance of surviving the attempt. Uncle Doge and Willow Swan managed to drift away without attracting attention, though Uncle had to go without Ashwand. I joined River and the Radisha. I noted, This country is a lot more developed than it used to be. When I was young, most of the land between Taglios and Goja was deserted. Villages were small and poor and supported themselves on minimal tracts of land. There were no independent farms in those days. Now the latter seemed to be everywhere, founded by confident and independence-minded veterans, or by refugees from the tortured lands that once lay prostrate under the heels of the shadow masters. Many of the new farms crowded right up to the road right of way. They made getting off the road difficult at times. The force moving north numbered about 10,000, men enough to occupy miles and miles of roadway, even without the train and camp followers coming on behind. Soon it was obvious we would not reach the Grove of Doom before the rains came and might not get there before nightfall. Given any choice at all, I did not want to be anywhere near the place after dark. I had gone in there by night once before, ages ago, as part of a company raid meant to capture Narion and the Daughter of Night. We murdered a lot of their friends, but those two had gotten away. I remembered only the fear and the cold, and the way the grove seemed to have a soul of its own that was more alien than the soul of a spider. Mergen once said that being in that place at night was as bad as walking through one of Kina's dreams. Though of this world... It had a powerful otherworldly taint. I tried to ask Narayan about it. 
Why had his predecessors chosen that particular grove as their most holy place? How had it been different from other groves of those times, when humanity's impact on the face of the earth had been so much less? Why do you wish to know, analyst? Singh was suspicious of my interest. Because I'm naturally curious. Aren't you ever curious about how things came to be and why people do the things they do? I serve the goddess. I waited. Evidently, he deemed that an adequate explanation. Being somewhat religious myself, I could encompass it even though I did not find it satisfying. I offered a snort of disgust. Narayan responded with a smirk. She is real, he said. She is the darkness. You see her handiwork around you every day. Not true. Untrue, little man. But if she ever gets loose, I think we will. This discussion had become terribly uncomfortable suddenly. It put me in the position of admitting the existence of a god other than my god, which my religion insisted was impossible. There is no god but God. Narayan smirked. Mugaba did the one good thing he had ever done for me. By turning up in person, he saved me the rigorous and embarrassing mental gymnastics necessary to reconfigure Kina as a fallen angel thrown down into the pit. I knew it could be done. Elements of Kina myth could be hammered into conformity with the tenets of the only true religion, given a quick coat of blackwash, and I would have completed a course of religious acrobatics elegant enough to spark the pride of my childhood teachers. Mugaba and his staff traveled three-quarters of the way toward the rear of the column. The great general was mounted, which was a surprise. He was never a rider before. The greater surprise, though, was the nature of his steed. It was one of the sorcerously bred black stallions the company had brought down from the north. I had thought they were all dead. I had not seen one since the Kiolune Wars. This one not only was not dead, it was in outstanding health, despite its age. It also appeared bored by the business of travel. Don't gape, Riverwalker told me. People get curious about why other people are curious. I think I can afford to stare some. Magaba will feel like he deserves it. Mugaba looked every bit the great general and mighty warrior. He was tall and perfectly proportioned, well-muscled, well-clad, well-groomed. But for the dust of silver in his hair, he looked little older than he had been when first I saw him, right after the company captured Jaikur from Storm Shadow. He had had no hair then, having preferred to shave his head. He seemed in a good humor, not a condition I had associated with him in the past, when all his schemes had come to frustration as the captain just seemed to bumble around and do the one thing that would undo all his efforts. As the great general came abreast, his mount suddenly snorted and tossed its head, then shied slightly, as though it had stirred up a snake. Mogaba cursed, although he was never in any danger of losing his seat. Laughter dropped out of the sky, and a white crow fell right behind it alighting precariously atop the pole carried by the great general's personal standard-bearer. Cursing still, Mugaba failed to note that his steed turned its head to watch me as I passed. The darn thing winked. I had been recognized. The beast must be the very one I had ridden so long ago, for so many hundreds of miles. I began to get nervous. Someone amongst Mugaba's personal guard launched an arrow at the crow. It missed. It fell not far from Runmust, who shouted angrily before he thought. Now the great general vented his spleen upon the archer. The horse continued to watch me. I fought an urge to run. Maybe I could get through this yet. The white crow squawked something that might have been words, but were just racket to me. Mugaba's mount jumped enough to freshen the well of vituperation. It faced forward and began to trot. The ultimate effect was to divert attention from us southbound scrubs. Everybody but Iqbal's Suruvija 
stared at the ground and walked a little faster. Soon we were past the worst danger. I drifted over beside Swan, who was still so nervous he stuttered when he tried to crack a joke about pigeons coming to roost on the great general while he was still alive. Laughter passed overhead. The crow up high was almost indistinguishable against the gathering clouds. I wished I had someone along who could advise me about that thing. For a generation, crows have not been good omens for the company. But this one seemed to have done us a favor. Could it be Mergen from another time? Mergen would be watching, I was sure. But that crow had no way to communicate, so maybe so. If so, this encounter would have been an adventure for him, too. What with him knowing that if we got caught, his chances for resurrection plummeted to zero. Chapter 50 The passages of the great general held us up long enough that we could not leave the road unremarked until after the rains began falling hard enough to conceal our movements from everyone except someone extremely close by. We left the road unnoticed then. Our travel formation collapsed into a miserable pack. Only Narayan Singh showed real eagerness to get to the grove, and he did not hurry. Not often long on empathy, I found myself pitying Iqbal's children. Swan pointed out, It'd be to Singh's advantage to get us there just after nightfalls. Darkness always comes. Huh? A deceiver aphorism. Darkness is their time, and darkness always comes. You don't seem particularly bothered. He was hard to hear. The rainfall was that heavy. I'm bothered, buddy. I've been here before. It isn't what you'd call a good place. I could not state that fact with sufficient emphasis. The grove of doom was the heart of darkness, a spawning ground for all hopelessness and despair. It gnawed at your soul. Unless you were a believer, apparently. It never seemed to trouble those for whom it was a holy place. Places are natural, sleepy. People are good and evil. You'll change your mind after you get there. I got a sneaking suspicion I'm gonna drown first. Do we gotta be out in this? You find a roof, I'll be glad to get under it. Big thunder had begun fencing with swords of lightning. There would be hail before long. I wished I had a better hat. Maybe one of those huge woven bamboo things Nguyen Bo farmers wear in the rice paddies. I could just make out Riverwalker and the Radisha. I followed them, hoping they were following someone they could see. I hoped we did not have anyone get disoriented and lost. Not tonight. I hoped the guys from Simki were where they were supposed to be. Iqbal appeared in the gloom as the hail began to fall. He bent over to try to ease the sting of the missiles. I did the same. It did not help much. Iqbal shouted, Left, down the hill. There's a stand of little evergreens. Better than nothing at all. Swan and I dashed that way. The hailstones kept getting bigger and more numerous as the thunder got louder and the lightning closer, but the air was cooling down. There's a bright side to everything. I slipped, fell, rolled, found the trees the hard way by sliding in amongst them. Uncle Doge and Goda, River and the Radisha were in there already. Iqbal was an optimist. I would not have called those darned things trees. They were bushes suffering from overweening ambition. Not a one was ten feet tall, and you had to get down on your belly in the damp and needles to enjoy their shelter. But their branches did break the fall of the hailstones, which rattled and roared through the foliage. I started to ask about the animals, but then heard the goats bleeding. I felt a little guilty. I do not like animals much. I had been shirking my share of their caretaking. Hailstones dribbled down through the branches and rolled in from outside. Swan picked up a huge example, brushed it off, showed it to me, grinned, and popped it into his mouth. This is the life, I said. When you're with the Black Company, every day is a paradise on earth. Swan said, 
This would be a superb recruiting tool. As those things always do, the storm went away. We crawled out and counted heads and discovered that not even Narion Singh had gone missing. The living saint of the Stranglers did not want to leave us behind. That book really was important to him. The rain dwindled to a drizzle. We clambered out of the muck, many communing bluntly with their preferred gods while we formed up. We did not spread out much now, except for Uncle Doge, who managed to disappear into a landscape with almost no cover. Over the next hour, we ran into several landmarks I recognized from Croker's and Mergen's annals. I kept an eye out for Slink and his companions. I did not see them. I hoped that was a good omen rather than a bad. The later it got, the more peachy it seemed to Narayan Singh. I was afraid he would curse us all by betraying a genuine smile. I considered mentioning his children's names just to let him know he was weighing on my mind. My divination skills were flawless. It was dusk when we reached the grove. We were all miserable. The baby would not stop crying. I was developing a blister from walking in wet boots. With the possible exception of Narayan, not a soul amongst us remained mission-oriented. Everybody just wanted to drop somewhere while somebody else got a fire going so we could dry out and get something to eat. Narayan insisted that we press on to the Deceiver Temple in the heart of the grove. It'll be dry there, he promised. His proposal aroused no enthusiasm. Though we were barely inside its boundary, the smell of the grove surrounded us. It was not a pleasant odor. I wondered how much worse it was back in the heyday of the Deceivers, when they murdered people there often and in some numbers. The place possessed strong psychic character, an eeriness, a creepiness. Goonie would blame that on Kina, because this was one of the places where a fragment of her dismembered body had fallen, or something such. Despite the fact that Kina was also supposed to be bound in enchanted sleep somewhere, on or under or beyond the plain of glittering stone. Guni do not have ghosts. We Vedna do. Yuang Bo do. For me... The grove was haunted by the souls of all the victims who died there for Kina's pleasure or glory or whatever reason stranglers kill. Had I mentioned it, Narion or one of the more devout Guni would have brought up the matter of Rakshasas. Those malignant demons, those evil night rangers jealous of men and gods alike. Rakshasas might pretend to be the spirit of someone who had passed on merely as a tool for tormenting the living. Uncle Doge said, Like it or not, Narayan is right. We should move into the best shelter available. We would be no less safe there than here, and we would be free of the pestilential drizzle. The rain just would not go away. I considered him. He was old and worn out, and had less reason to want to move on than any of us younger folks. He must have a reason to want to go on. He must know something. Doge always did. Getting him to share it was the big trick. I was in charge. Time for an unpopular decision. We'll go ahead. Grumble, grumble, grumble. The temple projected a presence more powerful than that of the grove. I had no trouble locating it without being able to see it. Walking close behind... Swan asked me, How come you never tore this place down when you were on top? I did not understand his question. Narayan, just ahead of me, overheard it and did understand. They tried. More than once. We rebuilt it when no one was watching. He launched a rambling rant about how his goddess had watched over the builders. It sounded like a recruiting speech. He kept it up until Runmust swatted him with a bamboo pole. It was one of those poles, too, though Narayan did not know. The grove was a very dark place, perfect for an ambush by shadows. Runmust was not going to go quietly. I could not help wondering what evil Soulcatcher was up to now that she had complete freedom to work her will upon Taglios. I hoped the people who stayed behind completed their missions, 
particularly those tasked to penetrate the palace again. Jal Barundandi had to be recruited and brought in too deep to run before his rage subsided sufficiently for reason to reassert itself. Chapter 51 The baby continued to cry, burrowing into her mother's breast without looking for nourishment. The noise worried everyone. Anyone who wished to visit misfortune upon us would have no trouble tracking us. We would be unlikely to hear them sneaking up because of the crying and the sound of drizzle falling from branch to branch in the waterlogged trees. River and the company sings kept their hands on their weapons. Uncle Doge had recovered Ashwand and was keeping it handy despite the risk of rust. The animals were as thrilled as the infant was. The goats bleated and dragged their feet. The donkeys kept getting stubborn, but Mother Goda knew a trick or three for getting bulky beasts of burden moving. A considerable ration of pain was involved. The rain never ended. Narayan Singh took the lead. He knew the way. He was home. I felt the dread temple loom before us, although I could not see it. Narayan's sandals whispered as they scattered soggy leaves. I listened intently, but heard nothing new until Willow Swan started muttering, nagging himself for having followed up on the one original idea he had ever had. If he had ignored it, he could be rocking beside a fireplace in his own home, listening to his own grandkids cry, instead of tramping through the blue miseries on yet one more mystery quest where the best he could look forward to was to stay alive longer than the people dragging him around. Then he asked me, Sleepy, you ever consider throwing in with that little turd? Somewhere an owl screamed. Which one and why? Narion. Bring on the year of the skulls. Then we could all finally sit back and relax and not have to slog around in the rain and shit anymore. No, I haven't. The owl screamed again. It sounded frustrated. What sounded like crow laughter answered it, taunting. But that's what the company set out to do in the first place, isn't it? To bring on the end of the world? A handful of the senior people did, apparently. But not the guys who actually had to do the work. There's a chance they didn't have any idea what it was all about. That they marched because staying home might be a less pleasant option. Some things never change. I know the story by heart. Careful. These steps are slicker than greased owl shit. He had heard the birds conversing, too. That was a northern saying that lost something in translation. Rain or no, the goats and donkeys flat refused to move any nearer the deceiver shrine. At least until a light took life inside the temple doorway. That came from a single feeble oil lamp. But in the darkness, it seemed almost bright. Swan observed, Narian knows right where to look, don't he? I'm watching him, every minute, for what good keeping a close eye on a deceiver would do. To tell the truth, I was counting on Uncle Doge. Doge would be much harder to trick. He was an old trickster himself. As a trick master, I needed to stick to what I knew, which was designing wicked plots and writing about them after they ran their course. Something flapped overhead as I entered the temple. Owl or crow, I did not turn quickly enough to discover the truth. I did tell Runmust and Iqbal. Keep a close watch while I check this out. Doge, Swan, come with me. You know more about this place than anyone else. Below, River and Goda swore vilely as they strove to keep the goats under control. Iqbal's sons had fallen asleep where they stood, indifferent to the ongoing rain. Narion blocked my advance, just steps inside the temple. Not until I complete the rituals of sanctification. Otherwise, you'll defile the holy place. It was not my holy place. I did not care if I defiled it. In fact, that sounded like an amusement to be indulged just before I had the place torn down yet again, and this time plowed under. 
but I did have to get along, for the moment. Doge, keep an eye on him. Run must, you too. He could pick the living saint off with his bamboo if the deceiver tried to be clever. We have an understanding. Narayan reminded me. He seemed troubled. And not by me. He kept poking around, like he was looking for something that was supposed to be there, but just was not. You make sure you hold up your end, little man. I stepped back outside into a drizzle that had become more of a heavy falling mist. Sleepy, Iqbal whispered from the base of the steps. Check what I found. I barely heard him. The baby continued to crank. Long-suffering Suravija rocked her and hummed a lullaby. She was not much more than a girl herself and, I suspected, not very bright. I could not imagine any woman being happy with her life, but Suruvija seemed content to go where Iqbal led. A breeze stirred the branches of the grove. What? Of course I could not see. I descended the temple steps into the damp, chilly darkness. Here. He shoved something into my hands. Pieces of cloth, fine cloth like silk, Six or seven pieces, each with a weight in one corner. I smiled into the face of the night. I snickered. My faith in God was restored. The demon had betrayed her children again. Slink had gotten to the grove in time. Slink had been sneakier than any deceiver. Slink had done his job. He was out there somewhere right now, covering us ready to offer Narion another horrible surprise. I felt much more confident when I went back inside and yelled at Narion, Get your skinny ass moving, Singh. We've got women and children freezing out here. Narion was not a happy living saint. Whatever he was looking for, under cover of fortifying the temple against the defiling presence of unbelievers, just was not there to be found. I was tempted to toss him the captured rumels. I forbore. That would only make him angry and tempt him to go back on his agreement. I did tell him, you've had time enough to sanctify the whole darned woods against the presence of non-believers, don't you think? You forget how miserable it is out here? You should cultivate patience, analyst. It's an extremely useful trait in both our chosen careers. I forbore mentioning that we had been patient enough to get him tucked into our trick bag. Then his exasperation surfaced for a moment. He hurled something at the floor. He was not out of control by much, but it was the first time I ever saw him less than perfectly composed when he was supposed to be the master of the situation. He whispered something as he beckoned me. I do believe he took his goddess's name in vain. This new version of the temple was scarcely a shadow of what Croker and Lady had survived. The present idol was wooden, not more than five feet tall and unfinished. The offerings before it were all old and feeble. The temple as a whole did not possess the sinister grim air of a place where many lives had been sacrificed. These were lean times for deceivers. Narion persisted in his search. I could not bring myself to break his heart, by telling him the friends he expected to meet must have fallen foul of the friends I'd hoped to meet. You need to keep a certain amount of mystery in any relationship. I said, Tell me where it's all right to spread out and where you'd rather we didn't, and I'll see that we do our best to honor your wishes. Narayan looked at me like I'd just sprouted an extra head. I told him, I've been thinking a lot lately. We're probably going to be working together for a while. It'd make things easier for everybody if we all made the effort to respect one another's customs and philosophies. Narion scooted off. He began the process of laying a fire and of telling people where they could homestead. The temple was not that big inside. There would not be much room to spread out there. Singh would not turn his back on me. You spooked him good, Riverwalker told me. He'll spend the whole night with his back to the wall. 
trying to stay awake. I hope my snoring helps. Iqbal, don't do that. The fool had actually started helping Mother Goda set up to do some cooking. That old woman was a menace around a cook fire. She was already under a ban throughout the company. She could boil water and give it a taste to gag you. Iqbal grinned a grin that told the world he needed to consult one eye about his teeth. We're setting this up for me. All right. Much better. Much, much better. After she finished helping Iqbal, the old woman helped milk the goats. Now I understood how Narian felt. Maybe I should keep my back to a wall and watch my dozing, too. Goda was not even complaining. And Uncle Doge had stayed outside, presumably to enjoy the refreshing weather and cheerful woods. If you enjoyed this audiobook, the rest of Glenn Cook's Black Company series is available today. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.